I'm going to go ahead and uh, get us started. Um, I want to welcome everybody to uh, this workshop that we've entitled What Matters in Agricultural Economics, Setting the Agenda for the Handbook of Agricultural Economics, Volume 6. Of course, this is part one. We have a second part coming up in two days. I want to start out by thanking the AAEA for, uh, for helping us to put this together and organizing the logistics and the registration and everything. Um, we've communicated with many people over there. Uh, so ho hopefully I don't miss too many names, but Jessica Weister, Mary Onan, Allison Ware, Kristen McGuire, and as I said, there are several others I think we, we communicated with who helped put this together. Uh, thanks also to the attendees, all of those who are here. We have a, a very good group, and uh, I believe we're, we're near full on registration. Um, I want a special thanks to those who are uh, both the, the authors and those serving as discussants today. Um, these handbooks are a once in a decade opportunity for us to really sort of define what the frontiers of our discipline are and uh, to be able to, uh, you know, define not only what those frontiers are, but the directions we want to take those frontiers in the new future, uh, near future. Uh, these books are usually very heavily cited. They usually contain several papers that I would, I would classify as classics in terms of the way they sort of codify and present our discipline. Um, this often serves as an entry point for new scholars entering uh, some part of agricultural and applied economics. And so try and keep that in mind as, as we go through here. Um, we have two volumes that are that we are working on sort of concurrently. Volume five, we had a meeting like this in October, um, and that covers a lot of the sort of production side issues. Uh, most of those chapters are under review right now and will be completed later this year. Uh, volume six is what we are focusing on today. It's more on the consumer and uh, methods type issues. Um, and we'll be hearing today from uh, about half of those authors. These chapters that you're going to be hearing are under development, they're drafts. And because they're drafts, they, uh, they are not complete. In fact, the whole purpose of having this meeting is so that we can hear some feedback from experts in the field as well as a broader audience. So even if you're not an expert, feel free to, to put your, uh, your opinions out there and get some feedback and help shape these resources so that they can be the most useful they can be for our, for our discipline going forward. Um, the presentations themselves, they're gonna be, uh, we have allocated 25 minutes for the authors to present. Uh, they will be followed by 10 minutes from discussants and then 20 minutes from, uh, for audience questions. I, I, I'm sure all of you have attended academic meetings before and recognize that uh, those are uh, aspirational and uh, we, we will try to maintain those, but, uh, but things will probably spill over a little bit here and there. Um, we're gonna uh, try and start each present new presentation at the top of the hour. Hopefully that gives us, if we're lucky, a couple of minutes of break here and there. Um, if not, we'll be cutting off conversations so we can start the next presentation. And I would encourage you, if I am cutting off a conversation, that you continue those conversations uh, through, through email or through uh, the direct message chats, whatever, whatever you need to do so that you can continue to communicate those things and, and help improve uh, this finished product. We're going to ask that you hold questions until the 20 minutes that are allotted for it, unless absolutely essential for understanding what the authors are saying or what the, what the discussant is saying. Um, when you do want to uh, contribute, uh, use the raise hand feature and we will call on you and you can unmute and, uh, and speak away. Uh, with that, we're running a little about five minutes early if we kick off right now, which I think uh, I'm, I'm certain we will use the extra time. Our first set of speakers, it's gonna be uh, John Crespi from Iowa State and uh, Jim McDonald from ERS. Uh, and they are talking about concentration in food and agricultural markets. And I will mute the snoring. Okay. Can you see the slide there? I can see it, yes. Okay, great. Um, all right, so <laughs> show you how unprepared we were. I didn't, Jim and I didn't even ask who was gonna present this. Jim, do you want to do it or do you want me to? So, 
I guess I'll, I'll jump in since I've got the slides, but uh, uh, Jim, uh, very, I'm very pleased to have Jim working with me on this because concentration in food and ag markets is something that everyone has an opinion on. And there's an awful lot of work that's already been done on it in different places. And we really didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And Jim is great at keeping me kind of on task because I tend to go off and, oh, we should talk about this, we should talk about this. But Jim's been good about saying, here's the things that are, are kind of missing. So here's my, um, here's my prop for today, right? And the reason this is my prop for today is that I got a call uh, last week by a reporter uh, from Washington who, who said, hey, can you tell me how John Deere came to become a monopoly? And I said, well, it's not. And that led to a lot of discussion, which, which ended up being her take was John Deere is big and that's the same thing. And although economists bristle at that, there is sort of a conventional wisdom out there that concentration is really big in food and agriculture. And we're talking about just a few big firms that are kind of controlling everything. And then tied in with that conventional wisdom is that there's must be a whole lot of market power out there. And that just, that's what you discover is nothing new. That's been, that's been the statement for a long time. So let me John, I uh, can interrupt just for a second to let you know, it looks like you have the presenter view we're, we're seeing what would end up having your notes. So you might want to switch the presentation. Oh, that's fine. It, can, you, can you see the slides as they're going through? We can see the slides, yeah. That's, that's, that's okay. fine. I don't care if you see what's coming up next. But, um, so let me uh, go back. So here's, here's where we are. There's, there's, there's so much that you could, you could talk about in, in concentration food mag, uh, and food and agricultural markets. And these handbooks all, already have a lot on them um, in terms of farm size, for instance, there was a, a handbook written on this. Uh, Sexton and Lavoie did a very good uh, handbook chapter on market power in the food processing sector. And even though it's not in the title, concentration is, a, is underlying theme of that chapter, how the processing sector got so big. And then other handbooks, like the Handbook of Industrial Organization has quite a bit of discussion on market power and concentration in, in economics in general. So what we wanted to get at is what's the, uh, what are the idiosyncrasies in agricultural concentration then, and with the idea of what do we think other researchers who are coming into this field need to know about? So we, a lot of this chapter is developing into a, hey, go check out this, go check out that, and which I think many of these Ag Econ chapters look like. Here's where I'm gonna talk about the things today. There's really three parts. I asked uh, David and Chris, you know, what, the, what do they want from this presentation? And I'm gonna give you a kind of a brief overview of what we chose to include in this and look at some particular points that we wanna emphasize in this chapter. It's not everything that's in the chapter, but some of the things that we think are of uh, sort of key interest to agricultural economists. And then with your help, uh, you know, part three is very, very short. It's just, what did we miss, right? So Alan's gonna help us with that as well. But as you're, re as you're seeing these slides go past and in 20 minutes, we gotta do this pretty fast. Just kind of look out for things that you think maybe we have holes in that you didn't hear us talk about. And, and that's what I'd really appreciate hearing from everyone there. And Jim, jump in at any time. All right, so what's in it? So what do we have in this chapter? So <clears throat> we've got a historical background, which I think is necessary to get agricultural economists up to speed, that this is not a new issue in agriculture. The idea that concentration has been something that people have been concerned about has been there for an awfully long time. Even though other chapters have talked about market power, we feel that there is some necessary discussion of that as well, because that's really what is driving a lot of the interest in terms of the conventional wisdom out there that concentration must be necessarily screwing consumers or screwing farmers uh, upstream or something like that. And that, that's how economists talk in terms of market power. We need to make that connection. What is the connection between concentration and market power? What does the literature say? But 
a lot of this has been covered in other places. So we do it. Um, the question is how much of that do we want to do? Industrial transformation is something that we think is really important. We've seen some shifts to larger and fewer plants. And a lot of these have nationwide reach. And a lot of these have a lot of vertical link linkages across the, the different marketing stages. So why, what, what's driving the transformation? What are the impacts there? And then how does market power play into those transformation analysis? Now, going back to the market power theme, a lot of the literature that is out there on market power has sort of a focus, and a lot of my own work does this too, is sort of what's the relationship between price and marginal cost, and how do you measure that, that especially when concentration is really high. And policy focuses uh, uh, tends to focus really heavily on highly concentrated market, but there's not as much out there on transformation focus, how we got concentrated markets and what the broader impacts of that are. So big picture pieces. Um, we think it's important that people who, I'm thinking in terms of a graduate student who might be getting started in this right off the bat, how do you actually measure concentration? What are the sources that are out there for, you know, if you wanted to go into, you know, looking at concentration of wheat growers, where, where would you find that? What's, what is it that's already been established? What are the kind of things that you would have to do yourself? What do we know about concentration and processing and retailing? What do we know about concentration in livestock? Why livestock? Livestock, as I'll say later, has had a lot, a lot of research done on it. And why is that? That's another important question. What about at the farm level? You hear all the time. I mean, um, we just went through a Democratic primary a uh, while ago, and some of the big players, when you know, <laughs> we get the, we get to go first here in Iowa, and so we get to see everybody, you know, eating their pork chops at the county fair, um, talking about how it's only big corporate farms, and they're you know they're eating up the small farmer, and you hear that an awful lot. But when you get into the data, you see it's a lot more nuanced than what the conventional wisdom is out there. So, our farms is the is the farm sector really becoming more concentrated? Is it a lot more concentrated today than it was 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago? I think a new graduate student coming into this would assume that it is, but it turns out that it's a lot more nuanced than what is presented, especially in the popular press. Um, then there's issues that are related to food and agriculture and related to concentration, issues about innovation, animal concentration. That's something that you don't think of as a concentration issue because we tend to think about market power, but animal concentration, confined animal feeding operations, for instance, are a big deal, especially here in the Midwest. And they have all sorts of other externalities that go along with them. We think these are important to discuss in the framework of concentration. But then other things like, what are we missing? This is your, where you come in. All right, I'm just gonna briefly go through the sections here of what we have in the chapter. Um, like I said, start out with a little history section. Concentration starts getting really big in the Gilded Age. So this is the time period after the Civil War up to the ver very first part of the start of the 1900s. These are where you see names like the Vanderbilts out there and the Carnegies and people start paying attention to a lot of wealth being concentrated in a, in a few firms. So you start getting things like the Sherman Antitrust Act that's coming out. But on the farm side, you also get things like the marketing orders coming in the early parts of the depression when people are trying to figure out in the cooperative movement, you get those earlier, right? So the, the farmers want to get together and sort of pool their resources. That also impacts concentration. So in this section, even though you could go long. I mean, a whole chapter on the history of this could be done, but what I've noticed looking at the other book chapters that are out there, there's not a lot of time spent on how much people were talking about concentration early on. So this isn't a new issue, even though it comes up all the time in the popular press as if this is happening only now. It's really not. People have been talking about concentration on farming and people have been talking about concentration at the processing sector for a very, very long time. Then we get into concentration in economic models, especially from structural models. And you have to talk about things like the concentration ratios and the Herfindahl indices and things like that. 
there's a lot written in other places about the new empirical industrial organization, the structure conduct performance paradigm stuff, but we talk about that, but we refer a lot of readers to things that are written elsewhere, but it is an important part. But if we go down that route, which was originally how I was thinking of doing this chapter, you just discover there's an awful lot written on this already. What about uh, how, do, how do the measures get used in policy? We show, you know, what everyone should know if they're getting into this for the first time. How does the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission actually use these measures? What are some of the principles that we've learned from these concentration measures? What are the, what's the basis for the measures? What's, what's the problems that these measures have in them? What do we know about problems like their geographic scope, their, their international scope? A lot of times people don't, don't pick up on the fact that some of the measures that get used, like in the census of manufacturers, are only for the United States, for instance, and they're not taking into account a lot of the international sectors there as well. So just some sort of warning labels uh, uh, sections in this chapter to just let people know more about it. Uh, how has concentration in food and agricultural markets changed? We got, I'll show you some examples of some of the tables we have in here. I don't think you can talk about this stuff without talking about the census of manufacturing tables. So we have some examples of those things. Um, we've got you know, roughly 50 food manufacturers and their six digit NAICS codes talking about the, you know, showing the concentration ratios, the Herfindahl indices. Um, conventional wisdom here is that there's an awful lot of concentration, but if you look at a lot of these industries, what you discover is at least in terms of the concentration ratios, a lot of them haven't changed much in the last 20, 30 years, which is kind of interesting, right? Because there's an assumption that it's just getting worse. But putting it all together and kind of giving people a global perspective, you see some industries that definitely follow this pattern of becoming more concentrated, but some industries hit a, hit a level of concentration, for instance, in the beef processing, they sort of hit this level of concentration in the late 90s, and then they just haven't changed much after that probably because they bumped up against the FTC guidelines. So it's good to see that sort of discussion, I think, somewhere, and I think it's necessary to be in there. One question I have, and you can get back to me at the end, is we don't include a section in here on agricultural lending, but you could. Um, my question is, is that anything anybody's worried about? And I got another question from a reporter not too long ago uh, talking about ag lending. And she was only looking at the conventional banking and she was looking at Wells Fargo and John Deere, in fact, again, and um, saying, oh, these are really big players. And I said, well, you know, if you bring in the farm credit system, they're actually not. And so, but we don't have anything on ag lending in there. And I just don't know if, if it fits. Um, we certainly can add a short one. So let me know your, your thoughts on that. Uh, other things you see, concentration, industrial transformation, Ag production, um, crops, livestock. Again, livestock research has been a big area, so it's going to get its own section. Concentration impacts beyond price. This, the, you know, the the CAFOs, for instance, are a form of concentration that you don't. We didn't originally think of as belonging in a concentration uh, chapter, but when you start thinking about are there negative externalities that economists could be studying from this? You go, well, you know, that's certainly one. If you're going to concentrate a sector and put a lot of animals in one spot, that's going to have problems. And it may not be a traditional market power problem, but it is a problem in other ways. And I think there is fodder for future research there. Uh, competition, innovation, what happens when mergers uh, stifle the introduction of a competing product, so-called so killer acquisitions. Um, let me show you a little bit of the kind of tables I was talking about earlier. So you get a, get a sense for these. So this is tables on the concentration ratios, the Herfindahl indices. This is just one of the tables. I just took a snippet of it, of the, the industries that are, that are looked at by, in the census of manufacturers. And we've got you know, the latest values from 2017. These come out every five years. And then we've got the changes back to 1997, just to see how things have changed in these different industries. We have uh, other tables on, uh, Jim can talk, Jim, I should let you talk, but uh, jump in anytime. But 
you know, the thing with, with farms and the idea that you only have really big farms left providing everything, there's some truth to that, but it depends on really how you look at that data. And so we have a section in there that talks a lot about, you know, whether you're measuring averages, whether you're measuring midpoints, what exactly it is that you're measuring, you have to be very careful on how you're doing those measurements because you'll get different answers depending on how you do the measurements. Uh, we've got some GIPSA information. So these are just a, a sampling of the type of uh, chapters we have there, or, or type of tables we have. I realize I'm going really fast, so we might have a bathroom break a lot faster, a lot sooner than we expect. Uh, so here's kind of like, what are the important issues that uh, we think researchers need to understand about ag uh, in the historical backgrounds that it's, the discussion of concentration and the uh, sort of a, a hold on power amongst top firms, a duopoly, oligopoly type hold has been in the literature for an awfully long time. And the concern about concentration in food and egg really goes back to, again, that gilded age. So a little bit of discussion about that is warranted. Uh, even economists though might not know the link between concentration measures like the CR4 and the HHI and market power. So we do have a section in there that talks about it. But the important thing to see there is uh, it really wasn't until 19, the 1970s that people started making that explicit connection. Before that, it was only an implicit one that there must be something about being big that was causing a lot of market power. And so even though people have been studying it for almost 100 years before somebody made that explicit link, we think it's good for a graduate student taking this up to understand that that link wasn't obviously there. To us, it's all obvious because we've studied it now, but it wasn't obvious to everyone. And if you think back to the to some of the complaints about the structure conduct performance paradigm, it even precedes that. There were discussions about the way concentration measures were done, that they really weren't measuring anything that was what we would call today market power. So other things, while, while there's this conventional wisdom that farming and processing has gotten more concentrated, in fact, this is really nuanced. And, and how you measure that concentration is going to impact how you measure whether or not there's market power there. So it's not that there is or necessarily is or necessarily isn't, but I do think that there is room for more research on how do we actually know whether or not farmers are being harmed by either the processors getting very big or the you know farms getting very large and, pr and producing most of the value out there. Uh, a lot of the consolidation in manufacturing, like I said earlier, a lot of it actually stopped about 20 years ago, or at least you know got to a particular point and then just kind of held steady there. Consolidation in farming, as I mentioned before. The big change there though, is you still have a lot of small farms. The idea that small farming has gone away is mostly uh, a myth. Again, Jim will jump in, depending on how you measure it. But one thing that does need more research is what's going on with mid-sized farms. And there you do see some real shifts and some real sort of hollowing out if you look at the data. Um, vertical control is a big area of research that should be looked into a little bit more. What else we got? It's still fruitful to try to figure out what's driving the consolidation at the farm levels. You know, whether you're looking at, is it a management issue, a technology, government payments, what is it? There's, there's been research done on this, but the research that we've looked at basically says there's room for more research. By comparison though, even though there may not have been as much research on why there's consolidation at, farm, at the farm level, there's a ton of research on livestock. I mean, this, this is, there's political reasons for this. Congress has had several studies of these things and they tend to foster uh, grants and they tend to foster whenever there's money th being thrown at something, you're gonna get a bunch of economists on board. But there are, I don't, you know, I'd have to count how many there are, but if, if I said there's over a hundred studies on just livestock research, I think that that would probably be, be about correct. And there's just an awful lot of work that's done on that. So I think it's worth pointing out some of the main research there, what some of the findings are, but also explaining why there, there is so much research on this. Um, 
big question that comes out of that research though is why isn't there why isn't there finding more market power given the size of the concentration ratios that you do see in say beef and pork what the studies tend to show is there's market power there's sort of no doubt about that but not as much as you might expect and that's what kind of makes them controversial because the farmers and ranchers don't buy that but the economists keep coming back and kind of showing that. And I think that, I don't think anybody's trying to show it come out one way or the other. I think that that's just what the data end up showing. And so we do talk a little bit about that. Well, what are the, what are the sort of theories now about why you're not finding it? And there are some, there are some theories that are out there. Two of them are like mam to mam. One is that all the models we've been using are misspecified. That's one. The other one is this idea of modern agricultural markets. So there's just this, the short story there is that there's these symbiotic relationships between say processors and certain uh, feedlots, for instance, on the, on the cattle packing side. And those relationships have existed and the processors really use the market power that they could, they'd, they'd be messing with their supplies too much. Okay, Jim, do you wanna jump in? I just feel like I'm rattling, rattling away here. So. Um, um, yeah, I'll give you a break. <laughs> Okay, give, give me let, let me let me just make one summary of what we're um, what we're concerned about as we're writing this, which is we want to find a way to differentiate ourselves from uh, chapters in earlier versions of this handbook, as well as John mentioned in the handbook of I.O. about they're basically about market power testing, and an interesting. The thing about that development is particularly as we got into sort of new industrial organization models and other things, the models themselves tended to move away from any explicit reliance on concentration measures um, and, had, and, and had towards a heavy focus on trying to derive things from demand or estimated cost functions. And we need to cover that, but we don't want to replicate it. And at the same time, there is uh, still a policy focus on concentration measures, uh, and some argue that there should be a stronger policy focus than there is. And there's also widespread interest in sort of major structural changes we've seen in industries over time, which can be summarized by saying they got more concentrated. There's obviously a lot more going on. So what we're trying to do within this chapter is bring in more of that structural change measurement stuff and, and uh, get a little bit on why do we care or should we care about this besides market power measurement. And then as well talk about why we see these changes. And so we wanna do that in addition to getting some coverage of the sort of traditional IO focus on measuring market power. So I think, I think that's my quick summary to try to give John a break. Thanks. And we're gonna turn it over to Alan, who's just gonna say, you screwed up from start to finish, but that, yeah, this, this is probably as good a place to stop as any. I think the, the ending of this, I'd like to have more in here. We, we kind of covered the, where should a new researcher look for something really fruitful? And, you know, I think innovation is a big deal, right? So what's going on, in, especially in the crop seeds and chemicals and with the mergers that we've seen, what's going on there really does affect farming and really does for, uh, affect production agriculture. And for those of you listening going, where's the retail side of this? I should have mentioned, we do have a very short section on concentration and retail, but the reason for that is there hasn't been that much done on it. So as, a, you know, as we think more about this, another fruitful area is more on, on the retail sector could be done. Uh, then this negative externality story is also something that I think is, is areas that are gonna get more and more interesting. And maybe it's just because I, moved from Kansas to Iowa, where all of a sudden negative externalities of having a lot of pigs in one place becomes readily apparent as I'm driving around, around the state. And so 
it could be that I was just thinking about it more, but I, I think that there's a there's a real story here to be told about concentration. And this the, things like CAFOs do come up in the popular press tied to the bigness of the Smithfields of the world and things like that. So that said, I'm going to stop there and let Alan uh, take over. And please, for all of you, if you've been taking notes, if, if you don't have any comments right now, send me and me or Jim an email and say, hey, do you have this in it? And this would be worth, worth talking about there. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, John and Jim. And I will uh, turn things also over to uh, Alan. Alan Love from Washington State, who is serving as discussant. Look. There you are. Thanks, David. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, John and Jim, I both re I really did enjoy the paper. I've had the advantage, obviously, of, of reading your first draft on it, and I thought it. Uh, I, I think you really scoped it in well by not overlapping uh, with other broadly known areas. And uh, I had also. I uh, hadn't talked to you, but I, I probably should have, but I did sort of focus my comments on areas I thought could uh, be expanded. So I think that fits right in with what, what you're asking for. Before I do that though, um, let me say some things I really liked about what you've done in coverage. One, I, I really like the historic development of the concepts and literature. I think that was really important and, and very useful. I liked your focus on specific policies and laws affecting agriculture, particularly the Clayton Act and Capra Volstead Act. Uh, those have been under attack in recent years, and I think uh, a great, uh, some appreciation of those historically and their impacts uh, on the markets and so on would be are really important to try to understand. Uh, I think that your emphasis on monopsony power and, and really pulling that into frame is really important. A lot of the antitrust stuff that's been done in other literatures almost solely focuses on monopoly power. And in agriculture, obviously, monopsony power is a, a big play. So I think that's uh, quite uh, useful and important. Uh, I like your, I really like the discussion of the underlying data sources and actually what data these statistics are collected from. Frankly, I learned a lot reading that section. And I think it's really important. It's one of the things I had my graduate students do was try to understand the underlying quality of the data they were looking at before they used it. And I think that's, uh, it adds a really nice dimension to this, to this work. And I learned quite a bit reading that. Uh, I also like uh, the, your, uh, how you cover uh, the literature, ideas, and data, and how it can be used to investigate concentration in new areas. You mentioned a number of different kinds of data sources that you could use to collect your own concentration studies and I thought that was very useful. And I certainly learned a whole lot reading that section that would be quite useful for future research. Uh, I think you provide us with a really nice uh, uh, literature review, extensive uh, concepts of concentration, how they're used and the things that you've just been discussing. So I think those are all just right on target and I learned a lot reading them. Um, I'd like to say, uh, one of my tests of a good paper is do I read it and get research ideas? And I have to say, you really triggered some in me when I read it. So I think that's, that's hit the target on that. Um, now, what are areas I think that could be added? And I would like to see you guys because you really have huge knowledge in these areas. Uh, one of them that I think is very important actually, and maybe the most important, is the definition and extent of a market. Um, the concentration ratios, however you measure them, uh, are defined by the market and the two things go hand in hand. Uh, you mentioned this, of course, at several places, but I would like to see a more extensive treatment of that uh, in line with maybe the, the, the discussion you have of Herfindahl index and how it's derived. And in particular, I think that's really important because uh, you know effectively that's defining what the Perfect, what the, these concentration measures should be. And there's a very big difference between the traditional ideas of an economic market. By year you go back to Stigler 42 and Marshall uh, and others, uh, which is basically a, a, a movement of prices and together sufficiently well. And what is an antitrust market, uh, which is defined in the horizontal merger guidelines dealing with hypothetical monopoly and SNP tests which I think are, you know, they're very different concepts. 
and they're quite important, I think, for understanding concentration and its importance. So I, I do think that's an area that uh, should be built up. I also think there's a good deal of misunderstanding about those concepts in our profession. And in particular, you know, there's, there was a period of time when we did a lot of co-integration studies and found uh, mark prices all moved together. Well, yeah, prices in agricultural markets will all move together because they share maybe a common input of feed, maybe a common input of some young animals that are used in the production that connect them. But there's almost, uh, in many cases, no arbitrage between them uh, because, because of perishability in agriculture, because of uh, issues of spoilage, because of issues of weight, because of issues of declining quality of the inputs. And so the whole local effect of concentration is really kind of unique to agriculture and I think a target area of what you're trying to achieve in the paper here. So I would, I would really kind of give that a, a, a closer uh, look at it. Um, and, and I think that would really help that area of research. So a second area I'd like to see more discussion of uh, is the measurement of extent significance of vertical relations. I think this is one of the big changes that we've seen in agricultural sector. And in a way, this, this sort of goes back to uh, Coase's theory and nature of the firm. You know, transactions, you can, you can have transactions either within companies or across markets. And the trend has been moving away from markets toward internal transactions within whether it's a firm or some sort of vertical structure. And I think that's the essence in some ways of, of concentration here and thinking about it. And I, I started thinking about one of the things I was thinking about was the whole coast theory and nature of a firm again, because I think it's interrelated with these concepts. So it contracts, control of in, uh, inputs, control of management decision, branding, tie-in sales, lock-in effects. You mentioned all these things, but I think it would be nice if, to consolidate that discussion and look at how these vertical relationships are affecting uh, competition. And the big question is, are we really now looking at competition among a few supply chains that compete in the marketplace, uh, where they are all of the settlement at the various levels are then bilateral agreements between the parties and the big competitions happening downstream in these supply chain negotiations with the retailers. And that's another point I'll, I'll bring up uh, you do mention retailing. I think it's really very important with where we are and where we're heading in agriculture. So I, I think some discussion and focus in this general area is, is pretty important looking forward and even where we are today um, that would um, I think be very interesting to add for researchers. So how does this affect our thinking about where we should be measuring concentration? I think that's for your paper and specifically that's a really important issue itself. Uh, is, is, are these supply chains what the level of competition is? Is that where the concentration should be measured? Uh, you know, where do we measure these things? And how do we find define concentration anymore? In a way, this comes down to a, a, a distinction. You know, historically, we looked at concentration by ownership. The key element in contracting ownership is who has the, the last ability to settle disputes and it's because of, of ownership. Whereas today, there's much more control in the supply chain uh, through these contract negotiations. And so uh, do we define concentration based on ownership or do we define it based on control? And if we define it based on control, how do we even define control? And I, I think that's a really fascinating issue uh, for the future of, of what we're looking at with concentration. That's a second area I kind of uh, think uh, you could add a lot of discussion. I'd be certainly interested in what you guys have to say about that because I, I think it's a fascinating area. A third area, and um, John, you mentioned this as well. I think that uh, there needs to be more of the downstream. A, a lot of your paper focus is upstream. I think the downstream part uh, could use uh, additional discussion and important one of the things I really uh, commend you on, the downstream concentrations really hasn't been considered much, as you're saying. I totally agree with that. Uh, but I was, I was surprised by the numbers you have in your paper. Um, the downstream HHI now, uh, the recent numbers you cite in there, I believe I've got them right, 
uh, for rural areas is 3,075, for non-metro areas, 2,924, and for metro areas, 1,524. I, I compared that to one of the most concentrated uh, manufacturing, food manufacturing areas, which is breakfast cereal. It's a famous one that's been studied over and over again. That's 2,210. So, it, I mean, that's a massive change. And if you looked at the change that's happened recently, it's, it's a big deal. So the evidence is really sparse about food retailers. There's been some studies done by FTC and others where they've had uh, experts come in and talk about practices. But one thing we do know is that there's slotting access is really important. Slotting fees, tie-ins with private label provision are, are big important items. Uh, and, and all of these uh, things sort of matter. Um, I did a very lightly cited piece with uh, Park and, and um, uh, uh, a couple of my colleagues at Texas A&M um, um, uh, uh, a few years ago. And what we looked at was causality using directed analytic graphs in the beef supply chain, where we took it all the way up from feeder cattle to uh, our uh, young animals to place on feed all the way through to the retail level. We selected that because of the data that were available at all the different levels. And what was interesting was we found a structural change in about 1997, where a lot of the uh, uh, control of the price movement seemed to be coming from the uh, packer level, kind of mid-level. And in 1997, uh, that seemed to switch over to the retail level, so that the, the leader of the information supply chain was happening at the retail level rather than at the packer level. Now that said, that, that says that that could potentially have a, a pretty big impact on the way that we think about concentration and, and what's going on and what we should be looking at and focusing on. So I, I, uh, uh, I would take a look at that and extend that uh, a bit more. The question as well, I think that it brings up is when quite a few years ago, I remember a very large literature, there were many Walmart effects, but one of the Walmart effects was sort of intense competition for access to Walmart as a means of selling your product and how that resulted in intense competition for cost reduction. So if, if this is happening at the retail level today, that's a, one big question because of the con concentration there, um, then how is that affecting the, the upstream suppliers and, and what are the effects that has? Because a lot of that now is contract driven and not so much market driven as it once was, at least in many areas, fruits and vegetables, livestock, many areas. So I think that that whole issue uh, needs a bit more. It's not that you don't touch on it, you do. But I think it's, I think it's if you define the future where we're going, I think it's, it's quite important to look at. Another related area here is there's no mention of food away from home consumption. And I think that's also an important area. It's a big change in agriculture. People aren't eating at home as much as they once did. And so while we're, you're looking at the food retailing, I, I think that the food away from home discussion is certainly pertinent. And here I would reflect on particularly food distribution at that level. There's two firms that I'm aware of. Um, Cisco and US Foods that distribute a huge part of that total supply to you know, restaurants, hotels, institutional uh, food demand and so on. And so I think that that would be a, a, a nice uh, important thing to include, to look at all the way from effectively the farm table and input supply, which you do look at, and you spend a good, good deal of time on the very, very important issue of, of technologies and um, you know, the, the, the elements that's happened with respect to the, the three big mergers that happen in the supply firm. But I think carrying that through to the retail level could be quite, quite useful for researchers and for the future to think about. And then finally, um, my last point is, and it was sort of what uh, I think, David, you pointed out really nicely at the beginning. And I, I would like to hear where we should go from here in terms of concentration measures. You know, given these changes that are happening, we tend to keep using the same concentration measures year after year after year. But where is, as we as profession, profession, as researchers and so on, where should we be pushing 
to, to actually measure concentration? Where is it important for understanding what's going on in our industry and with uh, agricultural sectors and, and various constituent parts? And so I think that's, that's I, I think, you know, after we go through this exercise and you guys have done a, a marvelous job of it, where do we go? What should we be looking at in terms of these concentration measures for the, for the future? So those are, those are a, a few things that I noticed. And I do want to emphasize, I really like the paper. Uh, I just, I think these are areas that would, uh, I think, benefit our profession quite a bit by looking at in a bit more detail. So thank you. And, and I want to also say thanks to uh, uh, Chris and David for putting this issue together. I think they are really important. I bought them as I've uh, gone through my profession, found them really useful through my whole career. So thanks for doing this. Thank you, Alan. That was that was great, thank you. So if, if uh, so we're just about on time, um, uh, Jim or John, if you wanted to respond quickly to, to Alan's comments, that would be fine. Um, if you have questions, we actually already have one question queued up, but go ahead and raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, so Zoe, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Hi there. Um, hi, Jim and John. Uh, thank you uh, so much for this chapter. I enjoyed learning about it just now. Um, one, one thought that I had um, as you were motivating the chapter, John, was that uh, you, you talked about, you know, this, this motivation of the conversation with the reporter and this concern about the relationship between concentration and market power and how, you know, folks keep saying, oh, there's there's market power, there's monopoly. We're like, no, that's not a monopoly. You know, I, I tell this to my students all the time too. Um, I wonder, are there, you know, we're really focused on telling people that there's not as strong a connection between market power and uh, as we precisely measure it and concentration as folks think, but are there, what are, I guess my question is what are the impacts of concentration that we don't capture with market power measures um, and you mentioned the negative externality aspect, but I think one way to frame this is thinking about, are there things that folks really are seeing that are coming from concentration that could be impacting? I'm, you know, one, one piece that came up for me is labor um, that I didn't hear mentioned um, and, uh, and community kind of community impacts of concentration. And there was a mention of kind of rural, uh, what's happening in you know, rural areas with rural retail that Alan um, mentioned. Uh, and so I wonder, are there, what, is there kind of a new, more literature that's looking at what are those impacts of concentration outside of market power? And are there any that we should be concerned about and thinking about? And maybe the focus on market power has kept us from thinking about um, as much, as much previously. Um, and the other, the other piece to that to me is the connection maybe to, to COVID and to thinking about um, resilience in food systems, which is a huge topic right now. And what, uh, you know, what have we learned through this experience about what concentration means for resilience of our food systems? Um, and you can define that uh, broadly. So those are just my, my quick reactions. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Alan is kind of touching on that with the, the supply chain thing. And Alan, I think you I think you 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 hit the nail on the head. I think that we do need to be thinking in terms of how do you measure this is what Zoe is saying too, how do you measure the what we traditionally like to think about measuring market power, but there's more to it. We we know how to measure it for a firm. We don't know how to measure it for a supply chain, and there's a lot of things going on there. Uh, both of your comments were really helpful to me. I've been taking lots of notes, so if I'm not responding, it's only because I'm writing things down. I don't have an answer. I have a I want I have a homework assignment is what I have here. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, John, I think that's what makes it exciting and and why I think it can contribute a lot too, right? Because of of how we're thinking as a profession about some of these issues moving forward. So, well, the COVID thing is huge, and Jim and I talked about it a little bit as we were writing this, but. Um, you know, and I'm on a grant and a lot of people on this call or on other grants, we're, 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 we're looking at this resiliency issue. And, you know, the fact that the, 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 the food bounced back from that initial, initial shutdown and everyone was pointing to, look, the, this, the system is screwed up. Look at, we can't get food in the stores. But how it changed and had to move from, 
like you were saying, Alan, you know, we went from ha over half of our eating was outside of the home to all of a sudden over, <laughs> we're all eating inside of the home again. And Cisco and U.S. Foods had to all of a sudden change how they did things. Yeah. But then within a, within a couple months, you were getting food back in the shelves. And uh, it, so the resiliency issue is there, but it's, it's fodder for research. I agree. I, and yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Both of you are, are right. There's, there's a lot more to this that has to do with the vertical chain. Let me uh, just jump in briefly in, in response to Zoe's comment. I think on this notion that we have of adding in what we call industrial transformations in these various sectors as related to concentration and as somewhat distinct from market power. In those contexts, that's where I think a lot of concern with major structural changes and major increases in concentration come about because they're, you know, they're pretty disruptive to existing sellers. They have substantial uh, community and in some cases quite substantial labor impacts. And what we want to aim to do within the space we have is be able to identify some of those, suggest where, ways of where they're important and where there might be fruitful research going on. But I, I think that is a clear um, you know, outcome of some of the uh, really striking changes in concentration that you see in some industries over time. Ian, I believe you're up next. Thank you, David. And um, thanks to uh, John and, and Jim for what sounds like a really great chapter and for, for Alan's comments. Um, uh, having started out my career in, in the UK and having spent a lot of my career working with Steve McCorriston, I think I'm gonna make a few comments uh, that he would make if he were here today. And that is that I think and I haven't read the chapter, so correct me if I'm wrong, but based on some comments that John made initially, this seems very US centric to me. Um, and the reason I mention that is it, it ties in with the comments that Alan was making about, it's important to think about vertical uh, market structure issues as well as horizontal market structure issues. And if you look at the, the work that Steve McCorriston did with the OECD, and all the work that he and, he and other colleagues in Europe have done, there's been considerably more focus on the, the market power that retailers have in their food marketing systems than maybe we think of here in the US. And, you know, in my own work reviewing that, I was really struck by, and Alan, you, Alan and Jim, you might remember this, when we first started out back in the early 90s with the NC194 project, as a leftover from the, from the, um, the, the work that um, Bruce Marion and John Connor were doing with, with, the, with the projects, the regional projects that predated that project. There was a lot of discussion of vertical coordination. If you go back to the red and blue books that came out of that big project, that were very descriptive and didn't really take us very far. But if you look at this modern this modern agricultural economics literature that really does a good job of thinking about vertical market relationships. And here I'm thinking of the work that Steve Hamilton and um, Tim Richards have done, and also um, Rob Innes and Sophia Villas-Boas at Berkeley and others uh, in Europe thinking about retail price maintenance, slotting allowances, all of this stuff. I think that you really do need to tease that out a bit more carefully. I'm not saying you need vast quantities of EU, you know, concentration data in the food processing, manufacturing and retailing sectors, but I do think you need to, I think you need to focus on where the focus is in the US, but where the focus is elsewhere. And the EU is the obvious example where a lot of research has been done. I see Christoph had his hand up as well. And maybe I've, already, maybe I've already asked the question that he was proposing to ask, but I think you are ignoring that literature. And then my second question or comment, um, and Jim, this relates back to the conversations we were having, I don't know, maybe over a year ago when we were talking about having a session at the meetings last, last 
last summer, which we never had in the end. And that is people like Shapiro have been writing pretty extensively about, um, do we need to start rethinking mergers policy here in the US uh, because of uh, you know growing concentration in other sectors? And I just wondered how relevant Shapiro's arguments in his you know, Journal of Economic Perspectives paper, and I've read a couple of his law review papers in this area. It seems like the seed industry and some of those industries, it's very relevant, but how relevant is that broad argument to thinking about concentration in, in the food manufacturing and food retailing industries? Anyway, thank you very much. Um, let me just react quickly. Um, on your sites on retail and supply chain, and yeah, I think you're right. Um, uh, John and I are both pretty US centric. Uh, and, and I think it is good advice to take after our first draft at, where we threw down what we know quickly and what we can do confidently uh, to take a close look at that, that further step, particularly on the retail side. On the um, references to sort of Carl Shapiro and antitrust policy, what, I, what I, I recently read, John Quoka has a new book out focused on merger policy that I think is really pretty clean and concise and something we, we should try to steal stuff from. But because it is also very clean on how you should think about using concentration measures in a policy sense. Um, on the broader stuff of, of Carl Shapiro and, and others regarding innovation and market power, I think that I think we have a little and we can e easily slip in more because ag has played agribusiness in any case has played an important role in some of those recent cases and that has become increasingly important in policy in the last two decades. Ag has played an important role in the seed chemical cases and in the earlier precision planting machinery case. Um, and that, that gives us a way to introduce uh, that broader issue uh, that is still a huge difficult issue to challenge, which, to, to investigate, which is uh, connections among concentration, market power and investment for innovation. Uh, but that's something I think, given the way the field is going, that we definitely need to tackle. Mark, I believe you're next. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, John and Jim. This is, is so my co-authors and I have been exchanging texts and we were asking, so how do we go about sitting other about citing other chapters in the same volume? Uh, and so this is very inspiring for our own work, um, which we'll be presenting this afternoon. But so Zoe um, mentioned part of what I was going to mention, but yes, I think the resilience aspect is hugely important to discuss. And I would kind of separate it from COVID because we don't want people to read this in 15 years and say, man, those guys were obsessed with COVID. Uh, but I think just, you know, just saying, well, resilience to all kinds of things. And I agree with you guys that, um, I think supply chains have been remarkably resilient. I, I was anticipating much worse at this time last year and and our food supply has bounced back admirably and adapted admirably. So that's, but just kind of resilience in general to stuff, right? To conflict, natural disasters, pandemics, whatever you want to imagine, any kind of disruption somewhere would be really useful to talk about on the big picture aspects. And also on big picture, I would talk about uh, and maybe I've missed it in, in all of the flurry of, of, of stuff that uh, John presented, but stuff something about food safety would be useful because the greater concentration, you know, it's kind of like the obvious trade-off between concentration and how generalized those food safety shocks or, you know, any kind of food safety shocks get propagated through the food system. And I, I would at least address that briefly. And then also on the causes of concentration, uh, when you guys talk about the Gilded Age, what, you know, what this brought to my mind was this was an era that was ripe with, uh, ripe, ripe with corruption and with political capture. So I, I realized that this could probably command its own paper um, and its own chapter, but what are the root political causes of this concentration when you had, you know, people um, who were, I mean, it's already fairly concentrated at the time, but but kind of the political system might not have been as clean and as it was more kind of like backroom dealings. And so, oh, well, if you give me this bill, I will kind of do this and that. So I think it'd be interesting to have 
the political capture roots of concentration of concentration covered somehow in one or two paragraphs. Thank you. This is really good. Also, there's. I just want to say this. The, John, the bit you had in the slides about vertical coordination is much more to blame than horizontal concentration. Is uh, it is, is I think it's going to generate if it hasn't if it hasn't been explored, and I certainly don't know about that literature very much, but it will generate you know at least fifteen to twenty papers. I think that's very interesting. Uh Let's see, uh, Christoph, you had had your hand up. Uh, did you still intend to ask a question? <laughs> well, um, basically my question was already asked by Jan. Um, my feeling was that, well, it was uh, very US centric. And from my European perspective, I'm not sure uh, if we uh, do have the same kind of concentration, for example, in, uh, in livestock. Uh, so, I would not have talked about retailing. I, it's also a big issue, but maybe it could be interesting to have some international comparison of this concentration. What, what is driving the differences between countries and why do we have so much concentration in the US and or, or so much elsewhere? And uh, so, yeah, that, that was my question. We were the first the the America first draft came out in a previous administration, so we'll we'll work. On it. <laughs> that is beautiful. I uh, we have just maybe one or two minutes, um, and and since there are no other hands up, I'll I'll ask the question that I was contemplating. I just I'm interested in thinking about uh, chemical input market that is has become. Uh, increasingly concentrated in the U.S. well, in the world. Um, in the U.S., it's an interesting thing to me uh, where we, we have some laws that are intended to sort of facilitate generic competition in these markets, and yet uh, we lag way behind other parts of the world in actually having generics compete. Um, and I, I think a lot of that has to do with uh, some of the way uh, market power is exercised in, in relationships with uh, distributors and, and things along those lines. I, I just wondered, is some of those tactics seem like they'd be an important thing to address somewhere. I don't know that there's a whole lot of, of work on it in agricultural literature. There seems like there should be, but, uh, but I would be interested to under, well, hear your response. Well, this is Jim. There's, I, and you know, there's a significant literature on that in pharmaceuticals, where it's quite common to, uh, to pay generics not to enter, which has always blown me away in terms of antitrust policy. Um, I don't actually know if that happens um, in, in ag chemicals. Uh, it, so, and so I'm pretty sure there's not existing literature. It's worth, it's, it's one of the things that it's worth thinking about in a section on innovation. And, and just to respond just briefly to bring in uh, what I thought of when Christoph was speaking before, the EC uh, regulatory agency for the seed and chem mergers had some really nice uh, background information on how they thought about those mergers and what the issues were with, with regard to the EC. And they were really, in some ways, uh, separate and more research oriented than what you saw coming out of the U.S. So there, there is an angle to bring in a few more things here on an innovation section. The problem is we're probably not going to solve any issues. There's an immense number of questions there. But. Very good. Uh, so thank you to you all. Oh, we have another question from Zoe. I'll, uh, go ahead, Zoe. Oh, I just wanted to um, respond to that really quick to that point, David. I just wondered if the generic, if um, one place where we are seeing this kind of uh, generic to and specialization conflict in ag is in ag machinery repair um, and the move toward right to repair policies. And, um, and that I know is one of the concerns that, that we hear about from about John Deere and, and other things. So I wonder if that could factor in as an example here uh, of thinking about uh, in the innovation space, as an example. Yeah, 
Very good. If I see no more hands, um, apparently the key to ending on time is starting five minutes early. Um, so uh, we will take a break and meet again at the top of the hour. <laughs> Thank you very much to all, all three of you. Thank you to all, especially to Alan. That was, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah great, great work. Nicely done, Alan, Jim, and John. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chris.
Hello and welcome back. We should go ahead and get started, I guess. Uh, so for this hour, we uh, we will be hearing from uh, Christoph from INRE and uh, and Carl also from INRE, talking about trade in agricultural and food products. Um, it looks like. Uh, Christoph is here. Okay, turn it over to you for uh, 25 minutes. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, so uh, this chapter is written with Carl Genia. I will do the presentation alone. Carl is very nice. He's taking a break from his vacation to help me answer the question, but he does not have a great connection. So you will hear from him only for the questions. Um, okay, so to start our chapter, we had a look at the last chapter on agricultural trade, and it was 20 years ago. It was Karp and Perloff. And exactly at the same time, there were two seminal papers that have completely reshaped the field of international trade with great influence uh, in, for ag and food trade. So these two papers were Eton and Khartoum. Uh, first, in 2002, Ethan Engertum was crucial to redefine research on comparative advantage and to provide additional foundation for the gravity equation. And Melitz in 2003, starting a new field on firm level analysis. So it means that because of these two papers, the field is has changed a lot in the last 20 years. And so to cover it, we had to make some difficult choices. So one choice we have made is that we will not really cover traditional trade policy analysis. It was one of the main object of Karl and Perlov. It's also well covered in many recent surveys, including the handbook chapter of Costino and rodriguez Clark. But we will cover um, so the non-standard way of uh, trade policy analysis, like non-tariff barriers or counter-cyclical trade policies that have been very important in the last 20 years for agricultural trade. So how is our chapter organized? First, we have in section two, uh, the, ele the element of the standard trade model. But since trade models will differ on the supply side, we will keep the supply side on for section three and section four, depending on what we address. In section two, we only put all the comments uh, element for the demand side. In section three, we will present aspect of comparative advantage. So things inspired from the work of Ethan and Khartoum, section four on firm level analysis. Section five will focus on trade cost, and section six, it will be more about um, showing various examples in which trade is not the key question, but it's crucial to answer important policy questions. Since uh, comparative advantage is about differences in undermines, productivity, things like this, it's more about trade in agricultural products, commodities, while firm level analysis is more about trade in differentiated products, so more about trade in food products. So it's not uh, perfectly this, but it's a good way to think about these sections. In the interest of time, I will not present the model, so I'm skipping section two and jumping to section three on comparative advantage. Okay. Um, in, on comparative advantage, we will present first some common elements of many models uh, in this logic. Uh, then we will present gains from trade under certainty. Then gains from trade under uncertainty. And finally, the interaction between comparative advantage and structural transformation. Um, since the seminal paper by Ethan and Khartoum, there has been a huge literature assessing gains from trade under various model settings. So that was what was surveyed in the handbook chapter of Costino and rodriguez Clark. In this section, we will focus on the ag component of this literature. 
and we will look mainly at, at two different approaches. One is based on empirical evidence and the other one on counterfactual simulations from quantitative models. So one of the difficulty when we want to assess empirically against from trade is that usually we don't have uh, that much information about international trade costs and their historical change. But there is one solution, which is to use historical, historical episodes of reduction in domestic trade costs. And what is great with this solution is that it provides the rare opportunities of observing a kind of a textbook situation where you have a region that is in autarky and that moved to free trade because it is not connected through new railroads or new highways while before it was in autarky. And because of the data availability or because of historical reasons, just the fact that when we have built railroads, uh, many countries were mostly producing just ag. So this literature has a strong ag focus. So in this literature, we can distinguish two approaches, the work working on long distance, so that most of the work and the landmark papers in this literature are the papers by Dave Donaldson. So we will cover various papers, but I just want here to cite these two, the one on railroads in India and the other one on railroads in the US. And another literature is on the last mile access, but it's more for poor countries and for recent episodes of reduction of the last mile. The idea here is that even if you have built highways or railroads, the villages may still not be connected to the road system. And so there, is, there are huge trade costs. And what happens when you connect these villages that are mostly producing agricultural products uh, to the main road system? So that's about the empirical evidence. Uh, there is a uh, whole literature also looking at what models tell us uh, about gains from trade. And um, so here we will survey what this uh, model tells about the specificities of agricultural products and how they matter for gains from trade. So there were various papers that I reference here um, where you have some specificities of the agricultural sectors, like the similarities between land and demands or the low demand and supply elasticities. And when you account for these specificities, you see that you have much higher gains from trade than with usual trade models. Another strand of the literature is looking at what happens when you reduce trade costs and how reducing trade costs affects the specialization within a country. So that, for example, Sotelo within Peru and how the crop mix change with reduction in trade costs or how the input use change with the reduction in trade costs. So input are costly to trade. And so uh, Farouki and Pellegrina has, have looked at how it, it affects um, overall productivity and specialization when uh, we have a reduction in trade costs for input use or Porteus for Sub-Saharan Africa. So this was about gains from trade and uncertainty. But a specificity of agriculture is that production and prices are quite volatile and much more volatile than in other tradable sector, which means that because of this, there is a potential role in smoothing idiosyncratic shocks through trade. So we can have gains from trade under uncertainty, even if there is no gains from trade under uncertainty. And it was a key, uh, a key issue for a long time in ag economics, but there have been uh, various contributions in the last decade on this. Uh, again, some, some of them by Donaldson was shown that the development of the railroad network can mitigate famine uh, in uh, India, uh, but also many other paper, many, many other important, important paper on, uh, on the topic. Uh, what we also address that, is quite, that I think is quite important is that trade cannot achieve stability by, alone. And that's because trade is costly, trade takes time, uh, and so it's not, it, it, it does not work perfectly. But there is a complementarity with flows of information, because information can arrive much more quickly than trade. Uh, and so there is also a stream of research showing the effect and the complementarity between information from telegraph or from cell phone uh, with trade to stabilize prices. So 
In the previous paper, we were focusing on a standard comparative advantage. But if we look at some data, there, are, uh, there is a puzzle. And one puzzle is that the relative productivity of ag compared to non-ag is lower in poor than in rich country. But despite that, poor countries tend to specialize more in ag. So this means that there are other forces that tend to counteract comparative advantage, and that's structural tr transformation. So a lot of the structural transformation is about closed economy models, but there are open economy contributions, and it's interesting to see what they can tell us about specialization in ag. So in this chapter, we will cover two key questions. One is how comparative advantage interact with the level of development to determine country specialization in agriculture. And the second one is how openness to trade interact with comparative advantage to affect the path of structural transformation. Is it better to be open or close to trade to do your structural transformation? No firm level analysis. So for firm level analysis, in the first subsection, we will present the main element of the theory and how to apply it to the food industry. In a subsection two, it will be about the link between productivity and input prices. And what is important here is that in the food sector, the inputs are the raw material from the agricultural sector. So that's the backward linkage between food and ag. Section three, uh, product quality. Section four, aggregate implication. And section five, some extensions to make uh, the theory even more relevant to the food sector. So um, since the work of Melitz, we have seen the development of a large literature that studies uh, the role of firms in trade. And there have been many contributions extending the, the core model to study the features of trade by food firms. And what is very, what is great with this literature is that it's a lot of theory that can be tested with firm level data. And we have a lot of data uh, at the firm level. So in this literature, the main key ingredients are imperfect competition with product differentiation and productivity heterogeneity. When we combine these, we obtain that we have some firm level adjustment to trade along the extensive margins. So new variety, new firms, and along the intensive margins. So we have winners and losers from uh, trade liberalization within a sector. So when we apply this to the food sector, so there have been many papers testing the prediction of this theory on food firm level data. Uh, and for this, we have reduced form evidence, such, and this shows that uh, the more productive food firms are more likely to export. They have higher exports, and they save more. They will serve more market and more distant market. So we have, we can confirm the productivity sorting of these firms, and it all. It is also confirmed with that the productivity cutoff for firms increase with distance and decrease with market size. And it's possible to extend, to modify the standard melitz chanet model to account for backward linkages. For, so for the fact that the food firms process agricultural inputs. And then it will show some effect of trade liberalization and the fact that the more, productivity, the more productivity food firms will gain more from agricultural trade liberalization or that the low productive food firms are more likely to exit after a trade liberalization. Food products um, are heterogeneous in terms of quality. And it's very important with respect to trade because we know there is a well-known effect, Alkian Allen effect. Um, and so it's interesting to extend traditional model so that product quality is a strategic choice by a firm. And it's rep represented by the fact that producing higher quality involves higher marginal cost and higher fixed cost. And this cost will increase with, with quality. And then there are various results in this literature showing that more productive food firms will tend to sell products with higher quality, have higher market shares and export to more destination. 
or that there is a correlation between prices and productivity or with importer income per capita. But one of the main challenge in this literature is what is quality, how to measure quality. Uh, and there are various approach to do this that we will survey. One of them is to do a di direct measure that's possible, for example, for wine. So it has been done for champagne, for cognac. Um, it's possible to also have a proxy for quality using the R&D expenditure of a firm or the quality certification like ISO certifications. And lastly, it's possible to infer quality from price and quantity data. That's Candalwal uh, methodology. Um, so what I was mentioning before, that was about the evidence at the firm level. But after that, we can go from the firm level to the aggregate level by in, uh, integrating over, over the universe of firm. And they are important aggregate implications of this firm level theory. One is that aggregate productivity will tend to increase with freer trade. That's because market share will shift to the more efficient firms or will exit uh, because of the exit of the low productivity producers. And this has been confirmed on food firms. So we see that the productivity of food firms in average tend to increase after liberalization. But one of the limits of this mechanism is that the more productive firms, they also tend to have higher markups. And so because of this, it implies some markup dispersion and so some misallocation of resources, which will limit the gains from trade. Um, another aggregate implication is that when we aggregate over all firms, we can generate a gravity type equation, which can be estimated. So this has been done for the food sector. And then from this, it's possible to extend traditional CG model to account for firm level heterogeneity. No trade costs. So up to now, trade costs was, were absolutely key, but they were left completely unspecified. In this section, we try to characterize what are the trade costs, their nature, origin, specific consequences, and we will mostly cover three topics. The distribution cost, so that's the role of wholesalers and retailers. Uh, the role of public and private standards, like non-tariff measures, and trade policy adjustment and ag agricultural price volatility. So on distribution cost, the standard approach is that firms distribute themselves their product. But in reality, intermediaries have an important role and it tends to affect the result from standard trade models. So there are we will consider two kinds of intermediaries. The first one, uh, that's the wholesalers. And wholesalers, they, uh, they handle a large portfolio of products. Because of this, they will allow to lower the fixed cost of exporting. So the presence of a wholesaler uh, can mean a cheaper access to a foreign market. But on the other hand, uh, this cheaper access is uh, counterbalanced by the fact that they will imply higher viable cost because of double marginalization. So this can be avoided only by the more productive firms because the more productive firms can export by themselves. And so this is something that has been confirmed in the data. The more productive firm will export by themselves or they will acquire an intermediary while the less productive firms will export through wholesalers. Another key uh, intermediary, that's the re retailers. And that's because today in developed countries, a lot of uh, food purchase is done uh, in supermarkets. And there, is, there are links between these supermarkets and trade. For example, it's possible to it has been shown that the overseas presence of retailer of a given country, it's associated with the export from uh, the same country. They are also linked related to standards. That's because retailers tend to impose some private standards of quality. And because of this, they will attract the more productive uh, food firms uh, who will have, uh, which will have a lower access cost and, and better performance. Um, one key contentious issues in trade negotiation in the last decades 
that were uh, the non-tariff measures. So one of them, which we'll cover, that's the geographical indication, but there is a limited literature on the topic. The core of the issue will be about um, the quality standards. So the sanitary and phytosanitary standards and the technical barrier to trade. There we have both theory and evidence. About the theory, we can sh it's possible to show that if these barriers are aimed to correct market failure, then they are non-discriminatory. They increase trade and welfare. On the other hand, they can be post-discriminatory because they involve higher variable and fixed costs. If all countries adopt various standards, that then it increases fixed costs and it can reduce trade and welfare. We have also evidence on these barriers. They tend to decrease uh, trade, especially for the less developed countries. They increase the export of the more productive firms at the expense of the lower productive firms, and they increase the quality of traded products. Um, and the last section will be about the role of trade as mediating shocks. So here the idea is to propose a quick coverage of various key agricultural issues where trade is not at all the object of interest, but it is absolutely central for mediating the effect of shocks. So I can mention climate change adaptation, climate change mitigations like biofuels policies, technological change and Givens paradox, nutrition. So all these issues they are key defining issues of our time. And if you look at the contribution that have been done on this, you have many uh, agricultural economies working on trade issues that have done key um, contributions in multidisciplinary scientific journals and outside academia in policy cycle. And so that's, I think it's important to also show to the potential uh, PhD student reading such a chapter, the, the, um, the potential of publication outside standard journals. One uh, issue is climate change adaptation. So that's an old issue uh, addressed in the 90s, but there have been recent innovation uh, with the ability to account now for within country change in comparative advantage. And there are three key research questions here. One is the incidence of climate change and trade will play a big role with respect to the incidence of climate change because of the terms of trade effect. The second one is the role of trade in adaptation and with contrasting results on this. And the third one is the, pot the potential change in comparative advantage between ag and non-ag. And this is a very recent literature with um, interesting results on the interaction between comparative advantage, structural change, and migration. Another topic is climate change mitigation. Here, the idea is that trade uh, creates uh, linkages at distance, which means that a local policy in a country can have effect on another country. And a typical ex example is the biofuel policies and the indirect land use change debate. So most of this debate is not related to trade, but there are key trade issues. One of them is how to model uh, trade in agricultural products. Another one is the incidence of these policies. And the incidence of the policy is again determined by the terms of trade effect. So trade is key to understand the effect of these biofuel policies. But since then, this approach is now applied to many other policy questions uh, where we have potential conflicts between objectives. It could be between mitigation and food security, mitigation and biodiversity. So I will point to various papers and to surveys on, uh, on this. Last example is uh, nutrition. We have seen that trade can be beneficial for food security because of uh, more stable prices, higher access, but it can also have other effects uh, related, for example, to obesity. And so we will cover a bit the trade paper analyzing the interaction between taste and prices and the fact that taste can be partly endogenous. They can be determined by habits that are formed also based on past prices. And so this interaction between taste, habits and prices have consequences for gains from trade. Okay, so now I have to conclude. 
um, if you if we look at how has the field has evolved in the last 20 years we could say that it's a bit the convergence between new theories that are able to account for economic heterogeneity so that's Eton Khartoum and Melitz a lot of new data archive film level spatial data new multidisciplinary questions, climate change, nutrition, biodiversity, new approach. It's a bit the combination now of the credibility of revolution and simple quantitative trade models, which means that now the field is very different than uh, 20 years ago. So it's much more diverse than just the study of trade and ag policies. Um, we study food products in addition to ag products. Well, if you look at Carp and Perloff, they were barely mentioning food. And with all the coming challenges, there are still a lot of great work to do with these new tools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christophe. That was wonderful. Um, let's see, Ian Sheldon from Ohio State will be our discussant. Uh, so I'll turn things over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, and thanks to uh, Chris and David for inviting me to discuss this chapter. And thanks very much to Christophe and Carl uh, for giving me something different to do last weekend rather than watch uh, English Premier League on television, which was to, was to read through their chapter really carefully. So just Christoph did this at the beginning of his presentation and he kind of revisited that at the end of his presentation, but I just wanted to summarize the chapter because there's a lot going on in this chapter because uh, a lot has happened in international economics in the last 20 years with the development of what I would call the new, new international economics as opposed to the new international economics, which is what uh, when I first came to the U.S. back in the late 1980s was what I, was what I was interested in, was the so-called new international economics uh, that was pioneered by people like Paul Krugman and Ilana Han Heltman originally. So as a template for their chapter, the authors center their review around these two seminal papers by Eaton and Quartum from Econometrica in 2002, and then Mark Mellitz's paper in 2003. And I would point out that Mellitz's paper and some of his follow-up papers with Ottaviano have been very influential outside of international economics. Uh, in, in another life, I've, I've published a couple of papers on uh, regional economic and geographic issues where uh, Mellitz's work is quite influential in thinking about um, how to measure productivity of firms in cities and that kind of stuff. So Mellitz's work is pretty well cited outside of the international economics literature. So given, you know, the Eaton and Courton model did what? It basically meant that we could go beyond our standard international economics textbook, which talked about Ricardo, and then that was about it on the Ricardian model. Um, and it has basically brought back the, the whole idea of productivity, trade costs and geography really matter and has made the whole Ricardian model uh, irrelevant again uh, in international economic analysis. So I think that was a very fundamental paper. And then Mellitz's paper, which of course extended uh, Paul Krugman's uh, original work on monopolistic competition and trade, which made the restrictive assumption that, that all firms were able to export and there were no asymmetries across firms. And, but this didn't tie up with, with what we saw in the data, which was that very few firms actually export. So adopting these two papers and the work that's come from there, both in the international economics and the agricultural economics literature, their chapter breaks down into five key sections. Uh, first of all, they I really like the discussion of um, the demand side, they lay out the CES demand structure that's common uh, to all modern trade models uh, and they, they show the different levels of structure uh, of the demand system which I found very helpful. And then move into the focus on the, the neo-Ricardian analysis of trade in homogeneous goods and I think they make the very good distinction that 
the, the neo Ricardian model does a very good job of explaining trade and always is a good way of thinking about trade in, in agricultural commodities. And then they move into the application of the firm level analysis to trade in differentiated food products that draws on this heterogeneous firms literature uh, stimulated by Mellitz's seminal paper. Then they have this very nice section on uh, the characterization of trade costs. Um, I just happened to pick out uh, the discussion of geographic indicators, but they, they really do a nice job of bringing in the work on non-tariff barriers that um, particularly people like John Begin and Yo Swinon have done uh, over the years. And then finally, they have this last section where they talk about trade as a mediating factor, particularly with respect to things like climate change and the role of biofuels and a few other topics that they discuss. So my overall view of what they've done, so, I, so this is my big picture take of the chapter, is that the combination of, of Dixit Stiglitz preferences, so this is the seminal paper by Dixit and Stiglitz in 77 in the AER, that, that paper was fundamental to the work that Helpman and Krugman did to incorporating uh, product differentiation into international trade models. If you tie that in with the role of productivity, and that's the thing I think that's important about Eaton and Cortum's paper and Mellitz's paper, they're both stories about productivity. The Eaton and Cortum paper is about country productivity in industries, whereas the Mellitz paper is about within industries, it's about the productivity of firms. And so you have these two interesting stories going on that international trade is driven by productivity at the industry country level, and it's also uh, driven by uh, productivity at the firm level. And you get these different and interesting predictions about the impact of trade liberalization in the presence of productivity. So I think that's really, really very fundamental. And thirdly, all of these models tie in to Samuelson's great uh, idea of not trying to model the transport sector, but to incorporate transport costs as iceberg transport costs, that's quite fundamental. The idea that you have to export more of a good to a final market uh, in order to do it, that's a way of embedding tariffs, transport costs and other frictions. And I think that's one of the great contributions of this literature, particularly the Eaton and Corton paper is tying together these three ideas. And then that leads to this neat uh, section of the chapter where they, they go from thinking about trade costs conceptually into thinking about how to measure these things and what kind of trade costs actually matter. Now, somebody who came out of the thinking about the new international economics and what that mean, might mean for the analysis of agriculture and food trade, I think this chapter really highlights that there's a much tighter connection between the advances made in the new, new international economics analysis Eaton and Cortum and Mellets, and empirical work in agriculture and food trade. I think back to a paper I wrote in 1990 that I published in Applied Economics. Maybe Alan, you might remember this paper. Alan Love, you might remember this paper. We took a very reduced form version of the Helpman Krugman model and tried to think about um, trade. In, and at the time, I don't think we even called it a gravity equation in that paper but it was a very crude connection between the new international economics and agricultural food trade. And I, I don't think we did a particularly good job in that paper. And I think it's taken another 20, 25 years of, of both theoretical and empirical research to make that connection much, much stronger. And one thing in my final point I wanna make in my overall comments before I make some more specific comments is that I get a lot of papers to review on the gravity equation. Uh, both <laughs> editors of the, a the AJE send them to me, editors of the European Review of Ag Econ send them to me and other journals. And I get extraordinarily frustrated that many of these papers are very empirical, but pay very little attention to the fact that this new literature has provided a fundamental general basis to the gravity equation. The gravity equation is quite general. It comes out of a Ricardian model, a la Eaton and Cortum. It comes out of a heterogeneous firms model, a la Mellitz. And it does come out 
uh, of a Helpman and Krugman type of monopolistic competition model as well. And that's why that Costano um, Rodriguez Clare chapter in the handbook is so important as it showed us how general gravity is. And I, I have a couple of comments to make about that in, in my discussion. So moving into my specific comments and I've structured these around uh, the, main, the main sections of the book, sorry, of the chapter, um, obviously I can't cover everything they've said and this is such a detailed chapter and they haven't finished all of the sections yet. So it's gonna be an even longer chapter by the time it's finished. But on the CES demand structure side, I really think the discussion of non-homothetic preferences is really, really important. For those of you who've studied international economics, you'll know that most of our trade models assume homothetic preferences and ignore income effects, which given the importance of Engel's law in agricultural economics is, is quite an absurd assumption if you think about it, when we're studying international trade. And I really like that section, but I would really encourage the authors to make a much stronger connection between particularly the paper by Fila, which was published in Econometrica in 2011, where they actually did a very nice job. And I think Christoph, to your credit, you do mention that paper, but you didn't say an awful lot about it in the rest of the chapter, is that they basically adapt the Eaton and Corton model to allow for uh, north-south demand for dif differing qualities of goods, which are dependent on there being an income effect. And Christoph, I don't know if you know, there's a really, there was a really nice paper by Lewis et al. in 2019, I think it was given at the winter meetings, that does a very nice job of analyzing income effects and structural change in, I think, a version of the feeler model that's a little bit more adaptable and a little bit more flexible. So I, I'd really encourage you to develop that connection between the demand structure side section and the, the Ricardian section. And I think maybe I'm being a bit unfair here, but you very briefly mentioned asymmetric information and goods, credence goods. And it's kind of a throwaway comment in your section about demand. I think you could do a, a better job of tying that to your later discussion of standards, because standards are often uh, a resolution to a market failure problem about uh, credence goods or experience goods. And I would point you to a very nice paper by uh, Luisa Menapache and Gian Giancarlo Moschini in the European Review of Agicon, where they do a really nice job of tying geographic indicators uh, into a model of experience goods that you might wanna draw on uh, some of that literature. The Neo-Ricardian approach, this is a very uh, long section, what do I think is missing? This is a little bit um, centered on my own interests as an agricultural trade economist. I think you hint at this, but you could say more about how this uh, theta, <coughs> excuse me, this theta parameter that's a parameter in the fresh A distribution uh, can be interpreted as a trade elasticity that you can retrieve from a simple gravity equation estimation. I mean, you make the observation that the Ricardian model relies on you being able to measure productivity. Well, you don't actually have to be able to measure productivity. You can make inferences about productivity and hence uh, get um, an estimate of this trade elasticity out of a reduced form gravity equation. And Mike Wall has a really nice paper in American Economic Review on this. You did mention Reimer and Lee. Simonovska and War had a very nice piece in the Journal of International Economics on doing this. And actually Jeff Reimer had another paper where he talked about uh, water issues uh, and embedded that in a, in a neo-Ricardian model as well. Secondly, this trade elasticity um, is very much treated as a sufficient statistic in calculating the welfare effects of trade and trade liberalization. And that I, I, you probably know about this paper in the American Economic Review by Arkelakis et al. that, make, that does, does a very good job of showing the importance and the relevance of calculating that trade elasticity. And then finally, and I think you, you mentioned that again this morning, that these trade elasticity estimates are actually very sensitive to the CES assumption that's made on the demand side. And that's where the paper by Kari Him and um, Sean Arita and and Gopinath um, it is, is a very important contribution in the American Journal of Agricultural Economics, 
which predates Kari's paper from the Journal of International Economics in 2020. And also, Christoph, there was the paper that Kari and I presented at the same NBER conference that I believe uh, you were at a couple of years ago, um, where we did show a bit more carefully how sensitive uh, these trade elasticity estimates are to what you assume um, about the effects of trade liberalization. On the heterogeneous firms part of the chapter, Mellitz is great, but it's too restrictive in many ways. If we, you, you have a nice citation to Steve McCorriston's paper from 2003 in the European Review of Agnicon about the types of market structure that we do observe in the food processing sector. And this is where we can make some connections back uh, to the discussion that we had earlier about um, John and Jim's textbook, sorry, chapter on, on, the, on, on concentration. Um, the reason that Krugman, I think, if you go back to his, I think his Handbook of International Economics chapter uh, on when he, you know, introduced his monopolistic competition model, why did they pick monopolistic competition? Well, it was the easiest way to relax the assumptions of the, of the competitive general equilibrium model. You could, you could have um, economies of scale, but you don't have um, an equilibrium problem in a monopolistic competition model because you have free entry up to the point where uh, prices equal average costs. So you don't have to worry about solving out a, a, a model in general equilibrium with economies of scale internal to firms. And secondly, monopolistic competition allows you to have product differentiation. So you could relax all the assumptions of our traditional competitive general equilibrium trade model, but grab a lot of, this, a lot of the stylized facts about trade in, in industries with imperfect competition, economies of scale and differentiated products. The problem is with the Mellitz model is that it ignores other forms of market behavior. And I think, you know, I'm not asking you to I'm sorry, I'm suggesting maybe you, you push it a little bit harder on where the literature could go on discussing that. And I noticed you didn't mention uh, the paper by um, Bernard et al. in 2003, which takes a Ricardian setting and introduces Bertrand oligopoly with firms, with heterogeneous firms, which might be another way of thinking about incorporating imperfect competition into heterogeneous firms models. I, I don't think that paper's been extended that I'm aware of, Christoph, but it might be worth taking a look at, at where who, who's, who's cited or extended that paper. I think the, the product quality discussion that you have is, I really appreciated that because I happen to be interested in it, but I would like to see a much closer tie back to, if you go back to Mellitz's paper, he hints at productivity as not just being a cost shifter, but it's being a demand shifting quality variable. And I don't think the literature to have, even the international economics literature itself has done a particularly good job of going back to Mellitz's argument and thinking through how his model generates a role for productivity as being as much about the process side as being about the product side. I think uh, Richard Baldwin and Paragon did a fairly good job of that in a sort of reduced form way but I would recommend you look at a paper by Johnson in the Journal of International Economics um, that Eum, Eum, the paper you cited, I'm one of the co-authors on that paper. We tried to figure out exactly how Johnson was making that connection between productivity and quality. But I do like, I do like your discussion in the chapter there very much. I think you, you kind of wave your hands a little bit on how the gravity model is actually derived in a heterogeneous firm setting. And I guess the, uh, Helpman, Mellitz, Rubinstein paper does the best job of showing how to derive a standard gravity equation there that looks a lot like any other gravity equation, especially the second part of their Helpman, of their Heckman selection model that they estimate. And that, I think you probably need more indication in other places in, the, in that section and other parts of the chapter about the generality of gravity. And here you might take a, another look at Anderson's review paper, and also Costano and Rodriguez Claire that you cited. Now, question to you is, I'm not sure I agree with you that we have extensive, 
access to extensive firm level data sets. We have some firm level data sets, but they're often very country specific, very industry specific. I don't think we have um, ex as extensive firm level data sets as we would probably need to do this kind of research on the heterogeneous firms model. And having used this model, I think there's some pretty significant statistical problems with the Helpman et al methodology, which allows you to use aggregate data. So I wonder what you think about the likelihood of widespread application of the heterogeneous firm model will actually be in agricultural and food trade analysis going forward. So finally on trade costs, um, I really liked you hinting at bringing in this vertical market structure literature in the food marketing chain. We've already had that discussion this morning uh, with respect to John and Jim's chapter. And uh, without banging my drum too much, uh, I did do a survey paper on this that highlighted some of the things we were talking about earlier. The point isn't to cite my work. The point here is I think you can make a much stronger connection between thinking about vertical markets in the domestic market setting and how that about international trade. Because I think the Mellets model um, has been and could be further extended to thinking about the role of multinationals. I think you have a little line in your chapter, you have multinationals question mark, and you don't say anything more about multinationals, but more importantly, foreign direct investment and outsourcing. And here I'm, I would suggest you take a look, go back and look at Antras's paper in 2003 in the QJE, because that very tightly ties trade relationships back to, Alan mentioned the Kosian model this morning um, about vertical integration. That paper also ties trade models explicitly to the Oliver Hart, John Moore theory of the firm, which I think is quite important. I don't think Antras has really taken that stuff anywhere, at least not uh, empirically. But also there's a great paper by Antras and Heltman on thinking about outsourcing. And the reason I raised that paper is it explicitly embeds a Mellets type framework in thinking about whether headquarters services and offshore operations, which I think might be worth uh, agricultural economists taking a look at in terms of thinking about value chains. Now with vertical coordination, and again, Alan mentioned this briefly this morning in his discussion about the other chapter, when you introduce vertical coordination into trade, you have this potential for holdup. This is an old idea in the vertical markets literature. And there's a great paper by, again, by Paul Antras and Bob Steger in the AER about what happens when you have firms uh, who are in, operating in these extended value chains where they're writing contracts with upstream and downstream firms. What's the potential for holdup? And the reason this might matter is if you think about vertical coordination, you're often having traded goods prices being replaced by ex, -po ex post bargaining over contractual terms. And the nice thing about the Antras and Steger paper, and I know your chapter is not about trade policy, but I think you draw out some issues of trade policy elsewhere in the chapter. And here's another possibility is that Antras and Steger asked the question, if you have this vertical issue in value chains and you have the potential for hold up, you can throw out the whole theory of the GATT WTO that was generated by the seminal work of Bagwell and Steger. That literature is entirely dependent on you being able to internalize terms of trade effects. That's the whole way that model works. Bob Steger's now saying, hey, if a lot of goods are traded within value chains and we don't see international traded prices, what the heck does that mean for trade policy? So I think you might want to bring that out. Finally, because my time is up, the role of trade in mediating shocks. You do a really good job of tying the climate change literature back to the neo ricardian model, particularly the Costano et al paper but I found it a lot harder to see the other connections in that, in that section. And it, I don't wish to be critical, but it felt like a bunch of ideas were tagged on at the end of the chapter. And I think it needs a bit more work tying that section in to the rest of the chapter. 
So Christopher and, and, and Carl, I, I really appreciate the chapter. I'm really looking forward to reading the final version. As you can tell, I found it very interesting and I have a lot of things to say about it. Any other, th and other things I, I could have said about the chapter as well. One quick thing before I stop, Christoph does have a, I think you could probably make more of the section where you talk about your own work on developing countries having to use trade policy to deal with agricultural price volatility issues and your section on trade as a mediator of shocks. I still remember you getting up an, at a trade consortium meeting many years ago where I, I thought you were going to be strung up from the nearest lamppost from my trade policy friends like like Tim Anderson, where you, you were very brave and got up and said, we developing countries need to use trade policy because they don't have access to food social safety so to social safety nets, like many other countries do in dealing with with trade policy issues. And I, I think this has become very critical again as we look at uh, some of the policy responses to the pandemic. One of the things the WTO was, was highlighting was that countries, not just to do with PPE and medical equipment, but many countries introduce export controls on things like wheat and rice as an immediate reaction to the pandemic. And that reminded me again of um, that discussion that you had, Christoph, in a couple of papers you wrote back uh, a few years ago, and I did like that section very much. So anyways, thanks very much. Thanks for inviting me to make some comments and I'm going to stop sharing there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, so now the time we have allocated for questions from the audience. Um, if we don't see those right away. I will give time to the uh, to Christoph to respond to Ian's extensive comments. So, Christoph, if there's anything you wanted to respond to. Yeah, okay. Uh, so thank you very much, Jan, for all your comments. Basically, you are filling all the dots in the chapter. We have put the outline and you are providing us with all the ideas to uh, finish it. So <laughs> that's great. I think I will watch again uh, your, your, your discussion to, uh, while, while drafting it. So what I think you are pushing us to do is to do more the to do, to do better the connection between the mainstream trade theory and uh, what is relevant for agriculture and food trade. And I think it's a great idea, that's, that's a plan, uh, but since uh, the chapter is not fully draft, we are not there yet. But uh, I think that you are completely right uh, on the non-homothetic uh, demand system. It's great to start by showing what are the basic elements that we have in all models. And then to say that, but maybe for agricultural products, that's not always what we need. And often we will need some deviations and it's interesting to show what are the important deviations. And that's the same for the gravity model and for other aspects. So start from what is common and then uh, draw the line to show uh, for ag economists what may be the most relevant. So that's what I'm taking uh, from your comment. I don't... Yeah, I don't think there is much more. Maybe, Carl, do you want to say something more? Or oh, not so. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you both. Um, so that was wonderful. I, I doesn't look like we have any uh, hands raised at the moment. And it actually is about time to break. So I'll give you maybe five more seconds to raise your hand. <laughs> and good enough. We will, uh, we will reconvene at the top of the hour in about four minutes from now. Thank you both. Christoph. Yes.
I, I didn't see, or at least I didn't recognize many trade economists on the panel today, so. No, yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, what, something I didn't say, but I, I'm really struck by is how much trade mainstream trade economists have started to think about agriculture compared to if you went back 25, 30 years, ag trade, yeah. econ ag trade economists studied ag trade and trade economists hardly ever talked about agricultural trade. So I think yeah, we have yeah. Dave, Dave Donaldson to thank for that. Yeah, you definitely, if you look at the neo Ricardian chapters, that's a lot of top five papers written by general econ paper, people. So that's, uh, I don't think we add this in many uh, other end book chapters. So that's uh, a peculiarity of the field in the, in the last years. And that's really great. Yeah, and I think that I, I'm not sure that those guys do a particularly job of estimate, good job of estimating gravity, trade gravity equations. I don't, that, that's my gut feeling. Mm. <laughs> Anyway, when you've finished the chapter, we'd really like to see another draft, you know, the final draft, if, if, if you're willing to. Oh, it. sure, sure, sure. We, uh, we welcome any comments. We will, we will try to finish it for this summer to, to have feedback. So we will make sure to send it to you. That's funny you say that, Ian. You know, I, I see the same thing all the time about <laughs> supply chain. You know, now that general people in supply chain are so worried about food, it's kind of elevated the prominence of food supply chains. Mm, yeah, indeed. Christopher? Christopher, it was a really good yep. presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna just do uh, one suggestion that um, maybe uh, it might be a good idea to add the QJ 2019 paper that the title is diversification through trade. So that's a kind of like a mediation effect how trade can mediate uh, the income volatility as well. Okay. Yeah, and at sure. the same time, building on the Dr. Sheldon's idea, we might, I mean, last like 20 decades, the developing countries opened their market very like dramatically, right? So you might want to add a certain point to the driver of um, why the developing countries are actively joining the um, trade at the same time by including some global value chain stuff. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back. Um, sorry, just trying to do a little bit of coordination in the background here. Uh, so, I've really enjoyed things thus far and uh, next hour should be very good as well. I don't know how, I guess this group is going to be uh, circulating the presentation between them. Um, so we uh, welcome uh, Tim Richards from Arizona State, uh, Steve Hamilton from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and Brian Rowe in all caps from The Ohio State University. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll give you 25 minutes and then we should hear from Harry DeGorder. I understand he is struggling to get in at the moment. So hopefully we will hear from him. If not, you might go a little bit over. I'll turn the time over to you. Excellent. Thank you. Let me. Everybody see that okay? All right, we're going to tag team this thing. I don't know if it's for reasons that we don't want to shoulder the blame individually or we're just plain lazy. 
Um, either way, I'm going to run through all the slides. I'm going to show mine for, for seven minutes, and then I'm going to run through family vacation slides while Steve and Brian talk. All right, so basically our, our topic is, is obviously food waste. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the setting, some of the basic concepts we introduced early on in our review. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about food waste or farm level food waste. And then Steve's going to move down the supply chain, talk about retail, food service, distribution, things in the middle. And then Brian's going to talk about household. All right, so let's just set the stage with, with some raw data. Um, we have battered around the, the, the same numbers, I think, for years based on ERS estimates from years ago. Uh, and this is, this is really interesting. Brian um, brought this to our attention yesterday from Refed, brand new estimates. They kind of turned that whole thing on, on its head. Um, this shows um, that there's almost equal amounts, even more supply chain waste than there is actually in the household. So it's kind of changing the way that we think about food waste. And from my perspective, brings more prominence to more supply chain sort of, sort of issues and waste and, and loss that we're going to be talking about. But this is, for, this is from Refed. And that implies a total, just to, this is all shares, but just to give you a sense of the total amount, this is 35% of all the food we produce, refed estimates that we, that we waste. So it's some 80 million tons every year, which is obviously a substantial amount. So what are we going to do? The structure of our chapter um, is organized, as I mentioned, according to supply chain. We set off with some basic definitions, con conceptual issues with respect to food loss and waste. Um, then we talk about loss at the farm level. Um, basic conceptual issues and then review a fairly sparse literature relative to further down supply chain at the retail and household levels, uh, but lay out more the, the basic principles involved there. Then Steve's going to talk about the retail level waste, more strategic uh, IO sorts of issues associated there. And then uh, Brian's going to talk about the consumer level, um, which I consider more behavioral kind of uh, aspects of food waste and, and arguably the more intractable parts of, of, of limiting food waste. Um, okay, so just some definitional issues. Uh, we struggled over this, debated this for, for, for some time. You know, it's important to get, uh, to get uh, some definitions clear because food loss and waste have been used uh, somewhat interchangeably over the years. But we want to be clear that there are different types of, of ways that food doesn't enter into the supply chain or is lost for, for some way or other. And we wanna draw a fairly bright line between really what we mean about waste and what is more sort of an economic sense of loss. So according to our definition, and I know we're gonna get some pushback on this, uh, food waste is basically the physical measure. It's food that is still available to be consumed or, or can be consumed, but ends up in the, in the landfill. So sort of what the example that I have in mind here is that if we let carrots sit in our fridge until they get fuzzy, there's nothing we can do about it other than throw it into the landfill. So that's waste. It's food that was consumable and it's gone. Food loss, on the other hand, is food that's produced for one market and ends up in a different market. So, so for example, um, you know, um, Mark Belmare's 2017 AJE article talks about how, you know, if you, if you kick food underneath the table to the dog, it's not actually waste because something is eating it. And I'm like, hmm, no, no, anything fed to a dog is actually, is, is actually food that's not used in its highest and best use. Those inputs are not used the way they were intended to be used if you're feeding it to the dog. So that's the sort of economic sense in which we define loss. It, is, it goes into a secondary market. It's diverted into a market for animal feed, say, or um, you know, marketing orders diverted into, into a, a trade market that's dumped on a, on a foreign market or something. Um, so that's the, the sense in which we talk about or differentiate between loss and waste. Um, another important point, point that we want to make early on is that, um, that food waste is not necessarily a market failure. Most of the time, particularly when we talk about farm level waste that I'm, that I'm going to discuss here in a minute, um, it is due more to just the biological nature of food production that, for example, if we have random quality and we have a firm decision to supply it to the market or a household decision to consume it, um, those two things come together and some of it is just lost or wasted just as a natural consequence of optimizing agents doing what they will, um, given that food is not a manufactured product that's going to be perfect every time. So there is some sense in which the market doesn't fail and still generates waste. Inefficiency is an example um, that we'll, we'll talk about throughout the chapter as well. All right, so what are we talking about with, with farm level food waste? 
Um, it's difficult, difficult to generalize across sectors, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, I'd like to think about fruit and vegetable markets. It's kind of where I do a lot of research and there's hundreds of different commodities, right? So it's hard to make the same point that generalizes across, uh, across all those commodities. The point here is that, that food loss is often, often the result of an optimization process. The marginal benefit of reducing loss is has to be equal to the marginal cost of doing so if we're optimizing. So that what's that's what drives the whole notion that it's driven by a lot of this loss is driven by the the random nature of biological production. Um, we participated. Brian and I participated in, in a, a study by ERS. You know, Miner, uh, Travis Miner's the primary author that that cites all of these sorts of drivers of loss. Uh, the principal drivers that we identify in that in that book. Our price volatility, if it's a marginal benefit, marginal cost process, if prices fall, obviously more crop is going to be left in the field. Labor costs and availability, especially for labor intensive crops like hand harvested strawberries or fresh market tomatoes or things like that. Um, if we can't access, access labor, lots of times that field is just walked by, they call it, and that crop is le left in the field. Infrastructure investment, uh, if the cooling shed is um, you know, represents too much capital for a small farmer, invests in something that's not optimal for what he or she has to cool, um, that can spoil losses just based on lack of infrastructure, things like that. Grading standards, um, you, know, you know, supermarkets have lots of times stricter standards than, than even USDA standards. So if something is rejected by a retailer, lots of times that food is lost, diverted to a secondary market, or it's wasted, goes into the landfill. Contract specifications, most fruits, fruits and vegetables now are produced under contract. So if that, if that production that comes out of the field doesn't meet those contract specifications, it's often diverted, loss or thrown away waste, okay? Uh, potential solutions, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is really intractable if it, if it comes from inefficiency from, the, from a farm level perspective. But I like to think about in terms of the EPA hierarchy, where we think about um, the, the, the solutions that we'd like to focus on at the start. And then as we go down this pyramid, we get to sort of the less and less optimal solutions, but they still are alternative uses for food. So you think about source reduction, we're talking about technology solutions here, greater efficiency. Um, look at all those drivers of farm level loss. How can we mitigate those? If price volatility is a problem, um, will some, you know, uh, futures market for fruits and vegetables help mitigate the amount of food loss from that source and think about you know row crops and things like that anything that mitigates price volatility might be helpful you think about the redistribution angle uh, diverting to uh, secondary markets the shameless self site steve and i have an example in food policy a couple of years ago where we talk about uh, secondary market at the time it was called imperfect produce it's an internet-based um, sharing economy company that takes surplus product and boxes it up and delivers it to household, households in uh, was just the Bay Area. Now it's coast to coast and it's called Imperfect Foods. They're just killing it. So at any rate, um, other sources of redistribution, donation to food banks, government purchase programs during COVID. We had the Farmers to Families Food Box program, bought a lot of this sort of food that would have otherwise been surplus. Upcycling is an important thing, you know, finding different uses, you know, the company Toast that actually makes beer out of bread, which is a fantastic use of surplus food. Uh, so all sorts of, of, of um, solutions to mitigate waste, they don't do away with it. So um, that's sort of the EPA hierarchy. All right, so now, uh, Steve, can you take it away and talk about retail level? Absolutely. Uh, I think probably the place to start when you think about it is the most interesting thing I think is that not only is the greatest amount of food waste in the retail sector as opposed to the farm sector and, and even perhaps the household, but it's also the greatest source of market power. And so you kind of see this perfect competition, you get less food waste, uh, but when you move into the wholesale and retail distribution chains, you both see concentration, market power issues, and you also see uh, an uptick in food waste. Um, so again, this is difficult to generalize. Most of what we're gonna talk about here is gonna be uh, fresh fruit and vegetables, uh, bakery, things like that, that would happen, uh, you know, the perishables, not the, uh, not the remaining part of the retail. Uh, so there's a link here at the kind of leaving the farm gate between wholesaler, retailer and farmer. And there's a contracting issue there that it's hard to separate out and, and say this is farm loss as opposed to uh, driven by retailer or wholesaler decisions. And that's the contracting decision between growers and, uh, and buyers. Uh, you have minimum delivery clauses, which can create incentives to overproduce. So it may create farm level loss, but it's happening really from a contract that's originating at the at a downstream level. 
Uh, you also have minimum quality specifications that also can be important. Um, there's an issue here a little bit about whether it's food loss or food waste. And so minimum quality standards, uh, for example, food that doesn't make grade, it's caught early enough that it can potentially be repurposed, sent to animal feed markets or somewhere else. And we wouldn't consider that as big a problem as if it goes to a landfill. And so there's an issue here between food loss and uh, food waste. Uh, to the next slide, I really want to talk more, uh, focus more about the retail decision because that's the connection with the customers I think is the most interesting side. Um, so one thing that kind of overrides in the retail literature, and that's this idea that uh, demand's hard to predict, and the last thing a retailer wants to do is have a stock out. So for example, you could think about uh, avocados before Super Bowl weekend. Uh, the retailer has a strong incentive and never run out of avocados in the avocado bin because shoppers could actually leave and take their whole basket somewhere else. And so it's a very multi-product situation where food is very cheap. Uh, fresh produce is one of the things that buyers come in and consumers will buy as part of their basket. But the retailer perceives this as an entire shopping basket. And so food is cheap enough that it's better to just throw it away and make sure you never have a stock out as opposed to having a consumer walk out the store and, and go to a rival. Um, there's other issues here that I think are important. The bakery, the, the rotisserie chicken, the sections of a retail uh, it, where retailers might sell more food if they can make shoppers more hungry and they will certainly be willing to make a trade-off there to, to throw away food in order to generate more sales. And so I think the way we generally have been thinking about the retail sector is this almost a sequential decision where you're gonna over-purchase and make sure you don't have a stock out and then you're going to revenue maximize at the at the supermarket level with what you've got. And so you can have kind of classic stories where, where your profits can be much higher, your revenue can be higher by just throwing away food and supporting higher prices than by dropping prices and clearing the food out. And so I think it's interesting to think about both the origin of market power in the food system as being concentrated at the at the retail stage and, and uh, processors to some extent too. But in terms of food waste, uh, the retailers have both market power and they also have uh, decisions like this, like revenue maximizing as opposed to uh, reducing prices, discounting them and clearing it out. Um, so probably next, next slide, if you would. Um, so there's a couple angles here that we've been looking at um, and that the literature has examined. And one would be uh, retail quality standards. And again, we have a role here for to catch food that consumers don't want to buy. And so an alternative to a grading standard would be to let the food persist through the food system and all the way into the retailer shelf and perhaps even the consumer's pantry. And some of the stuff won't be eaten if it's ugly or misshapen or uh, it's not appealing to a consumer. Some of it may not be eaten anyways. And so it's good to catch it early at the, at the grading level where it can be sent somewhere else uh, early enough in the food system. And so there's a, a link there. Um, there's also a link between a potential mismatch between the distribution of food that's grown, the quality distribution of food, and also the choice of, of quality a retailer wants to sustain. And so if a retailer wants to, for example, uh, specialize in very high quality produce, they might send a high grading standard. On the other hand, they might set a very low grading standard depending on what the consumer willingness to pay distribution is. And so there's a mismatch in general between consumers distribution uh, willingness to pay for quality or valuations for uh, high quality fresh foods. You could think in terms of the number of spots on a banana might be a good example. And consumers may have quite different preferences from the availability of food quality in the food system. And so we can just have mismatch happening where a retailer is choosing a quality standard, but also uh, once that quality is chosen, uh, selecting a profit maximizing price. Um, the second role here would be once retailers have food and they have a system that's going to result in, in uh, excess stocks because they, they are uh, afraid of having a stock out or want to avoid issues like that. Uh, we have an issue here of what to do with it. And there's also a role of food banks that is potentially very interesting. And so retailers traditionally are a huge source of food for food banks and retailers face an interesting problem. Uh, and this relates back to some of the IO quality literature of Anderson and Ginsburg on durable products. 
and others, where there's three things you can do with food if you have some extra food. One, you, you could discard it, uh, which would support higher prices for the retailer. Uh, two, you could discount it. You could just market clearing. You could uh, lower prices until you clear out the food. Or three, you could donate it and giving it to a food bank would be the other place you could do it, uh, get rid of the food. So from a retailer's perspective, these three strategies are all things that, that can be pursued. And uh, one of the things that's interesting is, is the tension between donating to a food bank. You can reduce tipping fees, which are waste disposal fees paid at the back end of a retailer. Uh, so certainly you could reduce your waste handling uh, or your tipping fees. But on the other hand, if you donate it to a food bank, you introduce competition in the system. Now you've got another uh, competing source where consumers can go to get food. And so to the next slide, I think we talk a little bit about uh, this role of food banks. And so I think this is potentially very interesting because it's a huge way that the economy dispenses with unsold food is we end up giving it to a food bank and consumers then can go and pick up items at a, at a food bank. One of the misconceptions I think of, of a lot of people is that these are just different consumers. We have food bank shoppers and we have supermarket shoppers. And there's a bit of stigma attached with going to a food bank. And so People don't like to, to let their neighbors know they're going to a food bank, for example. Uh, but often what you see on the margin is consumers doing both. People that do shop at food banks also buy at supermarkets. And so supermarkets face this trade-off between siphoning off some of their customers by giving food to a food bank, because some of their customers, at least on the margin, might, might take the food bank food and then not make a retail purchase. And so there's, there's a role here for, uh, for policy to try to encourage a better continuity between the retail and the food bank sector. And I think in general, there's a lot of role in the intermediary stages of the food system uh, for uh, better supply chain management. So what happens when food doesn't make, uh, doesn't make grade? Uh, having supply chain set up for that is, is a good thing. And if the retail sector, this is an important one, is the, the, uh, the back end of a retail can go to a food bank. And so a couple of aspects here that are interesting is one that a retailer can choose the time in which they donate food. And so a food uh, you could think discreetly depreciates, for example, in period one, it's fresh. In period two, it's, it, it's, it's somewhat wilted or not quite as appealing to a consumer. And in period three, it's, it's, uh, it's waste. And so there's, there's an issue here in terms of when does a retailer donate to, the, to, to a food bank? Uh, for example, a retailer might know immediately they have an overorder uh, or they don't need as much as uh, food has arrived, but they may not donate it immediately to a food bank because donating high quality food to a food bank uh, increases competition for high quality food. And so retailers have incentive to, to delay the donations. Um, and they also have this trade-off that, that you know, it, the longer you hold things on a shelf, it degrades the quality of food on your shelf. Uh, but the sooner you donate it to a food bank, the more competition there is in terms of high quality food being available at the retailer, at the food bank. And I think you, you do see some interesting uh, trends in the industry in terms of what is actually sold at food bank. And you tend to see things like a lot of bananas that even the food bank can't get rid of uh, because they're not appealing to consumers. And so retailers, it's actually a choice of when to donate as well as how much. Um, the Donating, uh, not donating to a retailer can limit the competition again, which I think is interesting. And so if we go to the next slide, I want to talk um, some of the issues here. I'm also going to talk, uh, we can talk about policy. Um, first of all, eliminating retail food waste is probably not possible. Uh, food is cheap enough that, that, and the costs are high enough for a retailer have, having a stock out that there will be a tendency to overorder, in fact. Uh, there's some, you know, ish ideas of, you know, food pyramids and so forth that are appealing and generate higher sales, but may come with it crushing produce at the bottom of the pyramid and not making sales and intentionally discarding things just to facilitate a higher demand for food. Much like cooking a rotisserie chicken or having a bakery might cause shoppers to be hungry and just buy more food. And a retailer would be would be plenty willing to to have that go wasted if it if uh, revenues can be increased and profits can be increased in retail. Uh, so it's probably not impossible to entirely eliminate because there's uncertainty uh, and a need to hold buffer stocks. Uh, the there are some policies, and I think there's some interesting angles here to, to discuss in terms of of uh, 
discouraging disposal. We have tipping fees, which are, which are paid for waste collection. Certainly you could think of a role for taxes to make it more costly to, to dispose food into a landfill from the back of a retailer. And that might encourage food to either be donated or to be discarded. Um, we could also encourage donation through tax incentives for donated food, which already exist. Uh, it's another policy instrument. And then another one would be um, things to reduce buffer stocks. So higher farm prices, having food be more costly at the wholesale level coming into a retailer might also cause them to uh, put more attention on inventory management systems to better predict um, food demand. So this is another issue. It's a little bit like uh, you could think of deposit refund systems and, and policies like that, where you, where you uh, raise farm prices by taxing them at the farm gate, make them more expensive for retailers, and then subsidize them back on the donated portions or the non-discarded portions of food. Uh, so that's the other link here. Um, I'll probably turn it over to Brian at this point to make sure we have time to cover the consumer section of the household food waste. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> go ahead and skip to the next slide. Just noting about food banks, I mean, food banks go back to like the 1300s. There's stories of uh, uh, Peter of Aragon <laughs> telling his, uh, um, his subjects to donate foods of diminished quality to the, uh, uh, to the poor residents of, of his uh, kingdom of those eras. So it's very interesting that we've got traces of this going back uh, centuries. But brings us to consumers. And um, if we think about food supply chains, um, been a lot of, uh, you know, post COVID, a lot of interest in a lot of the center of the supply chain issues, obviously hunger as well. But we have to remember that, you know, food systems are for food, which is about consumers, which are the reason for the system's existence. So it's easy to get caught up in other parts of it, but we always have to return back to uh, the centrality of the consumer in the food supply chain. I, I like to think about supply chains um, <clears throat> with respect to uh, Premier's uh, weakest link O-ring technology. If you think about a technology where items have to be handed from one link to the next without an error or without um, a problem, um, you can think about a supply chain and that type of production setup. And as he shows in that paper, if you were a profit maximizing firm, you would put your highest quality labor at that last link in the chain because you've got so much embedded uh, value at that point in the chain. And when you contrast that in the context of food waste and the food supply chain, we've got the last link of the chain occupied by perhaps the most schizophrenic and uh, least systematically trained and um, uh, individuals, you know, consumers. We're kind of a mess in terms of that. So it kind of shows the, the very fundamental issue here that by the time the product gets to consumers, uh, there's the most to lose because of the embedded resources, but people at the consumers have probably the least salience in terms of getting feedback about their decisions and how it feeds back to waste. There's not a very solid accounting towards how that affects their household budget. Um, they're also the target of you know, profit maximizing upstream actors who, as uh, Steve pointed out, want them to buy more, not necessarily consume more. And because of the diffusion, uh, both size-wise and geographically, are least likely to have access to the scale or management capability to do anything much more than get it into the wastebasket, which goes to landfill, which creates the greatest amount of externalities, um, a large portion of the externalities that drive our interest in the food waste topic to begin with. So not surprisingly, in most developed economies, consumers are the largest source of waste. And those refed numbers that Tim talked about at the beginning, oftentimes the retail and the food service sectors, which were in that middle hunk there, are oftentimes attributed to uh, consumers as a lot of the actions that those uh, middle portions of the uh, retail and food service take are directed towards consumers and kind of meeting their needs. So if you can move on to the next slide, that'd be great. So in this part of the chapter, uh, we talk about um, kind of the unifying theoretical framework that's used among consumers, our, our old friend, the household production function <clears throat> that we uh, know quite well. We've seen many applications of this um, by individuals looking at any number of issues of taking those market goods, transforming them into the meals, the household service, 
subject to our uh, uh, constraints of income, time, and technology. And we've seen any number of authors here look at different tensions within that model space. Um, Brenna and some of her, uh, Ellison and some of her colleagues looking at non-wage income and COVID implications in that type of a model. A uh, group at Purdue, Qatari and others looking at uh, what could happen if you could tax like they do in South Korea and a few other places, uh, actual levels of waste. Uh, Stephen Tim, uh, Deng Yi, my um, uh, former student and co-author, looking at interactions between what happens when you have multiple products with different types of um, levels of waste, fresh versus processed, and interactions therein, as well as others looking at um, tensions between uh, per, uh, make and buy, basically, making your meals at home versus food service, and then different streams uh, in terms of how you deal with that that's not consumed through either composting or landfill. But the household production function model is um, kind of problematic, right? It's There's a lot of curvature going on in this system. You've got it coming from utility. You've got it coming from the technology to reduce waste in this instance, some type of cost or just utility function. Um, when you go to a representative consumer model, you've got curvature from endogenous prices. And uh, there's just a lot going on here and it's tough to pin down a lot of really solid results. Um, if you think about aggregation issues, are we talking about all food versus food categories versus individual items? Obviously those demand elasticities are gonna be vastly different. And so uh, given that those demand elasticities oftentimes drive some of those very interesting comparative static results, one gets left with a kind of a dissatisfied feeling. Yes, you can get a few broad level implications out of these models, but you don't pin down a lot of uh, really interesting things without some very strong assumptions. And obviously pinning down some of those parameter estimates for household production is always a bit tricky just because it requires exceptional data and a lot of strong structural assumptions along the way. So um, it's a, f a framework that's been drawn upon for some broad implications, um, but probably is not gonna take us a, a long way uh, towards getting very detailed policy implications. Next slide. <clears throat> the other issue at the consumer level is because of things we talked about before, diffusion of individuals, lack of salience and um, uh, tracking, uh, measurement ends up being a big issue. So there's a fair chunk of this literature, usually not in economics, but elsewhere, just focused on how do we actually get a decent measurement of this stuff. We got surveys, which are gonna be biased and noisy, but low cost and allow you to hit a lot of people. You've got more invasive diaries, probably a little less bias, uh, more granularity, but really high cost, a high response, respondent burden, and therefore you're gonna get a lot more self-selection in those uh, groups. You've got the dumpster divers in terms of waste analysis. And so there you get some, um, some nice data out of that, but there's some obvious logistical challenges to getting that. Um, you're gonna miss several streams of uh, food that's not eaten in terms of things that go down the sink, that go to maybe compost facilities in a secondary stream, uh, going to Mark's dog and other things like that, feeding the dog. Um, and then you lose reasons uh, that people are wasting items. So you lose some granularity there in terms of being able to give some prescriptions to um, those who might want to implement campaigns. And then you've got um, what I call mass balance uh, approaches where you can take purchase data, uh, take typical uh, calorie consumption needs, and then back out from that econometrically some type of estimate of waste that might come from that. So here um, you get as much granularity as your purchase data might permit. So you get a lot of granularity out of your Nielsen types of data, your food apps and other things like that. Um, um, also from uh, what we eat in America and, so, and Hanes and things like that. But you're making uh, a lot of assumptions about the calorie needs. And particularly if you're interested in uh, way, ways that waste interact with nutrition issues, uh, it's gonna be tough to pin down um, empirically, uh, which is driving that. It might be a, a nutritional issue, it might be a waste issue, it might be some type of interaction. And then you lose any information that might be of interest to um, kind of the waste community in terms of where those waste channels are heading. Next slide. <clears throat> But 
but there's been a, a, a growing stream of empirical consumer studies um, kind of broken out again, a little bit by where the consumer is interfacing. Obviously consumers have to acquire the food, prepare it, <clears throat> eat it. And then there's also um, a waste stream that arises. And so you have a, a growing literature here. We reviewed a lot of this as part of the, um, I was on a panel for the National Academies looking at consumer um, uh, policies and approaches to reduce wasted food. Um, and they kind of organized around retail behaviors, uh, kind of the ugly food, the misshapen food that uh, Tim and Steve have, have explored, but flipping that over and using a lot of choice experiments, a little bit of field data to see uh, what attributes of ugly food might entice consumers to get into that segment to perhaps develop the secondary market or whether that market really has to be secondary, whether uh, some of those attributes can uh, elevate it to be uh, a horizontally differentiated sector where ugly food might be appreciated and priced at par with regular food because it's reducing waste, et cetera. Um, there's a growing list of empirical studies on price promotions, dynamic pricing, discounting these items to move them uh, at least one further link in the supply chain before to the consumers before they might be wasted. Um, date labels have uh, seen some action in the empirical literature as well because of its policy relevance. So uh, the phraseology that goes on date labels and the confusion that might cause, uh, whether the actual date chosen is driving a lot of issues. Um, we have this paper where we take the label, the dates off of milk, for example, and show that people uh, tend to not throw away as much milk uh, or intend to throw away less milk if you actually take the date off the milk and you make them actually sniff it. Uh, package sizing, uh, Brad Rickard and others have looked at some issues there. And then a very small group of people looking at whether moving things to the online channel, which post COVID obviously is quite relevant, may uh, increase or decrease the tendency towards waste. And there's competing issues there, a little less impulse buying is one sensibility here. So perhaps less waste from impulse purchases, um, but also a little bit more detachment from the food. You know, if you pick out that perfect apple in the, uh, in the produce uh, aisle yourself, you're more likely to consume it. So goes the theory of uh, psychological attachment than if you just have somebody pick it out for you and it shows up on your porch. The other area obviously is food service behaviors and policies where we're going and dining out less than we did before, but a bevy of research on plates and trays, sh changing their shape, size, removing trays, uh, even changing the materiality of the plate uh, can have some effects uh, through nudging on the amount of waste created. Uh, straight up campaigns where you have consumer facing messaging urging people to reduce their waste, um, and some tricky interactions there where if you tell them that you as a food service provider are actually uh, taking some steps to reduce waste, they may feel licensed to uh, reduce waste less. And then portion size is a nice interaction with the nutrition literature where you can get a twofer here sometimes by uh, in food service settings, maybe reducing the size of the French fries, you get less waste uh, and perhaps uh, smaller waistlines as well. And then in-home studies um, are a bit less uh, frequent just because of the lack of, of data. But you do have some nascent work there looking at correlates of waste across uh, different um, uh, types of household demographics and issues and some early kind of uh, RCTs on responses to campaigns to households to reduce waste and a number of those coming out <clears throat> um, that have some stronger validity. A lot of those are just pre and post campaigns that um, not a lot of um, a, a strong validity there, but there's a few more of those coming out. Now we don't have a summary slide, but I, I do think it's, I'll, I'll offer a few summary thoughts and then allow Tim and, and um, Steve to chime in here as well. I think one thing that we haven't addressed yet is why are we even interested in, in food waste, right? Um, and here obviously it comes down to um, uh, externalities. We've got our typical non-pecuniary externalities with the emissions created along the, the supply chain and at the disposal level that are not being internalized. And then we've got a policy debate here and uh, wondering if there might be a means to 
affect um, food security through addressing food waste as well. But I think it's really ironic to me here, uh, an item that is so poorly measured has had so much salience in the policy community, right? Nobody agree, numbers of one third of all food being wasted. Um, nobody really knows if we're anywhere close to getting that number right, but yet it is highly compelling and highly motivational and uh, really captures the imagination of a lot of people in the advocacy and policy community and hence has really pushed this up the uh, agenda in a lot of policy uh, discussions. And as um, uh, Chris Barrett and his uh, colleague, um, um, I think it's Sheehan or me and I forget who, talk about this, it's easy to get caught up in the number of food waste, but obviously this is just a means to an end to delivering things such as reducing externalities, uh, addressing uh, food insecurity and other ends. So uh, getting caught up in the number is not the issue, but rather trying to figure out what is the socially optimal level of waste. And almost every uh, goal out there is a 50% reduction. And obviously that number is generally pulled from thin air without much justification in terms of being able to assess whether that comes close to driving social optimality. But obviously it's a, um, a nice number, round number for people to drive. Zero waste, which uh, Harry had pointed out very early in this discussion is a, is a crazy idea, still uh, emerges in certain types of campaigns. Uh, Kroger has a zero hunger, zero waste initiative, for example, which um, is just obviously zero is rarely going to be the economic uh, point of optimality. But um, I think that's kind of important that we uh, make some of those points that I think the big issues here are those issues of trying to understand what is the optimal level of waste, what is the best practices frontier for each segment of the supply chain. And then given that <clears throat> there's so much embedded resources in food and we have such distracted consumers in many parts of the world and sub areas of developing countries, how do we transmit those signals to that distracted portion of the supply chain that should be implementing perhaps the most um, uh, detailed and careful handling of the food uh, if this were all kind of uh, internalized along the supply chain. So I'll pause there and see if uh, Tim and Steve might have any other last concluding comments before we hand it back to the discussants. Harry. Uh, David, do we have a discussant? You do have a discussant. Um, should we let him go? Okay, let's let him go. Harry DeGorder um, from Cornell. I will turn the time over to you, um, we're shooting for about 10 minutes. We're running okay, I can do that. I can do that easily. Okay, so uh, this is a great paper, as one would expect, given who wrote it, the people that wrote it. Ironically, they, they cite uh, Kramer and his O-ring last link is the, you want the high quality of the last link, and then we get to the, the last sentence of the paper and the quality of the paper just crashes. So you might want to uh, uh, rewrite your paper in lieu of uh, Kramer's theory. Okay, so I, I always enjoy reading papers on food waste and then when now we have, I think, another definition of what food waste is versus food loss. And probably from habit, I think, well, you know, you can divert food at any level of the supply chain um, and you can uh, lose a quantity of at any level. So I don't see the lost waste being farm level or primary production consumer level either, but I'm not going to worry about that. I understand that we have to, uh, to do that. The thing that bothers me in the big picture is that people take consumption as given. And food waste is sort of like, given what people are doing or what the economy is doing, we're going to look at what is uh, diverted or what quantity is lost um, and you got the edible versus non-edible distinction but we got biofuels uh, the yield gap is it, that's lost I mean that's quantity that we could otherwise have if we could close the yield gap now the yield gap doesn't mean that uh, it's all based on what US corn doesn't mean that it's economically to close it but it is lost quantity um, you know we, we assume the current consumption bundle what, what meat we can get all the nutrition uh, or better nutrition from um, from not consuming wheat. So I'm not meat. So I'm always concerned about the the context of food waste in, in the big picture. But otherwise, I don't have any uh, 
any problems with the uh, the paper? I'm more interested in the policy implications, and I think uh, Brian Rowe talked to that at the end. Uh, like, what are what's the objective function? And when you look at the the people talking about, or the policymakers, the NGOs, the academics uh, in the debate, they're always talking about five or six things. Greenhouse gas emissions is one of them. Um, but also food security in terms of helping low-income farmers or low-income resource poor farmers and low-income consumers in developing countries, farm welfare, uh, reduce input use. And so if you look at the objectives, then should we even be looking at food waste? Should we be targeting the objectives of, of the underlying issues uh, of food waste rather than food waste directly? So that always comes to mind. Um, and then what instruments would you use? Well, you, you, you directly go to the, the issues, not to food waste necessarily itself. Uh, the other thing that, um, you know, which would be useful from all this literature, because there's sort of like all this micro literature at each level of the uh, supply chain on food waste that looks at a lot of detail. And it's, there's a lot of papers out there and what, and so this paper does a good job of sort of talking about that and then putting it up the big picture. Uh, I wish you guys would summarize the sort of the marginal cost of uh, reducing waste or loss. Uh, marginal cost functions and what they look like and why they look like why they would, which would be adding all these micro studies, everything from behavioral uh, studies to uh, uh, well, all, you, all the all the issues that that, that Brian addressed uh, that would be interesting for policymakers, so they can get a big idea. I like looking at the whole supply chain, the interaction effects along the supply chain. Um, and as soon as you start looking at supply chain, you're looking at sort of aggregate, still microeconomics, but you're looking at like market level for one commodity or one group of commodities. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't change the paper necessarily, but this is something that would be in high demand. The next time you guys write a summary paper, uh, it would be a lot of work, I think, but it'd be very useful. Um, I don't know if economists can do that. I don't know if it's even doable, but it would be great. So that's, that's my uh, 15 seconds of fame um, on, uh, I mean, I think it would be interesting to do a bit better work on the theory of waste, like why it's optimal to waste uh, beyond the, you know, the household model. Um, I don't know how to do it, but sort of like, you know, it's this, this asymmetric cost function for every participant, it, you need more food the cost of having too little food is always greater than the cost of having uh, too much for various reasons, depending on who you are. The farmer has to fill contracts, he's worried about prices, or sorry, about disease, um, all the way to the consumer. The consumer cannot afford to not have food on hand when the family's there, the neighbors are there, or even their children are there. And so it seems to me we, we got to have a, some, some better theory, not that I know how to do it. Um, Okay, that's my last thought on this whole topic. I don't know why I'm, I'm so in the, I don't reckon I didn't realize it's in the dark. Thank you, Harry. <laughs> and uh, so we have a few minutes uh, left for comments from the audience, questions from the audience. Um, just use the raise hand feature if you want to say something. And given that we haven't seen hands yet, I'll give a little bit of time to the authors if they wanted to respond to anything. Oh, I should, I should add that, did I read the last sentence of the paper to everybody else? No. Oh, <laughs> given that consumers are idiots, this observation is not particularly surprising. It suggests that all consumers should be mandated to consume their food in small disposable pill form. <laughs> I, I don't think it was written in jest, but that's, that was what I, the Kramer re, uh, reference. I'm sorry. I'm not. I can't assume everybody read the paper. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was Brian. <laughs> oh, I thought it would. Be, I thought it was Steve. <laughs> we'll probably move that up to the front of the paper, or maybe put it in the abstract. 
<laughs> and you'll at least the, the quality you'll end up with quality anyway <laughs> the last link will be high quality i'll note one thing we did not embrace in this paper is uh, there is a substantial lit literature on kind of quality loss particularly in developing contexts and i think chris has written extensively on that <clears throat> and uh, I guess one one question would be, is that something we could and should add into this section? Um, as, as I reflect, it probably would be wise to bring in a, a section on that as well, <clears throat> um, perhaps as a subsection of uh, the farm level loss, because uh, there are big issues with uh, quality <clears throat> uh, as nutrition. well. Nutrition. Well, yeah, toxicity and, and nutritional losses, yeah. yeah. On your your comment about about policy, um, Harry, you know, it was interesting. You know, and, and I kind of always think, you know, being here in a business school, you know, how you know, trained as an ag economist, we always tend to look for policy solutions. You know, historically, it's sort of our bottom line. You know, in publishing in our journals too. But a lot of the stuff that I included in this chapter is from, you know, supply chain and marketing and yeah, things yeah, like yeah. that, where you know they're looking at you know very normative sort of firm based solutions where they don't even call it waste, right? They call it shrink or unsaleables or something like that that are meant to be minimized by the by the retailers and things. So, you know, just due to the fact that this literature is grabbing hold of this issue and they're taking it seriously and they're doing all sorts of OR models and things like this about this, um, that tells me that, you know, at least for this part of the supply chain, you know, we don't need any policy solutions. You know, no. they're getting after it. And, no. you know, maybe we have these sort of minor levers in terms of tipping fees and things like that. But, you know, if there's, you know, again, not to pick on Mark Belmer, but if there's a $20 bill laying on the table, you know, they're going to go pick it up. Um, you know, if we can identify waste um, as as that, you know, these $20 bills, I think they're not going to exist anymore after, after not too long. Yeah, I agree with that too, yeah. With that, um... Mark has a question or comment, so I'll uh, I'll let him go. Yeah, I have a couple comments. I really thought I had done all the thinking I had to do about food waste and loss <laughs> in our 2017 article, but here we are. You know, this is better than just kind of like being on econ Twitter while this is happening. Um, one thing that I that there's a lot of there there's a it's a, very much in the zeitgeist that there is this obsession with nudges. Can we put a sticker that says that and magically food waste is going to disappear? Like it'll be down 70 percentage points, right? Um, and I just don't, I mean, everyone's trying to tweak here and there and a nudge here and there. And you see the same thing in development. It's all about nudges. Can we do a little thing that will kind of bring poverty down 80%? Um, and as far as I'm concerned, the best policy option to kind of curb those food waste numbers, if they are real, I'm gonna get back to that in a second, is budget share of food at 85%, right? Let's go back to what it was like in rural Madagascar in the mid 1990s. And that's kind of like, why is there no attention to that, to the fact that, you know, I mean, there is some attention, but it seems like the empirics are all obsessed with, with those little nudges. And there's, there's nothing about bigger effects and kind of bigger policy uh, levers than, than nudges and, and things like that. More importantly, I think there should be a part of the chapter about the political economy of food waste. You could write a, a whole paper about this, but I was just texting Richards while while the others were talking, and I said, "Those numbers. I mean, and and Richard said those numbers are are no one believes them, right? Like they're inflated to the max." And I said, "Yes, yeah, survival is the shrillest. NGOs do what NGOs do, and if you say, you know, if you're an NGO working on food on food waste and loss, and you say, well, you know, it, food waste is not that big of a deal." Uh, you're not getting any donor money. Um, and so I, I would very much like to see a, a short discussion of what are people's incentives for saying there is this much or kind of like maybe padding a little bit the numbers. And at, again, this could be a separate, a whole separate paper. And if it gets sent to the AJE in the next couple of years, I probably would be in charge of it because Tim will have stepped down by then uh, and Brian can't handle it. But I think it would be a really nice thing to have about like, why is there so much kind of like pushing in one direction or the other in that literature? I realize I'm holding people. But, but Mark, do you think do you think ERS's thirty percent figure was? I, that seemed I, I don't seem that that was developed long before the big push on food waste and uh, well, Brian, was the we, same. Brian, we were both on that panel. I know, and we, and we all we all know that the, that the way the sausage is made is kind of, you know 
somewhat dubious, right? There's a lot of kind of assumptions and, well, we think that this much of a carcass goes into, and, and then we keep this much. So I don't know. But again, I don't, but they didn't have that strong of a political motivation to pump up numbers at USDA back in the 80s and 90s when a lot of those initial figures were in place, right? They probably wanted to, wanted to show a efficient food system and not an inefficient one, uh, I would guess. But, but again, they, they, they included non-edible. They included shrinkage and basic, you know, yeah, which is a conversation that we we had also had during those meetings, Brian, where I said, you know, I don't know about you guys, but if a if an apple loses twenty percent moisture, is that re is that really food waste and loss, right? Because just because it sits there and, and dries out, um, I don't know. Again, that's I think that's where the, the the political economy of who says what in this literature comes in handy. And it, it, I'm not just faulting NGOs, right? I mean, there are there are plenty of people on the other side who have. An interest in saying no, it's not. A, it's not really an issue. So, except me, of course. <laughs> I, didn't, I don't see any other hands, so I'll, I'll insert myself in in the conversation. Um, I part of this that's always gotten to me. If we're looking specifically at household waste, and we're defining it the way we are, I, I have the feeling that any sort of policy we implement is going to be. Um, it's going to have some sort of impact on people's diets and how much they eat. And uh, specifically, if we're setting it up so we value um, not getting things in the trash more than we, uh, <laughs> than we value not getting things into people's bellies, um, we're going to be trading off health implications with, uh, with food waste. And I, I just don't, I don't think anybody's even, you know, approached tackling that and, and uh, talking about how we could trade those off or why we would. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Brenna and myself, we both have, we both working with nutrition groups as well and are looking at kind of the intersection of those. Um, so I, I think there are some people starting to look at kind of global, more global issues. You know, there's a, a whole suite of household issues, obesity, food safety, <clears throat> as well as waste. And um, pushing on anyone has the chance to either exacerbate or uh, elegantly, hopefully, uh, fix some of the other ones too. So I think it's a very uh, nascent literature, but I think there's at least some thought out there, but uh, plenty, plenty of scope for that interaction. And I think, but probably some of the stuff you've done with the, in the lunchroom settings, right, um, have probably um, uh, pushed at that intersection as well. Well, yeah. eating more than 2,000 calories a day is waste. Yeah, and some have pushed for that definition in the broader literature, um, but usually haven't found um, much success in pushing that. Yeah. Uh, jump in. Go, Go ahead, ahead, Steve. I was just going to say the one other is interesting angle there on the health is also the fresh versus processed angle. It's certainly, you could process more food and make it more shelf stable and probably reduce food waste, but it may not be very healthy. Yeah, it's interesting, exactly. David. You know, to your to your point, I'm on a, a big NIH grant here at ASU that looks at um, efficacy of salad bars in schools. You know, to increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables and things like that. And you know, the PIs are are two nutritionists. You know, and, and you know, very well respected in their fields. But their kind of research objective function is totally different than ours. Right? They don't even. I, you know, every time I bring up the fact that you know you bring this salad bar in and 80 percent of it is thrown away, they don't care. You know, the, all they're, they're, they worry about is, you know, the increased uptake and, you know, the, the fact that kids put it on their, their plate is a win for them, you know, and the fact that they threw it out is, is kind of a non-issue and I, that it's sort of mystifying, you know, and they want me to do an economic analysis of this. And every time I bring that point up, it's like, well, we should probably ignore, ignore that part. <laughs> <laughs> Alan has a question. Uh, or yeah, I, I don't know this literature well, but it's fascinating because it seems, you know, as you point out on the you know, supply chain stuff, the stockouts, they're damaging. You could find out the optimal amount of, of, of overage to have there, right? But that's sort of irrelevant to the question. The question seems to be sort of about household waste, right? And, and people buying food and throwing it away. So I, my question is about um, systematic errors. Is there a literature that should be in this review concerning people making systematic errors repeatedly over and over again? Because that, that seems to be part of what 
must explain food waste, right? Actually, one, one article that, that I think, you know, is, is prominent in Brian's section that we didn't really bring out in this presentation today is uh, a new paper that was brilliantly edited in the AJE by myself and then equally brilliantly commented on in the AJE by Brian, by uh, Yang Yu and, and Ted Janicki that looks at, you know, household production waste in terms of uh, an inefficient frontier right, or a stochastic production frontier, right? And any deviation from that is inefficiency and, and you know, an input usage waste, which I think is a great way to think about it, right? More generally, you know, and in this, the minor um, ERS piece that um, Ashik Mishra and I have a chapter in, we look at farm level waste in kind of the same way, you know, very much simpler. We use a, a old style, like linear programming model. You know, if we're optimally, you know, producing and selling various fruits and vegetables, you know, how do changing prices impact the, the amount that we optimally leave in the field? And we wow. come up with, with all sorts of sort of reasonable estimates of, you know, what farmers really do leave in the field. And that is, you know, gets to your point about optimal systematic errors, right? That, you know, there's, there's some amount that's optimally left and there's some that's just plain mistakes, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, Tim, that's what I'm getting. So the, the commercial side, is, I'm sure it's got an optimality. The household side seems like bad judgment people consistently make the same errors on. I mean, I, I do it. I mean, people do it. People are very rational doing it, right? Right. Uh, well, yeah. Bad or optimistic, right? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you could you could call it poor forecasting. You could also call it, you know, you go to Costco, geez, that 50 pound box of apples looks great. You know, I'm going to start eating tons of apples, you know, right. and if it doesn't manifest within a couple months, you know, you also, you all of a sudden have a bunch of fuzzy apples. So, yeah. I just sort of wondered if there's stuff from finance or other areas even unrelated to this about, you know, measuring systematic errors that could be, you know, interesting for this part of the literature here, because, uh, you know, people make financial errors consistently too, right? right. It's various. Well, the, the whole concept that Steve talked about with, uh, you know, the, with retailers that, that over order, you know, there is an OR literature that is super deep that we just scratched the surface of today. That gets to exactly what you're talking about. You know, if food demand is stochastic, and the cost of an over uh, cost of a of a stock out they call it you know when you consumer goes into the store product they want isn't there they don't just wait until the next time they go to a different store and if you lose that customer that's a huge cost for a retailer so they order buffer stocks that are you know commonly 20% of what they actually need just because those out of stocks are so costly you know so there's a huge or literature on this thing you know that's not a new concept um, and i think that falls within your sort of rubric of a systematic error for sure so we're just about out of time. Mark has his hand up and uh, he has the correct incentives on timing. So I'll let him ask his question. It's a very quick one. I think I've heard you guys mention it, but I, I, I'm not sure if this was in the right context. You guys talk about how you, you can only buy stuff in lumpy quantities and that is a source of food waste. Do you have that in there? Yeah, oh, I, you do. It's definitely in the retail side. I mean, you have a choice of package size for sure. But that's, I mean, that's often my problem as a consumer is you can only buy so much of, say, like when you buy box lettuce or arugula or things like that, you, you often end up, wait, it's always my, my perennial example. But mm -hmm. Why do you care? You have a dog that loves leftover food. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> we had that in the slides. Is, your pictures. You know, the solution to food waste is two chickens in every backyard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> very good uh, I suppose we have maybe 30 seconds of break here <laughs> that we could take um, don't want to waste any time don't want to waste any time to, to be honest though, excellent we don't, job folks I, I don't think we have that much uh, we don't have that much material unless Hope has a lot of material for her discussion I think we can afford to take five minutes so that people can stretch their legs, go get you know more coffee or something, and start at uh, twelve oh five or one oh five Eastern. I, I am uh, I am okay with that so long as Chris agrees. We can start about five. That's after. a great idea. Okay, so <laughs> start at five after. Yep. yep. All right, Mark always needs more coffee. Decaf only, right, Mark?
So looks like we should probably get started again. Um, so welcome back. Uh, we now hear from uh, Mark Belmar from University of Minnesota, Jeff Bloom from, uh, from ERS, and Shangun Lin from Texas Tech on producers, consumers, and value chains in low and middle income countries. The time is yours. Great, thanks. And uh, well, thanks to everyone for presenting your chapters today. I, uh, we've been texting uh, Mark Sunghun and I about how pertinent all these chapters are to, to our work here. So I'm uh, very curious about how to cite chapters in the own in the same uh, volume. Um, we are, uh, this is a pretty extensive sort of task that we're undertaking here. We, we think we have a pretty good uh, rough draft on, on some sections, but we're really interested in, in you all's feedback on the, the structure that this, this uh, chapter is taking um, and if there's any sort of gaps that we're, we're missing out from our, from our outline and from what we've been um, writing about so far. Last, okay. So our goal is here uh, in, in this chapter is to review the literature on agricultural value chains in low and middle income countries. Uh, and we're gonna do this by studying the whole process by which agricultural commodities make their way from the farm gate to the final consumer. Uh, we wanna develop a general conceptual framework, which in practice is gonna look more like a, a theoretical framework for every sort of step along the way uh, that accounts for the behavior of actors and the effects of various market failures uh, along the supply chain in these contexts. Um, and we also wanna discuss implications for policy, uh, criti critically access the research so far, um, primarily in terms of sort of the uh, econometrics that are applied in, in this literature to estimate different effects on, of the supply chain or smallholder participation in the, in the agricultural supply chain, um, and then offer recommendations for future, future research. So our, our core sort of unifying question throughout this whole thing is what is the role of our globalized food system in the structural transformation or agricultural uh, or economic development uh, if, of low and middle income countries? So uh, we sort of split apart our work here into two, two sections. Globally, um, the, the rise of agricultural value chains uh, have been fueled by in institutional, political, and technological change in the production process for, for both you know, um, goods and services in general, but also um, agricultural goods and services as well. Um, yet despite this globalization, uh, there are sort of huge disparities uh, in our global food system. So to cite just one example of this, uh, agricultural workers in the richest 10% of countries produce on average uh, 50 times more output per worker than those in the poorest 10% of countries. Um, and then within countries, the, the proliferation of, of agricultural value chains, uh, which we sort of mean, mean the adoption of new technologies or contract farming, the emergence of supermarkets or, or processed foods, um, may influence uh, an economy's structural transformation. Uh, and, and as like a new and, and sort of recent uh, Journal of Economic Literature uh, article points out, um, although there's lots of work and theories about agricultural development, um, a lot of these theories are abstract away from incorporating the role of agricultural value chains in their um, actual models. Um, okay, so, so what are agricultural value chains? The literature often uses the term value chain interchangeably with, with supply chain. We're gonna use the term value chain uh, for the most part. Um, in the most generic form, agricultural value chains, uh, is, it's a system of economic agents, so individuals, households, farms or firms that produce and distribute agricultural goods and services. Um, at, at a minimum, there's sort of two segments. So an upstream, up, upstream segment that produces the raw agricultural commodity and a downstream segment that produces or markets the final product to consumers. Um, we sort of, at the outset, sort of envision leaning on a conceptualization, conceptualization of value chains as, as snakes or spiders. Uh, this is sort of, this comes from the work of, of Paul Andrus uh, and, and co-authors um, where snakes are sort of a production process that requires a specific order and spiders are a production process that sort of, you know, does not provide a specific uh, or require a specific order. All the sort of inputs can be uh, assembled at one time. 
Um, so one question that I have uh, for, for us all to sort of consider and discuss is, do you think that this conceptualization is helpful when thinking about agricultural supply chains, um, you know, in a specific um, context rather than just like uh, supply chains in, in general? Okay, so here's the outline of our chapter as, as we have currently envisioned it. And we're gonna start with within country value chains and we're sort of in this, in this section of the chapter going to go sort of step by step um, throughout the, the agricultural value chain from the farm gate to the final consumer. Um, talking about subsistence agriculture and participation in agricultural value chains, um, contract farming versus spot markets, um, and then moving on to processors, wholesalers, distributors, logistics, retailers, supermarkets, and then finally um, consumer behavior. And then we're going to talk about global value chains, um, talk about the rise of, of these of these of this sort of institution in the last several decades, um, and then talk about the opportunities of these sorts of um, of this institution of global um, value chains for economic development, and also some of the particular challenges that uh, low and middle income countries may face when trying to participate in global value chains. Then we'll have a discussion of, of policy uh, for domestic policy, specifically agricultural policy, other types of policy, and then international policy as well. So again, we'd love to, you know, your feedback on if this chapter outline seems fitting to you if we're missing any, any sections here. All right, so this, we're just gonna kind of go through each of these, um, each of these sections. So the, the first main section is talking about um, within country agricultural value chains. Um, so this is not a value chain that does not cross an international border. Um, we sort of start here because um, although we talk about the globalization of our food system, uh, the majority of food is still sort of processed within the country that it's finally finally consumed in. Um, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna take this whole sort of, uh, process of, of the agricultural value chain from the farm gates to the final consumer. So we start with the farmer and we sort of start with a sort of zero with stage when the farmer has to decide what sort of inputs do I uh, use when producing this agricultural product. So we start with um, the very classic literature thinking about um, barriers to the adoption of so-called high yielding inputs. Um, so talking about missing or limited uh, markets for credit or insurance. Um, explanations highlighting knowledge or behavioral constraints. Um, again, this is where sort of the, we were just talking about nudges. This is sort of where that fits in in, the, in this literature. Um, there's also some work on, on uncertainty over the perceived benefits and the role of social learning in, in, in adopting these, these technologies. Uh, there's more recent work uh, on the uncertainty of the quality of these, of these products and how this might be a, a barrier. Um, and then also, just heterogeneity within a population about the net returns associated with adopting a specific technology um, and how that might explain the behavior. We then move on to discussing agricultural household, households, talking about the concept of net sellers, net buyers, um, specifically in the context of low and middle income countries. Um, and this sort of moves into and motivates a discussion on price dispersion between net selling households and net buying households. Uh, which leads to a lengthy discussion about um, the influence of market information systems, which you know uh, draws off the work of of Jensen um, and and Jenny Aker as well. We then move on to contracts uh, versus spot markets. We we think of contracts as sort of a um, an alternative to full vertical coordination or integration within the um, agricultural value chain. Um, uh, we, we think of contracts as sort of two general forms. So contracts between a landowner and a grower, which is just sharecropping. Um, we review some of the classic literature on sort of Marshallian inefficiency, and also some of the newer work um, on how market failures may play uh, or explain sort of the, the prevalence of sharecropping in, in a lot of, con uh, or in some contexts. And then we look at contracts between um, a land owning grower and a processing firm, which is to typically referred to as contract farming. Um, we uh, rely on a literature, uh, a literature review that Mark and I wrote a couple years ago, um, but also expand on some of the work that's been done since then, um, specifically some of the work that improves on internal validity uh, with, with some experimental work, um, and then also some work that um, expands on external validity, looking at the, the effects of 
uh, contract farming participation in places that we have no evidence uh, or, or research so far. We then move on to talking or discussing processors, wholesalers, distributors, and logistics uh, firms. Uh, we start by discussing the choice of, of farmers of whether to sell their products to traders or to transport the, the product themselves to a, to a close a closer near market. Um, so due to relatively high transaction costs in a lot of contexts in low and middle income countries, and particularly households who are um, relatively remote, um, these households don't have a ton of choice uh, or often don't have a ton of choice uh, or alternative to selling to traders. And this concern sort of motivates some, um, some people to wonder whether traders exploit uh, or have excess market power uh, over smallholder farmers. And this is you know, one area where the first presentation today um, could, be, could be helpful for us. Um, we look at a couple different sort of innovations in, in sort of um, the distributor uh, system or the sort of um, trader systems within these countries. Um, some that find efficiency gains in providing some sort of alternative to or information treatment to um, farmers, um, but you know other work that finds that you know uh, institutions around traders can be sort of relatively sticky. Um, and then we lean on some of them uh, a recent sort of review by um, Dylan and Dambro on on the evidence of competition in sub-Saharan African crop markets. Um, they conclude that while the you know there's not a ton of evidence uh, um, to sort of base a uh, sort of overarching finding on that that crop markets are competitive. However, more recent work finds that the median trade costs in sub-Saharan Africa are, are roughly five times larger than in the rest of the world, which would suggest some sort of inefficiency in these markets. And then a recent um, sort of amazing uh, article in the AER published this or last year, uh, which implements three different randomized control trials in Kenya um, and finds sort of generally a lack of competition among agricultural traders in, in Kenya. So we're trying to really update sort of our understanding, collective understanding uh, on, this, on this topic. We have really yet to write the, the retailers and supermarket section. Um, we envision sort of uh, relying a lot on the work of, of Tom Reardon in this section and, and his co-authors on supermarkets and, and low and middle income countries. Um, and then we have yet to write the section on, on consumer behavior as well. Uh, the, the second sort of main um, section of this chapter is, is thinking about global value chains or value chains that cross international borders. Um, this is a growing means of production for, for agricultural commodities uh, uh, around the world. We first discussed the rise of agricultural value chains and then discussed both opportunities and challenges associated with uh, global agricultural value chains in low and middle income countries. So uh, global value chains are becoming very, very prevalent around the world. So this is a, this is a chart uh, from last year's World Development Report, which focused entirely on global value chains um, and shows that the use of uh, the share, well, the share of um, global value chains amongst uh, trade is, is sort of increasing around uh, globally in the last several decades. Uh, this is for all types of goods, but it, it also sort of holds uh, for specific agricultural goods as well. Uh, in that World Bank World Development Report, which was titled Trading for Development in the Age of Global Value Chains, uh, the authors suggest that linking smallholder farmers to agricultural value chains has the potential to lift millions out of poverty. So this is a this is a large claim and sort of suggests that there's large opportunities uh, for, for global value chains uh, to promote uh, economic development and poverty alleviation around the world. Um, so part of the reason for this is that, you know, through the participation in global value chains, both smallholder farmers and processors and, and folks all along the, the value chain can access global markets better and then also, you know, leverage their comparative advantage in, in the production of these process, in these goods um, uh, to, a, to a larger uh, global market. However, there are distinct challenges um, that we want to sort of also highlight um, specifically for low and middle income countries and their participation in global value chains. So one uh, big one that we think of uh, is requirements on standards, uh, which is, you know, can 
represent a critical uh, barrier to participation um, in global value chains, primarily because consumers in high income countries often hold preferences for high quality products, uh, which is you know, something that we were just discussing with food waste. Um, you know, these, these high income um, consumers might have high standards for certain types of um, bananas, for example, that don't have spots on them or have a particular color. Um, and it might be hard for, for processors uh, and growers in, in a low and middle income country context to sort of meet those standards on a consistent basis. Um, additionally, there are, are there challenges associated with the ability to observe and enforce contracts uh, in sort of an international um, uh, context where it's hard to have a, or there is no sort of overarching governing body to enforce these contracts, et cetera. Um, however, there's some really uh, neat work coming out um, specifically uh, on this sustainable quality program, uh, which is this, which was implemented by this large multinational coffee buyer that you know, we don't know exactly who, who it is, but in Colombia and shows how, you know, this big sort of effort coordinating both um, interventions on the supply and demand side of the global or of the value chain for coffee in Colombia uh, leads to efficiency gains throughout the whole, uh, the whole value chain and also um, in particular uh, benefits participating uh, growers at the end of that value chain as well. So while there are distinct challenges uh, associated with participation in global value chains, um, these seem to be able to be overcome with sort of these types of coordinated interventions. Um, and yeah, and then we're gonna talk about policy based on that, based on our discussion and review of those, those two sections. Uh, we have yet to write this section as well, but we plan to discuss uh, several sort of domains of, of policy. Um, yeah, and then we're, we'll conclude with some uh, discussion of some of the gaps in the literature. Um, we haven't written this, this section as well, obviously, but we already perceive that there's a large gap in literature on the like middle parts of the, of the value chains, processing, logistics, distributors. Um, there's already quite a bit of work on smallholder uh, participation in agricultural value chain for, for inputs or outputs. Um, um, and we also know quite a bit about the consumer end, but this sort of middle part is where we're, we're really missing part. So yeah, that's, that's all we have for today. And we'd be really interested in what, um, what you think about what we're, where we're going with this, this chapter. Thank you very much, Jeff, and uh, wonderful job. I, we need to turn our time now over to Hope Michelson, who's the Hi. president for this section. Okay, so I can share my screen. Yeah. Hope, can you share your slides after, please? Yeah, of course, of course. Okay. Can you that, see that it? Was, Is it, yeah. are we good? Well, you should blow it up, but, but yes. Uh, right, I was okay, gonna, good. I was gonna type everything down, but. Don't type. Okay. okay. All right, great. Well, um, thanks for having me. And this was a very fun, very meaty chapter to read and to comment on. So it was a real, um, it was a real pleasure. Uh, so I am going to give you some general comments on the, um, the what I see as the contribution. Then I'm going to push you on value chains and like why value chains. What's the point of having a value chain approach? I'll offer some thoughts on that. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time thinking through that. <clears throat> and I'm gonna propose some small changes to the structure that I think will amplify, amplify a conceptual focus and open up some space for some new material that I think might be interesting here. And then I'll give you a little bit of guidance on that new content. Yeah. Right, so yeah, so let me state, restate the central question that you all are after, which is, what is the role of our globalized food system made up of countless agricultural value chains and the structural transformation economic development of low and middle income countries? That is a big, beefy, super important question. Um, it's always exciting to see people, I think thinking at that level, we spend so much time thinking about the sort of micro level causal effects and stuff that um, having an opportunity to situate that within this broader space is really um, essential. Um, and I think you do a really good job also pro providing some something of a primer on what value chain terminology is, which I think is actually not always that clear uh, what, the, what that actually entails. Um, and you have really nice summaries of the literature. I think especially some of this recent micro literature on contracts on competition, those, those summaries are really, really well done and I think really well integrated together. So 
Wrong one. Okay, so, but as I said, I want to push you on this value chain piece, right? So you identify as a motivating factor for the work that there's a limitation of the existing literature. And you say that, in particular, most theories of agricultural development, structural transformation, economic development, abstract away from the important intermediation roles of agricultural value chains. I agree, that's, it's, that's a problem. Um, but so, so, so then I went back to the Reardon and Timmer um, handbook chapter from 2007, and I was, I, which I really, I really am fond of that chapter. Um, and I was looking sort of through some of their motivation and their sort of call to action, and they have a couple paragraphs in, in which they articulate what I think these two sentences really distill. It's uncommon for agribusiness and retail researchers to rub shoulders with development economists. It is not too late. These groups need to collaborate. So this is a sort of persistent anxiety. It's a persistent recommendation, I think, in the field that there's a broader approach that, that sort of operates at some intersection between marketing and development, between, um, you know, IO and development. Like, we, we're sort of saying this again and again. So one question I have for you is, have we made progress since 2007? Are we doing better in this regard? This is something that was really prioritized, you know, 14 years ago. Um, and then I want you to stake a claim. I want you to have an opinion. Why is it useful to use value chains as an organizing concept? Why? Well, and we have a ton of literature. You, you're summarizing very adeptly an enormous amount of studies. What is it that having a value chains perspective contributes and what does that actually even mean? Right? So for example, are ag development economists, are we all already doing value chain research? Yeah, you know, am I a value chain uh, person? I, I think I am, um, but that's something that I sort of learned over time, right? Are we all just gonna rebrand ourselves as value chain researchers and get jobs in business schools? Or is this something more substantive that requires some new kind of methodology, some new kind of framing, some new kind of perspective? I want you to draw a line. I, I, I think it's really important. I think that's a real contribution of a piece like this is to actually stake a claim here. Um, so for example, I mean, you can take or leave all of this obviously, but I think your current framing implies four questions to discuss and you know, this could be two paragraphs, but I think it helps clarify what you're after. So why has the past literature and growth and development glossed over these details, right? You say that that, that happens, why? Why is that? It's just that we've got these sort of developmental, or, sorry, um, kind of uh, methodological silos that we exist within, is that it? Is it something more profound? Um, you know, what problems does this create in terms of generating data and evidence? I think that's the real, that's where the urgency comes from, right? And that's the anxiety that Reardon and Tim are expressing 14 years ago, right? That this is leading to blind spots, that we're not collecting the right data, that we're not doing the right analyses, that we're not prioritizing the right research questions. But should we be prioritizing avoiding these kinds of abstractions in the future and how, and what would that literature look like, right? What's an example study that does what you think we need to be doing? Um, so I think if you frame the chapter this way, it's not, it's, it's just sort of adding a subsection that really takes on some of these questions. Um, you can then put some structure on what you're already doing, which is surveying this wide range of studies which are associated with value chains in low income countries. I think that allows you to demonstrate some new gaps and some new insights and some new data needs. And I'll be specific about that. Uh, one big question related to this question of whether or not we're just all gonna rebrand ourselves as value chain researchers is, you know, can we define, is that what you're up to? Are you defining a new value chain focused literature from what is already there? Is that possible? Do we just sort of think about the work that exists in a new way or do we need to go out and do something new? And then I'll ask, I'll ask this question later on, but is agriculture research special in some of these analyses? So I think, you know, if I'll give you some of my thoughts on this. Um, I think the point of the value chain approach is it makes us attend to what I think of as the vast intermediating middle of the food system, right? So you, you have to think about aggregators, you have to think about aggregators, um, wholesalers, traders, and food retailers. And once you start looking at some of this micro level work on contract farming, which is where I have a lot of expertise in Marta's as well, or on input supply and all this other literature that, you, that you're discussing, Right, the, the, that intermediating middle is determining the, the, the ecosystem and it's determining the outcomes for farmers and for consumers, right? That's why we care about those, those folks, those um, 
uh, and I'll, I can talk about that a little bit later. And that's a, that implies that studies of those actors, that you need to have studies of those actors themselves, and there's not that many of them, or you want studies of the actors in the middle that are sort of engaging upstream or downstream relationships. Um, and I think it presents challenges and ur an urgency to data collection samples. Anyway, and there's complications related to sample size dynamics. Those are some of my thoughts that I can be more specific on about why I think there's this gap. So if you want to talk about papers that are recently doing a good job, some of these are ones that you're already talking about. So the Machiavellio and Mikel Florenza paper on quality upgrading, I think does an incredible job with this. Um, the Burke paper that was in QJE, which looks at storage decisions that takes a sort of general equilibrium, partial equilibrium approach to looking at kind of the regional effects of an intervention. Lauren Bergquist's recent work on traders, um, Chris's work uh, on you know, Mad 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 Malagasy trader entry um, in 2011. So what I'm urging you to do is to use the chapter to draw some distinctions and to stake out a territory here and to help a new research coming into the field to be specific and understand what they're actually meant to do. Um, yeah. Okay, so, uh, and then I'm gonna give you a few thoughts on the structure um, and in a way that I might subtly restructure things to, to kind of make more space. So right now, as Jeff went through, you've got this focus on within country value chains, couple of content, um, and then you look at global value chains, and then you're gonna have a section on policy research gaps and conclusions. I don't think the structure is quite right. And the reason is, and, and I think Jeff and Sunghan both asked me to think about the structure, and I was like, oh, that seems like a funny thing to think about. But it's, it's really hard, <laughs> actually, to structure this chapter. So I, I understand why that's something that you wanted me to spend some time on. So I, I think currently there's all this um, material that you cover in the within country section that's obviously urgent and relevant to the global value chain section. And there's a bunch of stuff in particular related to contract contractual enforcement in the global value chain section that's relevant to the within and standards that's relevant to the within country value chain section. And I think breaking it up like that um, currently implies that those are separate kinds of problems and they're not. Um, and I, I think you're moving in this direction. But so what I would do is I would add, so you, you talk about subsistence ag and you kind of focus on farmers. I would add a second focus, which is a focus on studies that engage that meso middle level and take the unit of analysis as those uh, small and medium enterprises. And part of the conclusion from that, that review might be, hey, there's not a lot, but that's essential as a point to make in the space, right? And by doing that, I think you, you make a lot of the other content in this section a little bit more interesting because you have to sort of think about two different kinds of actors and the, you know, the kinds of market failures that you know, small firms are facing as, as well as um, small farmers. So I, I think that gets a bit more interesting. Um, and then I would move all that stuff on contract enforcement and standards into this within country value chain um, uh, section because there are all these standards and there's food safety issues and there's lots of stuff happening within countries and there's a lot of action in that space. And Tom's work and some of the work he's doing with Soweda um, is showing a lot of that, especially in West Africa. You need to add something on gender, it has to be there. And I'll talk a little bit specifically about that. And I think gender in particular is an entry point to talking about labor markets um, and labor markets and high value agriculture, which is also really essential to consider. And I, I also think you might wanna pull out some a sort of subsection and think about the distribution of risk along the value chain and the capacity of different actors along the supply chain to sort of cope with different kinds of risk and manage risks in different ways. Um, and then I think when you go to the global value chain stuff, then what you're doing is it's, it's similar to what you're already doing, which is like, how do things get more complicated and more interesting when you start moving ag across borders? Um, yeah, and, and you know, when I was, I was one of the, on the editorial board for the big FAO report on global value chains last year, and one thing we talked a lot about was, you know, what's different about agriculture in this space? You know, and that's relevant here because the question is, when we're thinking about global value chains, in a lot of these big reports that are being released by the bank, if you look at what they're saying about agriculture, it's not that much. And the question that I have for you is, you know, how relevant is all of this work and all of this analysis on global value chains that's not related to agriculture, that's on the industrial sector? You know, what can we sort of port over into agriculture and what needs to be amended? Um, I think I might be running low on time. Uh, so, Tom Reardon's folks. So this is zooming in on this part, the meso level, and then I was going to give you some thoughts on labor and gender. 
Um, so this meso level, it's obviously an urgent frontier. Tom Reardon has some really nice work um, where he's looking at this and calling it the hidden middle, not the missing middle, but the hidden middle. It's also hidden in um, kind of empirical micro. I think there's not enough work. Um, there's reasons why. <laughs> so, you know, especially in the contract farming literature, if you start looking at what's going on, as I said before, working with small farmers is extremely expensive. It's expensive at time um, you know, in search costs and transport costs and contracting negotiations. So, you know, understanding the incentives of those midstream actors is essential to understanding who participates and what their outcomes are, like no question. And it's, um, I think it's way too neglected in the literature. So that's a, that's a sort of space where I think you can make some points. Um, you know, markets fail for these actors too. Um, drawing some distinction there is really valuable. There's a data problem, right? So if you sit, I think, and think about all of the rich literature and the reviews that we heard earlier in the morning about market power, you know, concentration, uh, margins, it's really hard to think about implementing those analyses in low-income countries because we just don't have the data on this stuff. So I think spending some time shining a light on that is really helpful. My takeaway from Brian and Chelsea's paper is that we don't know enough. Uh, I think it's an absence of evidence, not evidence of absence conclusion, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, Brian and I have argued about that a little bit. Uh, so I, I think there's, there's maybe some more things to be said there. Um, yeah, as I said, I think you want to think about gender, but in a particular way in this context. You want to think about gender because it has a lot of relevance for what's going on with labor and what we might not be measuring in high value agriculture and for who might be getting into these value chains. So here's, there's some really specific um, sites and I can give you some more. Um, there's a few drop threads. You introduce a conceptualization as snakes or spiders. You don't ever go back to it. I don't know if you need it. I think you were previewing that uncertainty when you, <laughs> when you sort of foregrounded it in your own presentation. Um, you have a discuss, you, you know, one of your three primary objectives is a discussion of credibility of empirical methods. You really only do that for contract farming. You don't do it for other in the literature. That's fair. I think the contract farming literature, which I've spent a lot of time reviewing and Mark has too, has a lot of empirical issues. Um, you know, the primary question is causal and, and the data is not generally, um, is not generally in a, in a state that lends itself to that being an easy question to go after. So there's a lot to say about um, credibility. But I think if that remains a stated goal, you may want to do that for other um, literatures that you're surveying or qualify the statement. Um, you, the abstract mentions of a conceptual framework. It doesn't feel obvious when you're going through the paper that, that I'm following conceptual framework. So maybe there's just some subtle tweaks that you could use to sort of you know, bring that out a little bit more. And you lead with an example from the industrial production, which is smartphones, but I, it seems kind of weird to do that. So, I, you know, I feel like I've seen people use Nutella a lot um, or some other agricultural product to make this point about the kind of fine splicing of comparative advantage across multiple uh, countries that, you know, which is the sort of takeaway insight of global value chains. Um, yeah. There's a few papers with historical perspectives that have come out recently, which are pretty interesting. The one on the United Fruit Company in Costa Rica, um, Dellen Olgan, it's a very controversial paper, but you might want to say something about it on the Dutch cultivation system in, in Java. If you're interested in thinking about long-term structural transformation and ag, you might want to think about some of these papers that try to look at that with a historical perspective. Um, Chikun Huang's work on China seems really relevant. I don't know how you integrate China into the story, but he's obviously made big contributions there. Uh, Kasabori's work on contracting, I thought you could say it a little bit more. Um, I thought you might want to drop the consumer subsection. You have so much to do. Um, so, I mean, there's just so much literature and there's, it, it seems like, it, I, it wasn't clear to me how that was going to integrate with everything else, but you probably have a master plan, so. Anyway, it was a great chapter, lots of fun to read, and I look forward to hearing people's comments. Thanks, Hope. Yeah. Thank you, Hope. Can, I, can, um, I, can we just kind of yeah. respond Go first? And then, okay, so Hope, thank you for bringing uh, to this the care that you bring to everything else, to your papers, to your reviews. Um, this is wonderful. and and. Uh, now I know what it must feel like to be Tom Reardon because you have given my brain about 85 different directions in which to go. Um, and, and really, I mean, this is wonderful. You, 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 have, you have kind of crystallized a lot of what I think and a lot of 
Um, and, and you've kind of anticipated a lot of directions in which we are going with this. And thank you for kind of like the suggestion for the reorganization. I think that's, uh, that's really good. But a couple of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, I remember, I think it was in 2015 in San Francisco and we had the, the pre-conference event on value chains that I think uh, it was, I think it was uh, Chris and Yo and Reardon and organizing. And I think I remember Tom mentioning that that famous uh, that bit that you talked about in his chapter with Peter Timmer. Uh -huh. And I think what had been said in the, at the, the equivalent workshop back in the day was, it's like ships passing in the night, the agribusiness. Uh -huh. I mean, Chris was there, I think, and he can confirm or, or, or not, uh -huh. um, that it was like ships passing in the night. The agribusiness folks and the, and the ag development folks were working on the same things, but just not talking to each other. Yeah. And yeah. that, per as far as I'm concerned, that persists to this day. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, so I do you do think like it's a problem? Idea. Do you think, do you think it's a problem or do you think Chris, it, chat, I mean... Chris says in the chat, it's still true. <laughs> um, it is, no, I think it's absolutely a problem because yeah. we, we are in danger of reinventing the wheel here. Yeah. Um, and so I, I gave the keynote to the Aries meetings a couple of weeks ago, and it's something I've been kind of keynoting for, for a couple of years, but it's, toward a prospective marriage of IO and development. And I talk about agribusiness and how they, you know, we have entire yeah. departments and colleagues who work on agribusiness and yet we don't talk to them. Yeah. Uh, it, the, 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 you know, it's very minimal and there was, you know, we might go for lunch and stuff, but it's like, we don't know what they're doing and they don't know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, where I see this going is, is why value chains is I think once we kind of can collectively once we can abandon our collective um, fantasy and obsession with uh, RCTs and causal identification, and we can take a step back and say, well, what kind of, what can we do well in, with better data and better structural methods? Mm -hmm. I think modeling entire value chains empirically is where this should be going. In the mm -hmm. And it's, it's not going to happen tomorrow, uh, but just kind of starting to describe value chains. And that's the problem, right? Is that once, you know, you see, if you pick a commodity at the farm gate and say, we're going to be looking at apples, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it starts kind of multiplying very, very quickly the uses and things you can do with that. And so it's, it's very different per commodity, per country, per variety of commodity. Mm -hmm. And, but I think just describing and kind of doing some kind of network mapping is a, it could be a useful tool, um, there's a lot of case studies in the agribusiness literature for that reason, right? And mm -hmm. I think we've been, we've been um, unthinkingly dismissive of those descriptive methods and those case study methods where we can learn a whole lot of stuff from them. And I understand that everyone has to kind of publish and get tenure and, and, and get promoted and stuff like that. But that's where I think people, you know, people like me who have, who are kind of on the other side of that can mm -hmm. kind of take the luxury of saying, well, I don't care, you know, if, if <laughs> Yeah, I don't care if J-PAL doesn't like it, I can do this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I, I do, I, I think we should definitely state at the, at the outset, here's the conceptual framework and just make a flow chart of the various stages of what's going on. Uh, and Jeff has become very good at making flow charts. He made one ticks for another paper that we have. So I think we should, we can, uh, we can certainly do that. But yeah, broadly speaking, I really appreciate your, I, I, I think, you and I agree that there is this, you know, the hidden middle is truly hidden. Um, there's, as you said, Sawida has a number of papers on that, that she's kind of like, you know, she's, she's had for a couple of years and she's published here and there. But mm -hmm. I think there's the, the dearth, the paucity of data is what led to this. Mm -hmm. But I think on the other hand, we are now getting better at collecting data and, and statistical agencies in, in LMIX are getting better at collecting data at all levels. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna have an incentive in taxing the, those SMEs. And so we're gonna see better data come online in the next you know, 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, what I, as I was listening to Jeff present, what I would like to see is just research gaps and directions as a, as a section on its own, not just in the conclusion. I think it's more important in the policy stuff because the markets are going to do what they do, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, we can talk a little bit about, in, about industrial policy, but thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this. This was, yeah. I don't know if Jeff or Sanghun have any additional comments to make, but this was so more than, than I was excited and I was hoping for, so great. Yeah, your, your comments are, are excellent. And, you know, a lot of them are, 
you know, just spot on, like we currently discuss more of the empirical challenges with contract farming because that was like a part of Mark and I's review. Like we, we just, it was easy for us to write, like, you know, and it's certainly a goal for us to, to write more about that, you know, those challenges for all of the other kind of components of the chapter as well. So that's just one example, like spot on comments. Really appreciate them. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ho. Uh, it's a really good uh, comments. And then I totally agree with you there. Uh, most of like highlight, uh, especially for the data part in the global value chains. And then so many empirical evidence for the global value chains, value chains especially for the agricultural or food value chains. There is a, a, a in my best knowledge, like to my best knowledge, there is only one <laughs> empirical study that published in the 2019, right, uh, in the AJAE that focused on the how trade agreements affect the participation in the agriculture or food value chains. So one issue uh, why we don't have uh, enough uh, empirical evidence so far for the global value chains in agriculture stuff, um, that, that's, that basically come from the um, that I think there is two issue. One issue is that data limitation. So, so far, we do have global value chains data, not only for the agriculture, but all, the, all other industry at the country by industry level. So we do have 27 or 26 industries and then by country. And then uh, that country includes about over like 180 countries, but agriculture and food industry only capture two industries. Okay, number four or number one. <laughs> so that, that's one of the limitations why we cannot uh, dig into the global value chains and more like product level using some HS code. So that's a really good idea. We might want to mention about why we do have that type of like limitation in global value chain stuff for the future research, right? At the same time, um, uh, as a... Uh, uh, the tra in the trade session, they, the authors also mentioned about the global value chains a little bit. The issue is that the, there are supply chain economists in agricultural economics or agribusiness, but at the same time, global value chains is kind of like a um, combination between trade and then supply chain. So technically, there are not many people who are working on this part. So in our chapter, I got an idea that we might want to mention about the future direction in the agriculture and uh, food value chains in uh, in global value chains. So I think that's a really good point from your comments. Thank you. So we have some time uh, for questions from the audience. If uh, if you have a question or comment, I should say, uh, feel free to use the raise hand feature, and we, I will call on you. Okay, Zoe. <laughs> Hi, um, I, I was gonna let other people speak first because I actually missed the presentation itself. So I don't wanna, I, I saw Hope's, Hope's comments, I had a conflict. Uh, quick mention though, so Alan Love's um, comment earlier in the session today um, in the first, on the first presentation was about kind of what is the boundaries of a market for market concentration. And I don't know if this is something you covered, but as I, you know, as somebody in the US ag space who considers myself working on very similar topics, again, wanting to help bridge this gap from the US side, I think about what are the boundaries of a value chain when we study it. So I don't know if that's something you're already covering, um, but setting the boundaries, right, as we have these value chains where, you know, somebody already said like, okay, you start with an apple, right, and then you go in all these different directions, where, where are the boundaries of it? Is it defined by, you know, depending on whose perspective you take, whether it's from the that you know, meso level and you're thinking about centering processing or it's at the consumer level and you're thinking about centering the consumer, you could think about the boundaries of that value chain very differently. So um, that's something that uh, I, I would be very interested to read um, your, and, and learn your kind of ideas about that if they're not already covered. Thank you, Zoe. Um, we certainly spend some time talking about Coase's theory of the firm and, you know, why, why, is, why is all stuff in the world not produced by a single firm? But uh, it's, I think it's worth 
relating that to what you're asking what are you know where do we where do we draw a line in terms of what's in the value chain and what's not because when i uh, so um so jeff kind of started working on the draft and then i i worked on it afterwards and i was surprised to be honest that jeff had included the zeroth stage of the value chain which is input markets and technology i thought oh we're going to start at the farm gate that's as, it's as simple as that but now you know in retrospect i was like oh yeah i guess that's also part of the value chain but it, but it does bring into, it does highlight what, what you're asking, right? Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Very good. Um, As we don't see any, then I, uh, I think we can be safe in taking another break and uh, reconvening at the top of the hour. Uh, I'd like to thank all the authors as well as, uh, as, well as Hope. I think uh, this is a great, great session, great hour. Thank you both. Thank you, Hope. Thank you. Thanks, Hope. Thank you, Hope. Great job, all of you. Thanks. Really enjoyed it.
Okay, it is uh, two o'clock, so we probably ought to get started again. Um, welcome back. This hour, we'll be hearing first from uh, Jesse Tak and Ji Sung Yu from Kansas State University. They'll be talking to us about risk management in agricultural production. I will turn the time over to you for the, the first 25 minutes. Great. Thank you, David. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Um, this has been a really fun project to work on. Uh, Ji Song and I have, uh, we joined the department uh, at the same time, I think four or five years ago. Uh, and, and I guess a subtitle of this talk could be uh, Coffee Talk with, with Ji Song and Jesse. Ji Song teaches an, an undergraduate risk class. I teach a graduate level production class. And the sort of topics that we're going to be talking about today are things that, that we're talking about all the time. Um, so it was really fun to sort of formalize that and, and put down some thoughts on this literature, uh, where it is, how we got here, where, where it could go. Um, I forgot to mention that Stanley Kubrick was a, a, an unlisted co-author on this presentation. So we can talk about very big, fun things like what, would it, what it was like in the beginning. Uh, there was chaos and then there was microeconomics and we learned about sort of marginal decision making, equating benefits and costs. And as we all remember from our, from our PhD, production is always just an afterthought of consumer theory. And we get a little bit insecure about that. So we have our own terminology. Uh, our marginal benefit is the value of the marginal product and our marginal cost is, is a marginal factor cost. So what we're beginning to see is this appreciation for a production function that's entering into uh, the decision-making environment. Uh, we know from production in, in ag that there's risk and we acknowledge that typically by, by saying that there's some inputs committed to production, production is stochastic and we might make some decisions based off of some expectation. So when we first started, started acknowledging risk, we tried to make it really simple. We said, we'll just take an expectation. And that was sort of quickly pushed aside. Uh, and, and in favor of that sort of, there was this, uh, this, this, this incorporation of risk attitudes. All right, so uh, there's two important points here. Uh, marginal utilities, they're exchange rates. They get us from dollars to utility. And the cool thing about marginal utility as an exchange rate is that it's stochastic in the future. I don't know how I'm gonna convert a dollar into utility at the end of the production process. It's going to uh, be dependent on some state variable, how, how wealthy I am, sort of um, where I am at the end of the period. So you have this cool optimal decision theory as a baseline. And it's pretty powerful. It says that you need to think about risk and, and agricultural production together. And not only that, there's parameters associated with each of these things uh, distinctly from each other. So we can have some beta parameters that can capture risk attitudes and we can have some alpha parameters that capture essentially production relationships. And uh, it's, it's these things together that, that define sort of optimal decision-making in this context. And uh, this was sort of a big step in the literature and, and the literature stayed here for a long time. The recognition that, that there was two sets of parameters and they needed to be sort of jointly identified or estimated really gave birth to these, these fantastic sort of structural models. And, and here when I'm talking about a structural model, it's sort of very narrow version of structural econometrics where you have some theory you, uh, you, you get some first, maybe you manipulate some first order conditions, you get to a sort of a structural relationship and then you append an error term to it and you take it to the data, all right? So the decision theory was driving the econometric specification. There was a very sort of tight uh, linkage between those two things. And then, uh, you know, this, this literature was largely published in sort of the later part of the 2000s, which we know how publication lags are. These ideas probably started creeping into the profession, uh, at least around the 2000s, if not earlier, um, sort of concerns that you can't estimate risk attitudes and uh, production parameters at the same time. There just wasn't sort of enough sources of variation. There wasn't enough variation in the underlying data. We sort of didn't have en good enough techniques to, to do both of these things. And so that's like, if you picture an airplane flying, that would be like an engine going out. The, engine, the airplane can still fly, 
uh, and maybe it could make it to its destination, but if there's a nice runway nearby, it, it's probably gonna land. And so this was coinciding with, with these panel data approaches that were really gaining popularity uh, in the 2000s. Panel data wasn't new in the 2000s, but it was becoming uh, more common. People were maybe expressing more of an interest in using these sorts of techniques in the literature. And it was powerful. The idea that you didn't have to specify a utility function, but you could leverage a panel to control for risk attitudes was really powerful. Uh, the idea that you could control for prices using a different dimension of fixed effects was, was really powerful. I remember sitting in a seminar 2005-ish and someone was presenting a demand paper. And I kept looking for that price variable on the right-hand side because I had taken a lot of classes and all the classes told me that that demand function better have prices on the right-hand side or it's, it's ill-defined. And the presenter said, well, they're sort of there. I'm controlling for them with, with certain dimensions of fixed effects. And, and that was sort of mind, that was mind blowing, at least to me at the time. And I think a lot of people in the profession it was. Um, and it really wasn't, it wasn't that long ago. Um, so this is sort of a, a, a new-ish idea, depending on, on sort of how long of a memory leg you think is acceptable for defining new. Um, the other thing that's going on is you've got Woldridge's textbook, uh, Econometric Analysis of Cross-Section and Panel Data. Uh, everyone's very excited that he is on Twitter now. Uh, hashtag metrics to the face is awesome. If you're not following that, do it. You'll love it. Um, his, his simple sort of distinction between different sources of unobserved heterogeneity, the difference between a random effect and a fixed effect, it was an important piece of communication. It really led to uh, the popularity of, of some of these panel data models. Uh, you have Freakonomics, which wouldn't be freaky today, right? The identification approaches in that book are normal now, but they were weird. And that's why the book was called Freakonomics. Uh, Hito Imbens and, and Woldridge do a What's New in Econometrics MBR Summer School. If you haven't checked this out, the, the lecture notes are online. Uh, they're amazing, uh, mostly harmless. Uh, these were all sort of things that ushered in what you could generally call sort of a reduced form approach to empirical estimation. Uh, and we could argue all day about what reduced form is, but there's sort of this movement to like a single parameter, single equation empirical framework. Uh, th probably the new big one uh, that a lot of people are talking about, causal mixtape. Uh, I haven't read the whole book, but one thing that I love about it are these structural uh, DAGs, right? So you have, to, you have to specify where the causal relationships are. And if you sort of think about this for two seconds, it's really a theoretical model. I mean, you're not writing down a, a producer optimization problem, but you are outlining the various mechanisms that a lot of variables might be related to each other. And you can't, you can't do this in unless you have an appreciation for theory. You can't write down a good DAG unless you have an appreciation for the underlying theory. And so you might not be leveraging it to do a, a sort of a structural econometric approach, but I think this is sort of an indication that this sort of combination of, of, of maybe reduced form and, and theory and structure might be sort of bouncing back. We're thinking about how to marry these two things together. Um, the literature sort of lurches towards single equation, single parameter empirical approaches. I don't want to get too crazy with this, but you know, a lot of different identification approaches start gaining in popularity. We really get interested in sort of how much we can leverage different identification approaches or estimators to learn different things about sort of a focused set of parameters that we might be interested in. Uh, this is sort of meant to be an expansion path You've got structural papers here, reduced form papers, and we can sort of, we all have our opinion. I bet if you ask 10 people in this audience, everyone would sort of place what the mix was in the literature differently. But I think in general, people would agree that there's been this sort of movement toward reduced form away from structural. Uh, where are we now? Is this gonna continue to happen? Have we sort of bottomed out and it's, and it's coming back? I think these are all sort of interesting questions uh, but one thing I, I do think is important to recognize is that this movement away from holistic structural modeling has led to a literature that 
that sort of Jisong and I think of as fractured. It's not really a tightly defined term, but um, you have really deep sort of corners of the literature that are focused on, on sort of singular relationships. You might be interested in a single parameter in a production function rather than sort of estimating and reporting a, a matrix of parameters for some supply relationship. And so if you're, if you're sort of engaging with the literature for the first time now, as, as a lot of young researchers are, we sort of worry that there might be this thought that, that the theory isn't an important part of the empirical framework, um, that there isn't sort of this holistic uh, view of, of what's going on in the broader picture, uh, just a very specific relationship. And, and I think one of the observations that, that might be sort of suggestive evidence of this is, is we see a lot of young researchers really struggling to, to motivate their research more broadly. Uh, one of the hardest things to figure out is how the specific research question that you're going after is, is sort of nested within a, a broader literature. Um, so one of the things that, that we wanted to uh, sort of accomplish with this presentation or this chapter is to sort of point out the ways in which these, this fragmented literature is related to each other. And, and we sort of thought that, that a theoretical model, sort of a real toy stylized, stripped down theoretical model might help do that. All right, so here's my great nursery rhyme. Uh, it's an er English nursery rhyme, I think. So I don't know if it has some of the Germanic nursery rhymes, darker undertones. Uh, if so, I apologize. Uh, but this is sort of structural econometrics, right? Everything's going well. People are very proud of the fact that they're jointly estimating things and they should be because that's a very powerful thing to do. And, and sort of the concern creeps in. Uh, maybe this isn't quite so easy and the, the approach largely sort of falls off or, or isn't as popular as it once was. And we are scientists and you have to find a way to get a far side cartoon into any presentation. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how to sort of marry all these pieces in the literature back together again. So if we think specifically about ag production and risk, uh, uh, we, we can think of the different sort of main elements as, as that production function, uh, marketing, right? The effect, the, the extent to which I can affect the price that I receive for my output. Uh, Off-farm activities have really gained important literature, especially if you think about labor. Uh, sharecropping is sort of this idea that you can move some of your acreage, quote unquote, off-farm, someone else produces it. Um, crop insurance is something that we're seeing blowing up uh, everywhere globally, uh, different forms that crop insurance might take, how it sort of interacts with all these on-farm decision makings, and that utility function, that great aggregator, right? A lot of decisions get made on farm and you sort of need to index all those decisions. And a lot of really interesting stuff going on with how we should specify utility functions, prospect theory, generalizations of expected utility theory, risk, risk preference heterogeneity, uh, a lot of stuff. But these literatures are largely sort of independent of each other. Um, and so one of the things that, that we want to do is sort of motivate a structural model and, and talk about the opportunities that producers have to generate income in a structural setting to show how all these things could be related to each other. So if you look at sort of the production area of the literature, you've got conventional inputs, fertilizer, that sort of thing. Uh, damage function models are really cool pesticides, uh, pesticide use, that sort of thing. Abiotic stress has blown up, right? Climate change concerns, temperature effects, precipitation effects, how you might actually endogenize uh, the effects of these different stress variables. Diversification on farm with different outputs, cover crops, that sort of thing. And of course, technology adoption uh, has been a huge one. GMOs, uh, uh, improved sort of seed varieties, that sort of thing. Over on the marketing side, it's, it's a separate but no less important question. There's price volatility and that affects decision making on farm. And there's different methods by which a producer can sort of change the ex post distribution of prices uh, that they face. They can do some contracting, some hedging, uh, some storage, either on farm or off. Uh, off farm activities, land rental, sort of the sharecropping fixed rent question, off farm labor, fringe benefits, that sort of thing. Uh, and then financial investment. This is something that's that's a lot of times overlooked in the literature, but 
every single day, the opportunity cost of farming is selling the farm and putting that money sort of in the stock market or some other non-agricultural investment. So what does that margin sort of look like? Uh, when we talk about crop insurance, there's going to be an indemnity function sort of in this wealth generation process. Design and rating of crop insurance has been huge. The demand for crop insurance, what does that price elasticity looks like? And then also sort of the feedback, uh, sort of quote unquote moral hazard effects uh, that you get when, uh, when you introduce crop insurance into uh, the decision framework. And all of this gets indexed, all right? So this is all different ways that producers can generate some wealth or some, some revenues and that ultimately gets indexed into a utility function. And we have lots of questions about utility functions. What is the specific measure that should go in here? Consumption, expenditures, wealth, that sort of thing. Uh, how should it be parameterized? What sort of functional form should we be looking at? Going beyond expected utility theory, so generalizing it. And, and sort of one of the, the real specific ways that it's been generalized is in these uh, prospect theory sort of models. And we've seen a lot of applications thereof in the literature. So this is largely the, the structure of our chapter. We've got these five different sort of main sections, and then we've got these individual subsections, just as we outlined here. The idea is holistically, these are all sort of different ways that the individual can generate wealth. And then down here, we sort of have a way that that wealth gets sort of indexed uh, in order for decisions to be, to be made. Um, how to structure these subsections? The idea is that these can all stand alone, right? So if you have a student that comes into your office and is interested in on-farm diversification and the effects on risk or uh, how risk drives the desire to uh, diversify on-farm outputs. The idea is here that this chapter is going to provide through each subsection a conceptual framework a general sense of active research closely related to that question, sort of a paragraph or two summarizing the literature, a lot of specific examples of research in the literature, and then some thoughts on where they think, uh, where, where we think uh, are some potential areas for this research to head. All right, so this is really a guiding principle of our chapter. A student walks in, they're interested in a research question, uh, within this chapter, we've got a conceptual framework, a summary of the literature, uh, specific discussion of papers, and, and some ideas on, on where this literature might be headed. Uh, 18 subsections, each one can be thought of as a branch. Like I said before, we've got a tweak of a stylized model. So we're going to use sort of a theoretical structural model, but we're going to really strip it down. All right, it's going to be a simple, simplified version of the types of models that were in the literature and have been in the literature. Uh, but we're going to really simplify it and then show you how tweaking it can be used to, to model all these various subsections. So the same theoretical model, toy model, is going to exist throughout here. And each subsection is going to have a tiny little tweak thereof that can be used to generate a conceptual framework. Right, it's not meant to be totally nuanced and 100% realistic, but it's at least some sort of conceptual framework that that young research can researchers can sort of leverage to start thinking about uh, some of the questions that they're interested in. All right, so we got this fractured literature. Uh, the goal of our theoretical model is really to tie everything together. It's our roadmap. It's the way that shows that these are all just different parts of the same decision-making process and there is some unification uh, among them. Uh, the specific model we use, this is, uh, this is just sort of one of those models that I think went a little bit under the radar. Uh, it was published in the Journal of Econometrics. It really uh, provided some, some good econometric insights into how to estimate uh, some of these on-farm decision models. One of the things it didn't do is, is sort of show how other tweaks to this model could be uh, uh, applied in very on tech. So our goal here is not to reinvent the wheel. There's great models out there. We want to strip one down and then show you how little tweaks thereof to it can be used to, to sort of think about conceptually a lot of different areas and sort of the risk uh, production nexus. All right, so what does this model look like? You really want to ignore this part. This is just a Bellman equation and the individual, the producer is interested in maximizing sort of total uh, utility over time. 
and it's a recursive model. What, where all the action is, is in these constraints. So through this initial wealth constraint, you're gonna define what sort of activities the producer is gonna be allocating their wealth across. So here we're indexing uh, sort of all activities through some consumption expenditure here, and that's what generates utility. Uh, if you don't like consumption expenditures, you can think of this as a dividend paid to the owners of the farm. If it's an LLC, this could be dividend split across multiple owners. This is just some residual claim on wealth that generates uh, utility for the decision maker. So there's sort of an initial period where you spread your wealth across different activities and it's going to do If you invest in land, you're going to get some capital gain associated with that land. And that land can also be used in combination with inputs to generate some output, which is going to be stochastic and you can take it and sell it for price PT plus one. All right, so a real simple model where there's a land and a variable input. Uh, if you manipulate the first order conditions, you sort of get these asset pricing equations. All right, so it doesn't look like sort of neoclassical production economics right away. You've got two pieces. One is the stochastic discount factor. This just tells me how I'm willing to exchange wealth at the margin or utility uh, at the margin across different time periods. All right, and then we've got a return on our farm operations. Our total outlay is our land and our variable input and our payoff from those activities is gonna be some appreciation of the assets itself, plus some dividend in the term, in the, in, in the uh, sort of measure of agricultural revenues. All right, so it looks a little bit different than sort of your classic dis, uh, decision theoretic models, but it really is the same. If you go back to this relationship between uh, risk and value of marginal product and the marginal factor costs, and you just divide both sides by this term on the right-hand side, you're going to get the exact same relationship. All right, you're going to get a stochastic discount factor and some payoff relative to some investment. So it really is just sort of classic microeconomics in disguise, even if it's sort of arriving in the form of, of what we might think of as sort of a classic like asset pricing model. All right, so every single section is going to have a little tweak of that model and then we're going to talk about the literature and some specific papers. So that first section is going to be all about the production function. We're distinguishing between three different types of inputs or factors. Uh, we can talk about the effect that risk has on, on things like production output and diversification, uh, technology adoption. I'm not going to go through every single subsection but to sort of give you a flavor for, for what these things look like. If we look at sort of standard factors of production, we're ignoring land here. If we manipulate that first order c condition, again, we're getting just a very classic relationship. Marginal factor cost, value of the marginal product, risk means we don't equate these things perfectly, but there's gonna be some shifting variable that's gonna move around the value of the marginal product curve. Uh, if you wanna get really deep into it, you can start thinking about how the risk associated with the production shock is going to change the covariance between these two things. And you know, under some pretty weak assumptions, this model is gonna show you that an increase in production risk is gonna indeed shift that, that value of the marginal product to the left, and it's gonna reduce that, that arm farm investment. Sort of again, just sort of a classic neoclassical uh, result that, that we see in production economics all the time. All right, so where's this literature been? Uh, relationship between input levels and output variability input risk, availability of different inputs, right? Labor availability can be thought of as a stochastic variable, or you might have some uncertainty associated with sort of classical inputs, right? How much of that fertilizer is gonna leach uh, out or, or actually be effective in the, uh, in the production process. And then we're seeing some literature on sharing factors, uh, machinery across producers to, to reduce risk. When we talk about biotic factors of production, there's sort of these damage abatement functions that have been around for a long time. We've got this pesticide application Z. It's going to enter the production function through a damage abatement function. We can still get back to the same relationship when we use both of these uh, first order conditions together, where we've got sort of this one equation rules them all. Here, the only thing that's changing is that rate of return or that return for, uh, for the farm activities. Here, the literature is focused on some non-traditional drivers of demand for damage control agents. 
Uh, difficulty in regionally coordinating pest management efforts has been a big deal. A lot of externalities involved there. And then some biosafety measures in, uh, in livestock production systems. Uh, abiotic factors, this idea that you can't control the weather, but you can control how the weather affects you. Irrigation is a great example. Uh, here I've got some irrigation water that I can apply in my production process. I'm going to pull precipitation out of the production shock, and I'm not going to manipulate the occurrence of precipitation itself, but I can affect the way that it impacts my production, right? So if I apply water at the right time, I can really mitigate the damage of, of sort of low production or low precipitation outcomes. All right, so this parameter in some sense gets endogenous in this framework through a manipulation of an input variable. Again, we've got sort of this, this overarching relationship. The only thing that's changing here again is that return to, uh, to farming activities. Recent literature has focused on ability of irrigation to reduce effects of weather-based risk, uh, securing water access and improving water use efficiency. Irrigation by itself is just metal and it sits there. Uh, if you don't have water to run through it, it's not going to be uh, very helpful. And if you do have some water to run through it, you might be really interested in applying it sort of an efficient uh, way. Uh, seed development, novel drought seed varieties, uh, effects on adoption has been, uh, has been a big area in the literature. Production diversification. One of the cool things about this model uh, is you can embed sort of traditional duality functions. So before we've been representing production with a production function, you could just as easily do it with a cost function where your decision variables are those production targets over a couple different outputs. And then you realize production sort of ex post with these production shocks. Uh, again, you're going to get back to that, that one condition rules them all. The only thing that's changing here is that return to, uh, to farmland. Uh, some contributions here, drivers of crop diversification and some on-farm effects thereof. Dimensions of risk and effects at extensive and intensive margins, and then the extent to which risk gets capitalized into, uh, into land values. Technology adoption is a fun one, but we'll skip over it. Uh, the general idea is that you can endogenize the parameters of a production function, right? So when I select GMO, I am selecting how pesticides and herbicides affect my production output. It actually endogenizes those parameters of the production technology. Uh, On-farm marketing, uh, we can talk about price volatility and forecasting, ways to reduce price volatility sort of ex post that's faced by the decision maker, contracting, hedging with futures, storage. Uh, these can all sort of be thought of as various tweaks on the model. Uh, if we ignore production risk for a second and put the risk on the price side of things, we're still going to get the same relationship between the value of the marginal product and the marginal factor. So that risk exposure through the pricing side of things still has the effect to change the value of the marginal product and thus those uh, optimal input levels. Recent contributions, quantifying dimensions of price variability across space and time, heterogeneous effects of price risk across farms, uh, some stochastic effects of quality on received prices. Uh, when we think about contracting, there's typically a, a target alpha here, which we endogenize and uh, delivery of alpha will get you sort of a fixed and deterministic price, but there still is some residual price exposure, right? So if you don't hit your production target, you're going to have to go buy some output on the, on the spot market, or if you uh, overproduce, you get to uh, uh, sell that in excess of the contract. Uh, we can work that into our our wealth constraints here. And again, we're getting a similar relationship. Uh, the only things that are changing here are those payoff functions, uh, contributions in the literature, drivers of contracting and on-farm effects thereof, uh, expansions of theoretical modeling for contract negotiations, important role of local, local organizations such as cooperatives in terms of sort of facilitating some of these uh, price risk decisions. Hedging with futures is, is a topic that's been in the literature for a while. Storage as well, we're accommodating those. Off-farm investment. Uh, the first two are really certain assets moving off-farm. I could move some of my land off-farm, I could move some of my labor off-farm, or I can sort of keep my assets off-farm and move some of my investment off-farm. 
These are gonna generate sort of excess return arbitrage conditions in a similar way. Uh, all of them sort of together are gonna generate sort of this margin of the on and off farm relationship. Uh, agricultural insurance, we can build in uh, a premium into our initial wealth allocation and then we've got some indemnity functions. Uh, if we talk about designing and rating contracts, we're talking about specification of these indemnity functions. Insurance design focuses on the indemnity function, which variables enter and how the payment gets triggered. And then usually when we talk about rating, we're talking about some sort of rating in, in an actuarially fair uh, manner. Introducing crop insurance is gonna have a, a, a feedback effect on the input decision. So what we call the moral hazard effect, uh, as I make different choices over my uh, insurance product, there's likely to be some feedback effect on my input decisions, right? So in the literature, we see some stuff on scale and scope of moral hazard. Uh, index insurance has been a huge topic because of its potential elimination of the moral hazard effect and low program costs, effects of insurance on land use and, and technology adoption, sort of these uh, combined effects. Last section, decision theories, measurement, estimation. Um, sort of the interesting innovations here have to do with the specification of expected utility. So if we think through a two period version of the model, this expectation of utility in the second period is a key component of decision making. And you can think of this in terms of sort of a classical uh, expected utility, or you can start thinking about some generalizations thereof. There might be some manipulations on the probabilities, there might be weightings of certain outcomes, and there might be some reference points. Uh, that are introduced uh, in which it, largely the, the utility is being transformed from levels into gains and losses. By far prospect theory has been the big area of application. Uh, we've seen a lot of applications in ag econ, uh, ag production and risk in this context. Prospect theory, uh, some of the results have emphasized that it can predict producer behavior better than expected utility. Uh, some evidence of loss aversion, especially with regard to weighting small, overweighting small probabilities. And then this idea that these reference points for converting levels of utility into gains and losses can really matter, especially in a marketing decision context. So thank you uh, a lot for your time and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesse um, and Jisung. Uh, we will turn the time now over to Jean-Paul Chavez from University of Wisconsin for discussion. Hey. Great. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. You can hear me, yeah? Okay. Yes. Uh, great topic, and uh, risk management in ag production. I mean, this is a topic that is not new, but uh, the recent uh, event makes it even more important. Uh, agricultural production is risky. With climate change, it's even riskier. And uh, the job of agriculture is to provide food and in a reliable manner, and it has to be available to us, everybody in the world in a timely manner, it's quite difficult. And uh, so those issues have, have been around, they are, they are uh, valid today more than, more than ever. And uh, so great topic, and uh, so good time to think about uh, where we are and much progress we have made. Uh, and the, the the paper by, uh, by Jesse and uh, J. Sang did a great job of basically serving the literature on those topics over the last 15 years. So this is, this is uh, one thing that's, that's very well done and trying to uh, keep up with, uh, with the more recent work. Uh, the coverage of the, of the paper is very good, covers basically production risk, uh, role of technology, uh, price risk, uh, and then some of the management option, hedging, uh, all of diversification, on farm, off farm, uh, all of insurance. Uh, so these are all important topics and there's been research done and all of that. So the, the coverage of, of the paper is, is, is great. Um, so that's uh, things I like about the paper. Uh, one, I'll make some suggestions on uh, the, the, the paper. Uh, it's still in very rough form. So again, this uh, uh, reads like a first draft. And uh, uh, this, at this point, uh, it's not very well written. And I'd like to make, 
make some suggestions on, on what, what to do better. Uh, the, that's a matter of taste of uh, who is your target audience. Now it seems to be written targeting toward graduate students. Uh, I like to think about the uh, broader audience that uh, look at uh, people who are interested in academic knowledge and uh, the economics of, 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 uh, of agriculture and, and risk. Uh, and uh, so there are some technical arguments, but this is a big issue. And, uh, and again, farmers are interested in that and they are not graduate students. Policymakers are interested in that, they are not graduate students. And uh, so uh, talking to some of the technical details of how we do things is, is important when you do research, but uh, keeping in mind why those issues are important, I think is, is, is crucial. And I like to see, uh, that's my own, my own bias. I like to see uh, uh, a stronger academic uh, uh, content, I guess, rather than uh, trying to reach out to, to graduate students, which is clearly part of the audience, but only part of it. Um, the, this is a rough draft. So um, uh, I think many equations don't have a number yet. So this makes it difficult to read. Uh, Having equations in the introduction, uh, probably not a good idea. The introduction should be motivating the paper and providing an overview of what you do. And uh, you can leave that for the next, the, the next section, not the introduction. So the, presenting a model in the introduction, uh, probably you can, you can fix that. Um, and uh, going through, you present one model and then uh, you end up repeating that model, uh, applying it to, to different contexts. Uh, that gets to be very repetitive. So your argument is you want to allow each section of your paper to be self-standing, but uh, when you read the whole thing, the repetitions get to be tedious. And uh, I, I suspect readers can read the whole thing and, uh, and you can cut back on some of the repetitions. So uh, the other issue is you start from a, a model, it's your toy model, and uh, it allows you to present some arguments that, that is nice, but uh, it constrains you in, in some way that becomes problematic as, as you go through the rest of the paper. You focus on the expected utility model, and then at the end you say, well, there might be something wrong with the expected utility models. Uh, well, uh, then, then why start from the expected utility model if it's, if it's not quite appropriate? Uh, so the other one is you start from a simple model where there are two sources of risk, price risk and production risk. So these are both relevant in agriculture. Um, and uh, one thing you do is you assume uh, production risk shows up in multiplicative form. And uh, actually, I think that's probably not a very good idea. And it goes back, that has been in the literature for some time. There is the famous paper by Justin Pope that show that uh, multiplicative uh, production uncertainty basically implicitly assumes that uh, all inputs are risk increasing. And I don't think we want to assume that. Uh, that might be true under some scenarios, but this is not, not a more general way of approaching the problem. And there are some inputs that are risk decreasing. And again, we can think about irrigation as being one of those and uh, assuming multiplicative production uncertainty, I think puts you in a straight jacket and you try to squeeze out of it as you go through the paper, but uh, I, I, I find it difficult. And this is, to me, this is too restrictive. So uh, the, what you get out of it is you get simple analytical results, production risk and, and the price risk are multiplicative and you can treat them as one random variable and it's simple, simpler to get analytical results and you do that. But, it's not particularly realistic. And in some cases, I think it's missing some important aspect of the problem. Um, so that's, uh, these are your, your toy model. I find it uh, a bit too constraining. And, uh, and as you try to, to, to tweak it, to represent different models, uh, it, uh, it, it becomes a bit problematic. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a place where if you want to start from a general model, I would suggest you try to start from a model with representing a certainty equivalent. 
uh, that could apply to any of the models, actually. It could apply to the expected utility model. It could apply to prospect theory. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, you, you will get your marginal conditions uh, that look, look similar. But uh, one thing that uh, I was surprised is, uh, well, two comments, is your, your toy model as well applies for a commercial farm. And this is the farm that produces agricultural output and sells it. And then there is a consumption good, but the consumption good has nothing to do with, what, with what's being produced. That's what happens in commercial farms. And uh, if you want to broaden your audience, I think you want to present a model that allows for farms in developing countries where the farmers produce the food and they are going to be eating uh, a large part of the, what they are being producing. So the subsistence farms in developing countries, your model actually does not represent that. And, uh, and of course, uh, the role of markets in that case becomes quite different. If you produce for your own consumption, the role of market is not quite as strong. But then this is the argument about the role of marketable surplus. And in your case, everything is marketed. So for a commercial farm, it's appropriate. You might think about broadening your approach to, to allow for farmers in developing countries and uh, they, might, they might produce for the market, but they might produce for their own consumption. And when they produce for their own consumption, this raises the issues of basically food insecurity. And in developing countries, it's a very big issue. And uh, that actually, by focusing on a commercial farm, uh, food insecurity never shows up uh, because you, you have farmers that produce for the markets and then they consume something else. Uh, so the, the, the risk and the consumption side is, is missed. And in commercial farms in developed countries, this is okay, but this is not what you find in developing countries. And uh, so you might, you might think about that. Uh, the other one is I was surprised that actually you never discuss risk aversion. And that needs to be in your paper. Uh, there is no way you can discuss the role of risk without saying that, well, people actually don't like risk. If people like risk or if everybody was risk neutral, then actually you wouldn't have a paper. So risk aversion has to be an important part of the story and it kind of creeps up here and there, and, uh, but uh, it needs to be treated more explicitly. And uh, actually that's a big issue because risk preferences actually play a role and most people are risk averse, but the nature of risk aversion varies across individuals. And I think you need to sp spend some time discussing that. And then the nature of risk preferences matter in more complicated ways. Most people care about risk, they're risk averse, but actually they care about losses a lot more than gains. And that has been in the literature for, forever. And you miss that in your, in your review. I mean, it shows up in a few, few places. This is actually fundamental argument of risk. Uh, people don't, don't mind again gaining. They worry a lot about losing. And, uh, and loss aversion is a big part of it. And, uh, and it shows up in a number of ways, but there has been extensive amount of, of argument along those lines and that needs to be reviewed in your, in your paper, that needs to be discussed. So uh, documenting that is not easy, and, but uh, there has been some great work done along those lines and uh, the paper by Ben Swanger uh, uh, doing experiment in, uh, in India again, I think is a classic and you, you need to cite it. And the argument is most people are risk averse. Most people exhibit decreasing absolute risk aversion. Most people are downside risk averse. They worry about, about uh, losing uh, losses. And uh, again, uh, this is the place where actually uh, decreasing absolute risk aversion seems to be very common. And that means their wealth effect. And, uh, and this is an issue that at some point, if you are wealthier or not so wealthy, actually your, your, uh, how much you are going to be worrying about risk might matter. Uh, this can be important. And, uh, and again, the, the wealth can matter and in, in ways and that's worth discussing. So the argument is actually, uh, if uh, poor individual, poor farmers worry about risk more than rich farmers, then actually they are going to be reacting to risk more than, than rich farmers. There could be some differences in behavior. And that's worth, that's worth uh, thinking about. And there has been a bit of work done on that, but uh, in a sense, it's worth thinking about. And then that shows up on the policy side when you start uh, having policy interventions and actually those wealth effects start kicking in 
So this is important both from, from uh, viewpoint of understanding behavior, from the viewpoint of understanding our changes uh, according to uh, different, different individuals. And uh, it depends on, uh, on the, 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 the income context and the, and the policy context as well. Uh, so the other things is risk preferences is difficult to evaluate. Uh, the best way to do it is for experiments. So uh, again, Ben Swanger is, uh, was classic along those lines. Uh, if you want to do it indirectly, more difficult. And again, that's one of the issues. So, well, actually, we moved back from doing structural analysis because of those identification issues. Yep, that's true. Uh, but it doesn't mean the problem is not there. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying to figure out what's going on. And we need to have information on the nature of risk preferences. The problem is that very across individuals. And just knowing that uh, marginal value product equal, equal input, input price, the marginal value product actually there is going to be the role of risk preferences and if they vary across individuals, actually that's difficult. And economists are not very good at that. And, uh, and the argument is uh, because we are not very good at that, actually our, our work has not been very useful and we've been struggling with that and we've not made a lot of progress. So this is something worth discussing because this is a significant challenge to the current literature. And there's been progress made, but I guess progress is, has been slow and identifying where we need to make more progress is, is, is one thing I think you can do better. Uh, so a um, couple of other things. Risk, uh, I mentioned risk preferences. You need to spend more time talking about risk assessment. And you basically, almost throughout your, your discussion, assume that you are going to be assessing risk using probability. And, uh, and of course, uh, that's what most people do when we do empirical analysis. Uh, well, uh, that can be some problems along those lines. Uh, probability is a construct of, of mathematicians and statisticians, and economists have been borrowing it. Go and talk to some farmers in developing country and talk about probability. They will not know what you are talking about and they make decisions on the risk. So the argument is we impose a probability structure on risk for our convenience, but uh, actually decisions are being made. And one of the question is actually, how do people evaluate risk? And, uh, and there is the story about ambiguity is, is on the rise. I mean, this is the Esberg paradox. People have a tough time figuring out what those probabilities are. And sometimes they react to probabilities in different ways. So ambiguity aversion has been, has been, has been saying, hey, there is something else going on. And uh, the question is, uh, well, if actually assessing probability is difficult, uh, why do we keep on relying on probabilities? And uh, so, uh, this is actually the challenge that's being raised by the ambiguity aversion story. And, uh, and, and one solution is, well, we shouldn't give up on probability. So we'll have probability of probabilities when we're not sure what the probabilities are. This is a Cleveland of uh, argument. Well, uh, nice theory, uh, empirically, actually, I think this is a bit problematic. Uh, some people make assess what the risk exposure is in that case, it would be called uncertainty or ambiguity. And, uh, and there is research being done on the world of ambiguity and it seems to be important. And we have not quite figured out what's going on there. And uh, so there is a long way to go. The problem is most of empirical work keep on relying on situations where probability assessment are easy. And we assume that uh, this is something we can use and that's going to provide an accurate representation of, of risk or uncertainty. And uh, the answer is, it's not always true. Psychologists have been documenting basically all kinds of biases and how individuals evaluate risk and uncertainty. And this is part of those difficulties. And I want to mention another point is uh, when we talk about climate change, uh, when we talk about downside risk aversion, downside risk aversion is being exposed to adverse risk. They are going to be risk in the lower tail of the distribution. But those risks actually are rare events. And the question is, how do you assess the probability of rare events? Where are the sample information? By definition, rare events has very little sample information. So when we start thinking about climate change, for example, there could be some very bad thing that might happen to us in terms of the, the impact on agricultural productivity. How are we going to be assessing that? And that's very hard. 
and uh, and saying, well, we are going to rely on probability assessment. I said, well, where did you get those probabilities? Where are the where are the evidence? And uh, so the argument is, well, without evidence, we can make up numbers, and this is the place where actually we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We 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 are in the situation where our, our risk assessment is so weak that at some point we, we have scenarios. And which scenario you want to pick is kind of up to you. And we don't have evidence to support which scenario is the correct one. Yet, decision makers are, are facing those situations all the time. So this is just pointing out that there are significant challenges related to uh, risk assessment or, or uncertainty assessment. And that's one place where we're making progress as well, but it has been slow. And this is one of the reasons why actually progress has, has not moved fur further, further along because the risk assessment or the uncertainty assessment and the preferences over the risk and uh, uncertainty assessment are difficult. What makes it even worse is those risks are typically individual specific. You pick one farmer that's faced part to particular kind of, of risk uh, could be pest damages. Uh, the farmers next door might have different uh, pest damages and the risk of being affected would vary from, from one farmer to another. So not only is it difficult to do, it varies across space, it varies across time. Ooh, this is really hard. And uh, so at some point, I think you need to mention those challenges. Uh, the reason why those issues are important, we're making progress. Progress, I think, has been slow, and it has been slow by the difficulty of making those issues empirically tractable. And those issues are important. We need to get better at it. So you should use your paper as a, as a way of motivating people toward addressing those issues and make progress faster than what we have in the past. So I, I, I'd stop here. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Um... Very good. We have a few uh, audience members who have comments or questions. Let's start with Mark. Yes, thank you, David. Um, thank you, Jesse, for this entertaining presentation. Jean-Paul, again, those comments were really cool um, in what, what I've come to expect from you in terms of rigor. Um, <laughs> but I, I had a similar thought to Jean-Paul when you were presenting Jesse on slide 21 you present you know, utility and in utility, there's some arguments and then there's production. The first thing that came to my mind was, this looks like a really boiled down version of the unitary agricultural household model that I teach to my undergraduates and my PhD students. And I think you could fruitfully consult the, the kind of the original book written on that by Singh, Squire and Strauss. And I, I, it's hard to find, uh, especially now that we, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I can't go to the library. So I can send you some PDFs or I can send you some slides that I have for teaching. But I think that would be very, very useful to look at. And it applies lock, stock and barrel to, to the US, right? Because we have all the market failures that would kind of make it not work very well in the context of the low and middle income country are just not, they're, they're non, you know, they're, they're irrelevant to that case. But I think it would be really useful for you guys to consult that instead of reinventing the wheel. Uh, the way you do it in there, or at least, you know, instead of uh, to avoid ships passing in the night. One thing where I'd like to kind of add, I don't know if it's to add or to, to kind of say, well, here's a complementary approach or a substitute approach to what Jean-Paul was saying about probabilities over probabilities and ambiguity. And one thing that has worked for me and for some others like Brian Dillon is you can elicit subjective perceptions of risk. And I've done it. I've, I have, yeah. when I was doing my dissertation field work, I've elicited, um, subjective probability distributions for prices with those were illiterate you know folks in rural madagascar and you just give them kind of a, a you know four or five boxes and say go ahead and distribute these tokens in these boxes to elicit your subjective histogram and then then you can take probabilities and you can take variances and, and standard deviations if you need. but i i didn't hear you so that's one thing that you, you can kind of get at that but i didn't hear you in your talk mention any Anything about kind of this literature, it's, it's admittedly a small literature on the use of, subject, of subjective perceptions, because ultimately, that is what people act on. They don't act on some objective probability or some, you know, probabilities over probabilities. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Brian, do you have a question? Yeah, Jeff, yeah, sorry, I've, I've been in and out of the presentation, so <clears throat> I may have missed it, but did you... Um, did you talk at all about uh, state contingent approaches? Um, 
not to add to the pantheon here, but I, I do think the state contingent approach, you know, as uh, Chambers and Quiggins laid out, did, does provide an entree <clears throat> and a clarification and a nice uh, way to illuminate some aspects of production under risk, including uh, a way into some of these trickier ambiguity models um, <clears throat> uh, to figure out how they play out. And, um, you know, when it came out in the early 2000s, everybody was like, yeah, these might not really be much more than a theoretical nicety, but now with latent class models and Bayesian approaches, I think they can actually find some empirical legs. So probably at least a tip of the hat to those because I do believe they've really illuminated and kind of cleaned up a few of the corners that were getting bogged down by these kind of parametric uh, representations of, of uh, risk. I was, yeah. I was actually thinking about commenting the same thing. I, I, I don't know how far you want to go down that rabbit hole, but I do think it's important to at least touch on it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I thought about that too. You, you said you were going to add a section on the state contingent approach, so I, I didn't have anything to, to react to, to Jesse, but uh, the state contingent approach is very general. It, it includes everything else as a special case in many ways. And, uh, but it's so general that it's difficult to make it empirically tractable. So uh, in a sense, uh, there is both risk preferences and risk exposure that is included in it jointly. And, uh, and uh, recovering that information is, is not easy. And uh, so this is one thing that has slowed down the state contingent approach. From a conceptual approach, it's very general and it, it gets us away from what the probabilities are and whether things are linear in the probabilities and, and all that. Uh, but uh, the empirical tractability, uh, there is progress being made along those lines and probably it's worth something putting in, in the chapter as well. But uh, yeah, I, I'd agree with, with those comments. Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful feedback. Um, I think there's a few issues that I wasn't clear about during the presentation, um, just to sort of uh, touch base with that. Uh, with regard to Mark's point, uh, I would really like to see that reference. That, that could be very useful. Uh, if we do devote quite a bit of space to risk elicitation methods, uh, and we are sort of addressing, uh, I guess you could think of that as a bifurcation in the literature where you're sort of moving away from the recognition of the production side of things and using some various uh, survey techniques or other forms of identification to get directly at those, those risk preferences. Um, with regard to subjective probabilities, uh, where to build that in seems cleanest in sort of the going forward prospect theory, ex generalized expected utility framework. So I'd like to touch base with you going forward and, and see if that's the context you were thinking of that in. Um, we do have an acknowledgement when we sent John Paul and, and Chris and, and David a draft of the paper, the state contingent stuff is, is missing and that, that will be a subsection unto itself. So that, that is an important vein of the literature. We've got a bunch of papers. We don't quite know how to tie them together right now and fit them into the existing structure of the chapter. So Jean Paul, uh, with, with your sort of deep knowledge in that area and, and you've read the paper, you could probably offer some suggestions on, on where exactly that, that might fit well. Um, we, we were directly acknowledging risk amb ambiguity in the paper. Uh, the downside risk aversion and its interactions with climate change. There's a few papers, you know, people are starting to use insurance data and, and, and correlating that with uh, different weather and climate patterns. That's being acknowledged in the paper, although not directly. And I think uh, in general, there's some things that are being talked about in the paper, but John Paul, you make a great point that I think a lot of the stuff needs to be brought forward more in the discussion. Yeah. Uh, and, and that could be good. With regard to the model, I don't know. I'm, I'm torn on it. Uh, there's complicated models out there. They exist. You can go to the literature and find a model for, for a lot of the different contexts that would provide deeper understandings than, than, the, one, than the one we're using here. Um, I've seen, I don't know, maybe it's not the right point to make, but I've seen too many potential researchers shy away from certain veins in the literature because they go look at a model and it's the most general, hard to grapple with model they've, they've ever seen. So I think there's something nice about having something simple 
that isn't always going to get you the comparative static that you want, but it'll get you thinking in that direction and you can figure out how to tweak the model to make it more realistic as you need it. So I go back and forth on that, but, but the points are well taken. Yeah. I would add one thing. Discussing the role of insurance, it's a great topic now as insurance markets are being heavily subsidized. And a uh, big puzzle for economists, why is it that farmers are not willing to pay more for insurance? And uh, our models predict that they should be willing to pay, and they are not. And, uh, and until you start creep, uh, cranking up the, the subsidies, basically farmers don't buy. And that's, that's an issue that needs to be resolved. I mean, at some point, uh, we, can't, we just cannot say, hey, if we don't understand what's happening and we, there are some funny things going on. This is a pretty fundamental issue. And to me, the argument is a simple one. Farmers have many different options for managing risk. And we keep on approaching them one at a time. And when we approach insurance, we look at it as one, one particular tool and we neglect the others. And the problem is the interaction between all those management options that, that we are missing. And insurance, what's happening in the insurance market is a great example of that. So this is an argument for actually a need for doing an integrated approach of risk management, not just we're going to be looking at what you can do on the technology side, what you can do on uh, improving irrigation, improving technology, improving insurance. Actually, that's the intersection of all of those that's going to work. And we have not done that. And the problem is very hard to do, but this is one place where I think we're failing in a big way. Our models predict that any farmer should be willing to insure and their willingness to insure is solo, much, much less than what our model would predict. And we're struggling to say, well, maybe this, maybe that. I think our problem is we are failing to capture the big picture, the fact that there are, there are many different sources of risk, but many different ways of managing it. And we're approaching it just piecemeal manner and we're missing the boat. So yeah. I thought I would say that, I don't know if you want to put it in your, in your, uh, in your, uh, article, yeah. but uh, th this is one place where you know, it's important. We need to understand what's going on. We need to be useful. There is a big mismatch between what we understand and what the farmers are actually doing now. And uh, yeah. with respect yeah. to insurance. And, uh, and this, this, this need, at some point, this need to change. We, we need to make some progress along those lines. Yeah, I think, I think we agree on that point. That's, that's the verbiage we use to, to motivate our insurance demand subsection is exactly that, that the price elasticity is the key parameter. We don't know what it is, and it's very difficult to estimate because of all the different uh, yeah. insurance contracts that are available to producers. So it's like having 10 or 15 different substitutions uh, yeah. in that yeah. demand equation because they all shift each other around. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. we're on the same page there. But I think it can be brought more forward. Yeah. Okay. Good, good job. Well done. Yep. With that, uh, we are a couple minutes over. So I want to thank uh, Jesse and Jisung and Jean Paul. And uh, it was a wonderful presentation. And I guess it is time for us to wrap up for today. Uh, let me see here. I just want to again uh, thank, thank the AAEA for helping to put all of this together. Um, I've enjoyed the, the presentations we've seen. Uh, uh, thank you again to all of the presenters. I, I think um, anybody who's been participating today, I think knows these are a set of very high quality chapters and the presenters and the people involved in as discussants as well are uh, very high caliber people. It's been enjoyable to listen to and exciting. And if you enjoyed this and were excited by this, hopefully you're gonna join us again in two days. Uh, for the, the final of these. Uh, but thank you to everybody who participated. Um, if you had comments that you did not share for any reason, um, please reach out to these uh, chapter authors. I, I had one chat uh, uh, in direct messages uh, lamenting that, uh, that there weren't very many junior uh, scholars who were commenting and, uh, and asking questions here. And so um, please reach out to the, the authors with your questions, with your comments about uh, what would be useful. And I'd especially encourage that of, uh, of junior scholars. Um, if your views are important, particularly because you're
probably the sort of generation that are gonna end up using this uh, most often. Um, and let's see, Chris, did you have any final comments? Um, no, just a couple of quick things. First, let me echo David's thanks, not just to the AEA for organizing this and giving us the chance to have this discussion before the handbook chapters are in final draft form. This is a this is an uncommon opportunity the way the handbooks are put together. And I'm really thrilled to see the participation. Um, let me also reiterate, please don't hesitate to email the authors with your feedback. If for whatever reason you're reticent to do that, email David and me and we can intermediate. We can anonymize this like it's double blind peer review or single blind in this case, because you know who the chapter authors are. Um, but the, this is really an awesome opportunity to influence what will be key references in the literature for a good decade or more. The handbooks have a big influence on graduate student and junior faculty research trajectories by helping to establish the research frontiers. So if you think there's something missing or misrepresented, please don't hesitate to speak up. These are fabulous chapter authors and they are presenting in part because they would like your feedback. They want your input as, as hopefully came through clearly in their responses to questions and comments. Um, finally, let me, let me just thank the, the authors and the discussants. You all did a fabulous job. I'm mentally exhausted right now from listening to these five hours. It has, I talk about drinking from a fire hose. Um, I'm only grateful that Thursday is only four hours, so I, I, I don't have to, to, to keep up the same level of mental stamina as you all have demanded of today. But thank you all very much. This has really been fantastic, and I look forward to people joining on Thursday. We, Thursday, we've got uh, Masters at All talking about the triple nutritional burden, uh, Caputo and Just talking about the economics of health and nutrition-related food policies, uh, Lang talking about empowering communities uh, using an integrated design of food networks, and Palma talking about psychophysiological measures and consumer food choice. So four really interesting presentations again Thursday. Should be hopefully as good as today's. Thank you very much, everyone. David, back to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. And again, thanks to everybody for joining us. And we hope to see you on Thursday, at least if you're registered. Take care. Thank you.